Hey everybody, this is Roberto Blake, helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. We've got a great live stream today, and thank you to the Replay Squad. We are doing a deep dive today into being a full-time content creator. I've actually loaded up a bunch of your questions right here from the community tab in YouTube, also over in Twitter. And right now we are simulcasting with the help of our sponsors. StreamYard is the number one tool for simple live streaming and it's allowing us to simulcast to YouTube, LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, Twitter Live, and Twitch, as well as my main YouTube channel, all simultaneously. So make sure you're checking out StreamYard. I'm gonna be adding the link to the description down below for all of you if you wanna check out StreamYard. Also, our sponsor, TubeBuddy, the easiest and simplest tool to help with your productivity as a content creator. You don't just use it for SEO. You can use it for A-B testing of your thumbnails. You can use it for bulk editing to the links in your descriptions when you want to change your own affiliate links, product links, website links. You need to change something across 500 videos like I often have to do. Well, this is the way to do it. So thank you to our sponsors. And now on with the show. So today we're going to be focusing on being a full-time content creator. A lot of you have different questions about this. If you are going to leave questions during the live stream, put a queue in front of them or drop a super chat donation and we will go ahead and pop those up. Um, Spring Boot Learning says, thanks for helping me get monetized, Roberto. Absolutely. Monetization is super important to being a full-time content creator. Um, I'm going to answer some of your other questions here, but I want to start with some of the questions that I know a lot of you have that there are harder, like it's harder to find answers to these questions. So one of the questions often asked is about the um, healthcare and insurance of being a full-time content creator. This one's going to be super important. In fact, actually for most of you, I recommend that you not only bookmark the stream, share the stream with other people, watch the replay, and we will do show notes for this. But I do recommend that you tune into the live streams or the replays with notes available, whether you want to open up notes on your phone or whether you want to um, you know, write things down by hand. I think it's going to be important. And so I would definitely recommend that. I also recommend a great another like thing that you can do is if you do check out my book, there are a lot of answers to some of these questions in my book. Create something awesome. It's in Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and anywhere books can be found. But I want to answer the questions about healthcare coverage in terms of your insurance. And then I want to answer the questions about forming an LLC because these are the ones that are harder to get answers to and not a lot of people make videos about this on YouTube. And then uh, we also talk about taxes and then I'll get into more of the really nitty gritty of the making money part of full-time content creation, uh, getting started. I'll walk you through a lot of things I did, but let's talk about the healthcare insurance. So when I got started as a content creator, I was actually already a full-time freelancer. So I didn't quit a nine to five job with healthcare benefits to go straight into like YouTube and podcasting. My intermediate step, was I was doing content creation on the side, mostly for fun, but I was a full-time freelancer. So my leaving a nine to five job with benefits is starting a freelance business, doing video editing, graphic design, freelance writing, and social media management. So I was doing all around a uh, freelancing service. I was a marketing mercenary. I was a digital media mercenary, just working for the highest bidder basically, right? So um, not working for an employer, just doing gig work, okay? And this is 10 years ago. This is like 10 years ago. So um, what happens in that situation is you have to get private healthcare coverage. Now, if you're not making a lot of money, you can go through the healthcare exchange programs to try to get a subsidy from the government to help you with the cost of healthcare insurance. But if you're in your late 20s or in your 30s. I'm in my 30s. Now I'm in my late 30s. I did this in my late 20s, my very late 20s, like 28, 29. Healthy, no smoking, no drinking, no vices, okay? No, no smoking, no drinking, no vices, nothing dangerous. Means my healthcare coverage premiums are very low. Same thing for my life insurance. I also have a comprehensive life insurance policy. Uh, not want nothing bad to happen to me, but uh, you know, my mom and sisters become like millionaires if something bad happens to me, but- but God forbid, but you, you get lower premiums on healthcare and life insurance 
when you are healthy, you have no vices, you have no addictions, and you have no pre-existing conditions. So those things help keep your healthcare coverage and cost low. Younger you are, generally speaking, the cheaper it is. Now, in my case, when I was working for an employer, they were covering part of that, and then part of it was coming directly out of my paycheck. So for a lot of you, the only reason you are confused or worry about the healthcare cost is because you don't normally notice it because as an employee, it's coming out of your health, your paycheck. When you become a self-employed person, when you become self-employed as a freelancer or a content creator, when you become a self-employed person, then this ends up being something you have to cover both sides of because they would cover either the majority or half. In my case, my employer, I think, was covering about 50 uh, percent and they had a group policy. It was pretty decent, pretty comprehensive. So about $130 was coming out of my paycheck. So when I went into uh, the healthcare marketplace and got the, when I was making very little as a uh, starting out freelancer, I was making like 30 something K a year as a freelancer independently. Well, at that point in the first couple, you know, um, years where you're making that very little bit of money, in my case, I was qualified for uh, some subsidies and some assistance. So it ended up costing me about the same as was coming out of my regular paycheck. The difference is that this was coming out of, you know, um, you know, something that I would owe and have to pay for out of, you know, on a monthly basis. So, uh, excuse me. So I got healthcare insurance and I, at the time, I think I was with Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time with my employer. So I went with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, in the end. And that's just based on where I lived at the time. I lived in North Carolina. So when um, I started making more money, I had to do complete private healthcare coverage because when I started making more money, I didn't qualify for you know any of the programs. So I just went directly to, I think it was United Healthcare, or I went through an underwriter like Golden Rule or somebody. And then I just um, did direct private healthcare coverage. And currently, I think what I pay... Because I think I pay like two change. In fact, I could probably just look in my app. Um, I pay like 25 for like dental and I pay. I also got another um, life insurance policy through them in addition to my other two life insurance policies. But it looks like, where is it? I have it here somewhere because like they actually recently uh, did a payment. So what was... Yeah, United Health 258. Okay. So 258. And then um, I think it was like uh, 25 or 28 for dental on my side uh, because of the package I picked. And again, I picked um, a pretty comprehensive package. So uh, that's why I pay uh, for healthcare insurance. It's a bit more than I pay for um, car insurance on three vehicles. So that's, you know, you know, it's just another one of those cost things and it makes sense and your health really matters. And so you want that coverage and you want uh, to not have to pay as much out of pocket if you have to do regular things or go to the hospital or whatever, get your checkup, get your appointments. Your mileage may vary on this. I'm not telling you, oh, this is how much your health care costs. I'm just making a point to say in transparency and stuff like that. It's like, well, how much do I have to pay for it? Well, it depends. If you're younger than me, you'll pay less. Usually if you're younger than me, you'll pay yes. If you have pre-existing conditions, you'll pay more. If you have to pay for your kids or your spouse, you'll clearly obviously pay more. And what a lot of people benefit from when they have a nine to five job, which is why a lot of content creators actually stay a nine to five job to some degree to qualify for their benefits longer while they're doing their content creation until they make what they feel is like very, very comfortable money or they have a lot saved up. It's usually just to save on the healthcare cost. But in reality, you know, if you're single, it largely doesn't make sense to worry about it too much because uh, if you can make enough money, it's relatively cheap. Um, for me, the the type of money that you'd be talking about, even when I was a freelancer, the kind of money you're talking about, I can do one piece of client work that I literally get done in one or two days and cover my health insurance for the entire month. So I'm not going to worry about it. Or if I got a big client gig or something like that, like let's say back then I got a gig where I was editing like a bunch of um, videos for a conference or an event or something like that. Or let's say as a photographer, let's say I shot a wedding, I could literally 
with the with the money I make from that, I could literally pay for healthcare coverage for a year with the work that I do on a weekend shooting a wedding. So it, just like I think a lot of people overthink that and they worry a little bit too much about that, honestly. So uh, that's what I would say. Oh, we've got lead attorney in the house. Uh, big shout out to Atlanta's like number one freaking lawyer. Uh, lead attorney, $20 super chat. Salute, Roberto. I bought your chat GPT prompts and was extremely helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, the nerdy entrepreneur says, yeah, healthcare coverage isn't too expensive when you're single. One good client can cover your healthcare. Yeah. If, if you do it right, one good client can cover your healthcare for the year. If you are a content creator and you are doing sponsored content, one sponsor one month, one month, one sponsor that could cover your healthcare coverage for the entire year if you do sponsored content. So just kind of like, you know, think about it. Think about it from that perspective. So yeah, the healthcare coverage, that's one of the things that people have the most questions about is how do I, how do I deal with my healthcare, you know, as a full-time content creator? And I think it's really just that they're so used to somebody else thinking about it. I don't think it's even the expense. I think it's just the not knowing part, you know, it's, it's the not knowing part. It's the, if you've never had to handle it on your own, if you've never been responsible for it on your own, well, you wouldn't know and you can be intimidated by that. So don't get me wrong. I understand why it's a thing and why, um, you know, people have questions about it, but the healthcare coverage, you literally just have to go to one of the major healthcare insurers. Usually you got companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield, you got places like Kaiser Permanente. You got United Healthcare. So, um, you know that would that would be the case. Uh, Synchronized X. How difficult is it to go full time in places with low CPM, such as South America? Well, the problem is thinking that um, going full time is about well like, um, what do you call it? It's that thinking that going full time is about your ad revenue in the first place. My going full time had nothing to do with my ad revenue. Um, believe it or not, my ad revenue never allowed me immediately to go full time. Technically it would replace the income that I was making as a freelancer or even the income I was making at a nine to five job later. Like I would say maybe by 2017 or 2018, it was good enough to do that. But the first couple of years I was on YouTube, uh, AdSense could have never, ever done that. Uh, not to mention that. So most people go full time because of brand deals. Now me, I was able to go full time uh, because of affiliate income. Um, so affiliate marketing links, um, back when I first started, because I would promote affordable entry level cameras, like right now we got Sony ZV one F for example, $500 entry level camera, entry level cameras, entry level laptops. I was making about $1,200 a month in Amazon affiliate income. And that was when I started making real money from my content creation. It was not my YouTube AdSense. My YouTube AdSense didn't start paying me well relative to the work I was doing, mind you, until like 2017, 2018. But I was in an MCN contract all the way until I got to 100,000 subscribers where I was giving up 50% of my ad revenue. Then it became 10% uh, of my ad revenue. And then they screwed me and um, it took them years to pay me $4,000 worth of revenue that they owed me that uh, the company never paid. Um, and basically they stole money from me and it took years for them to make that right. And they got sold to another company. And so that other company actually ended up making it right, even though they wanted to insist they had no legal obligation to do it. So what I will tell you is that the ad revenue, especially if you're in a, another country outside the US, ad revenue is not the key. It's sponsorships or affiliate links or selling your own products. And selling my own products, uh, which I'm gonna adjust the description to link to some in the description of the YouTube video, uh, which I should have done that earlier. Um, the, the like, I'll give you a primary example. Uh, so my book, my book uh, makes me about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month. It can make me more, right? my own products and my own services, my coaching, whatever, that makes me about uh, 8,000 to 12,000 a month, 
um, sponsors make me considerably more. Sponsors make me uh, several thousand. I can't disclose how much each individual sponsor pays, but I have currently roughly $100,000 a year worth of brand deal contracts in place. So we'll just use that, right? Um, and that's with working with multiple sponsors, um, with recurring contracts that you know go for six months to a year. So with that in mind, my affiliate income, my affiliate income from affiliate links for many years now, probably for at least a couple of years, maybe four or five years now, my affiliate income is on a bad month, maybe 6,000 and on a good month, 8,000 or more, maybe 9,000 from affiliate links. And that's mostly recurring affiliate revenue. Like TubeBuddy could be 4,000 to 6,000 in recurring, depending on what the signups for the month or the year were. Kajabi is 1,200 to 1,600. And then I have a bunch of miscellaneous things that pay like, you know, $500 a month here or there in affiliate sales, affiliate links for other companies, usually software companies. So for me, my passive income that's recurring that I really, really don't think about that I do not have to get up and wake, work and do anything is like, again, it's like a minimum of like maybe $6,000 a month all the way to $8,000 a month from that, from the affiliate links. And it's been good like that for a couple of years now, definitely. It, and that's after it took a hit during the pandemic, by the way, I took about roughly a 20 to 30% hit to affiliate income during the pandemic. Um, so I don't really rely on AdSense. I hardly uploaded during the pandemic. I hardly upload during the pandemic. So AdSense didn't help me and wouldn't save me during the pandemic. Uh, I only made about maybe 30, 30 to 40 a year in ad revenue during the pandemic. I say only because I'm comparing it to my other income streams. That's good money. That's enough to be full time. I live in the South. You have to remember when I started making $1,000 from affiliate a month, affiliate income a month, Remember, I lived in North Carolina. The rent on a three-bedroom home in North Carolina is $900 a month. So I was making good money. With $1,200 just from affiliate marketing, you can basically pay your rent and you can probably pay your car note just from $1,200 a month with affiliate marketing if you lived in North Carolina. $1,200 is your rent and car note. If you were um, making any kind of money from the U.S. market with sales, um, ad revenue, or sponsorship, and you live in another country... Um, you can go full time fairly quickly if you can make U.S. income on that. That's the trick, right? So, so that's kind of what you would have to think about if you already live in the U.S. The hard thing is if you live in somewhere like New York and California because of the cost of living and the taxes are going to be higher. Um, and I think if you're self-employed, the benefits don't outweigh the cost if you're self-employed, because even if they do other things for you, maybe there's some healthcare things they do for you. There's just not enough that they do for self-employed people in New York and California to offset the cost, which means you only would have to be there for liking the lifestyle because the uh, taxes and cost of living wouldn't really make sense for you if you, um, you know, if you put it together. So I just want you to, you know, to some degree be aware of that. Um, so, yeah. So if you, if you want to go full time and you live outside the United States, your real answer is sponsorship, selling a product to the U.S. market or uh, affiliate income of some kind. If you become a freelancer and you work for people in the Western markets of the United States, Canada, the U.K. and the Western countries, then if you become a freelancer while working in another country, you can make livable income from very minimal work at least comparatively to hard labor, very minimal work. And you'd be able to make a full-time income if you live outside of the United States of America um, in places like South America and Southeast Asia. So just, um, you know, just be aware of that. So, yeah. How to sell an ebook to gamers without a website. Um, I mean, in general, you should have a website as a content creator. See, a lot of content creators think that they're too good to have a website or that because of social media, they don't need it. But that's kind of just thinking cheap. And thinking cheap isn't a good long-term strategy. You should have your own website because you should want more control over your brand and you should want some control 
over your own traffic. And the reason that you actually kind of need to be thinking that way is you should use platforms, but you shouldn't trust platforms. Uh, platforms are, are great. They have a lot of benefits. They have a lot of value. And no, not everyone is doing content that would theoretically be censored, but you really just shouldn't um, trust platforms beyond what you have to in terms of relying on them, which is why it's really important for more of you to have an off-platform and on-platform monetization strategy. So you should have an on-platform strategy where you monetize on the platform the way that they, you know, suggest and, you know, take advantage of that. Clearly, you should take advantage of that. However, you should also have an off-platform strategy. And what I mean by an off-platform strategy is making money that the platform has no say and no control over and where they can't block anything, where they can't control the payouts, where they can't censor you, whatever. And you should be diversified across platforms on top of that. So part of the reason that I have my own products and I'm in multiple systems and marketplaces and multiple platforms is because of that. Not that I ever think I would do something that they would censor, but even just in case you get hacked or something else happens, you should do that. So first of all, if you want to sell an ebook, the best place to sell an ebook is a marketplace like Amazon. Because if you sell an ebook, I have an ebook, print book, a uh, hardcover. The audiobook is coming later this fall for everyone who keeps asking about the audiobook. It's coming this fall. But guess what? That means the sales to this book are something YouTube has no control or no say over. And it means that I get another paycheck um, every month because I get a paycheck from YouTube and I get a paycheck from Amazon. But on top of that, I have my own website and that gives me a cash flow system. And so because I have my own website and I'll show you my website, um, besides robertoblake.com, I have a website where I sell my own products. I have awesomecreatoracademy.com. And so because I have awesomecreatoracademy.com and I have my own products, I have about $8,000 a month of income that YouTube has absolutely zero control over and zero uh, say over. And then I can just use YouTube for their traffic instead of YouTube uh, using me, uh, which, you know, it's a mutually beneficial relationship between me and YouTube. Don't get me wrong. But by having my own website, I have my own website and my own membership that I control. And I have my own products and I have my own services. Mostly it's coaching and training. And I don't have courses yet, but courses are going to come soon uh, because there's actually almost no current relevant courses. Courses are good, but like no one's made courses since all the big changes happened to YouTube. But I have my own products. I have my own $99 products and I have some other products like the new chat GTP prompts. Links are in the description. But I have my own membership and I have my own coaching and I have my own stuff. Eventually, I have my own workshop. We have a workshop uh, in May for training on brand deals. And so since I have this, I control it. YouTube doesn't get a say in any of it. And they don't control any of the money that flows through this. And I just get to use uh, my other social media platforms and use these content platforms as traffic sources for my own thing on top of what Google SEO gives me. Um, and on top of what my newsletter and my email list gives me, which they also don't control. So all of you should have a website and all of you should have an email list so that you have control over your brand. And then you should be in every platform that will monetize you. And then you have control. And it's not just about censorship or cancel culture or any of that. It's about the fact that also you're diversifying and you're distributed. And then also, if you have your own thing that you sell, you have cash flow. Every time one of you buys a product, thank you for that. Every time one of you buys a product, you buy the YouTube starter kit, you buy the brand deal starter kit, you do any of those transactions, I receive that money within either instantaneously, if I pay the bank fees, I get the money instantaneously. Or if I wait two days, then I get the money with zero fees. What that does is cash flow. Because a lot of you don't recognize that one of the problems with YouTube is you get paid once a month. With YouTube, you get paid once a month. You get paid usually around the 21st. That's one paycheck. When you've worked a nine to five job, you're used to getting paid on the 1st and the 15th, or you're used to getting paid every Friday. The reason that that was helpful and the nine to five job can be helpful is because now you're getting this money to live off of and you're getting it in these increments and you can live your life two weeks at a time that way um, without dipping into like your savings, let's say, for example. 
But when you have something where the PayPal and Stripe transactions are coming into your bank account every day, little by little, whether it's $50 a day, even if it was $50 a day, that's $1,500 a month you guys would be making. That's over $10,000 a year that you'd be making. It's closer to like maybe $12,000, $15,000 a year you'd be making. If you made just $50 a day selling your own products, even if your own products, and this is why merch can be good for those of you who like, if you're not selling an ebook, you're not selling courses, you're not selling digital templates, you're not selling coaching, whatever. Even if you had merchandise, if the if you could get to a place where the merchandise after cost was generating profit with a print on demand site like Spreadshop or something, right? Spreadshop, or if you were doing Shopify, let's say, then if you were making $50 in profit a day, every day, 30 days, that's $1,500, $1,500 at the end of the year, you're making like what, 18 grand. And then, yeah, you, you got to pay taxes, but that's 18 grand on top of that. But here's the real important part. The real important part is having cash flow as a content creator. Most of you don't have any cash flow. You just get ad revenue on the 21st, you get sponsors and they pay 30 or 60 days out. They pay 30 or 60 days out. Very few of them pay net 15. Very few of them pay 15 days out from whenever you publish. So based on all of that, one of the big problems is y'all don't have enough money to live off of until the 21st when you get paid from YouTube or until when a sponsorship paycheck comes through or, or whatever. But when you have multiple websites, like if you publish your ebook on Amazon, and if you also have your own website, and if people can buy things from you on a regular basis... Or even if you do a merchandise store, as long as you meet the payment thresholds, which is usually $100, you can cash out $100 at a time, you could transfer to that your account and you have money to live off of day to day. So you need cash flow, in my opinion. And that's one more reason you need your own website, you need your own email list, you need your own products to sell because you need cash flow. And that's going to make you much less vulnerable as a, as a content creator. So you need these other revenue streams. And that's something we're going to talk about more throughout the stream is, is how important that is. Uh, so we have a question here from Robin um, in regards to the live streaming, the analytics on live video, it gives a watch time amount of 20 hours, but after it's a video, it counts the watch time as less. How does that work? Do I get the, tw how do I get the 20 hours? Uh, Robin, what I think it's doing is I think it's auditing those things and some of it may not be considered valid watch time. It also could be a reporting delay. So um, I wouldn't take it um, too seriously. I wouldn't uh, focus on it too much. Um, let's see. We have a super chat and then there's a question I want to roll back to. Um, WX Studio says... Suggestions on getting YouTube on getting YouTube shorts. I get 1500 usually, but it dies after that. Um, TikTok, I got my first viral 3 million views. Why are the two platforms so different? The platforms are wildly different. Um, my conspiracy theory is I do believe that TikTok inflates views because I think that um, that's one of their marketing strategies. I think they inflate views, honestly. Um, YouTube cares a lot about the quality of views and not just the quantity of views, especially since YouTube pays better and YouTube has advertisers. So um, all those platforms plus Instagram Reels, they're all very, very different, even for the same content. And I would just say that it's like, if you're that worried about it, you keep posting the both, but I don't think that you should have the expectations of TikTok translating to YouTube shorts. They're very different. They're also very different audiences too. They're very different psychology. The people who are on YouTube are not the same culture as the people on TikTok. So it's very much a, your mileage may vary. Also, there may just be different levels of competition for the type of content you're making in one platform versus another. So the important thing is not to make assumptions about YouTube shorts based off of what is happening in Instagram and TikTok and to treat them uniquely and the biggest problem for most content creators is unreasonable expectations or expectations that are not founded on correct information. So um, just be aware of that. How to video says, is that the only place you're selling your book? I'd rather funds go directly to you. Actually, I'm working on a way for the funds to go directly to me for my book sales online. I haven't figured it all out just yet, but it is something that I am working on. 
using Shopify because I can use Amazon as my uh, printer, basically. And so what a lot of people don't realize about self-publishing, which is a really good income stream for a lot of you, by the way, it's a really good income stream for a lot of you. I can actually show you the back end. I can show you the end of my Amazon publishing if you'd like, because very few content creators have done it and very few content creators publicly share it. I share the back end and I show you guys my ad revenue. Uh, I've shown you my income from other sources. I've shown my Amazon uh, KDP, which is Kindle Direct Publishing. I've shown the back end of that here on the channel before, but I'm happy to show that to you again. And then I can explain uh, some of the um, ways this work and the royalty structure around it, because it's actually really good money if you do it right. Um, and if you have a strategy, if you have a strategy and you do it right, this can actually make good money and under the right conditions. By the way, I don't mind if you buy from Amazon. Some of you, I kind of, even though I would make more money directly, I almost prefer some of you to buy from Amazon because then I get verified reviews in Amazon and that helps uh, boost me in um, the algorithm. Um, so let me share, um, let me, uh, let's see. Let me share my screen and I can show you let me show you um, the Amazon stuff. So let's see. Okay, so take part of this with a grain of salt because I make more money per order than this. Um, and the month's not over, so we're halfway through. So I'm going to make 1000 this month. It's better to show you last month, actually, because what we did this month, we have more orders. This order number is inflated because we did a giveaway. We did a giveaway on Goodreads. And since we did a good giveaway, since we did a giveaway of the ebook, we did a Kindle ebook giveaway to 100 winners. And so 100 people got the book through Kindle for free during through uh, Goodreads, which I'm going to do that once a quarter. Um, just to give more people access um, who may not be able to afford it. So um, last month's probably a better overall indicator if I use last month. And then if I go to the royalties estimator on this and I go to last month, last month was pretty okay. The month before that was a little bit better. And I did no marketing last month. But uh, the, the royalties are really good. The ebook and print book royalties are about the same. Once I add the audiobook, I'll be making probably closer to 1500 a month. Um, so that's actually uh, pretty good. Last year, I released the book in August. And so within one to the end of August, by the way, August 22nd. So one, two, three, four, about roughly four months of real sales because I didn't release the print book until uh, September. I did the um, ebook at the end of October. So uh, this is really good money. I anticipate that on one book, I'll probably start averaging. I think that on one book, I'll start getting to the point to where it'll probably be something like 20,000 a year on one book. Once I publish more books, it'll be more than 20,000 a year per book uh, because it compounds. And that's going to require me, though, to release the audiobook because what you need is you need a print, ebook, audiobook. And then that's what'll do it. And so um, this isn't bad. But in order to make roughly this amount of money, uh, if I look at it and I also go by the number of orders this year, off of that. So like if I do, so like if I do about a thousand a quarter, let's say, if I do about a thousand a quarter in terms of books and my royalty is roughly, my royalty per book is roughly, um, my royalty per book is about $6, I want to say. So if I sell a thousand books a quarter, 6,000 a quarter, four quarters in a year, that becomes about 24 grand if I can pull that amount off. So books can be very lucrative for you as a content creator in terms of a form of passive income. Um, and it's passive income that if you use it correctly, you will not have to rely on the YouTube algorithm for. And you that could be beneficial to a whole lot of you to just have that extra revenue stream. And that's if you write one book. If you write more books, then um, it becomes better than that. If you look at products in general, though, if you look at products as a larger overall part of your monetization strategy as a content creator, 
if you look at your monetization as a content strategy and you carved it up and you said, okay, I need to have, in fact, actually what more of you should do, maybe I can make a diagram for this, but you should kind of have, maybe actually I'll make a spreadsheet for this to actually help you guys um, start to visualize it. Um, Cause what you should consider is you should say, I need platform revenue. So what does that look like? What is like, that's ad revenue. That's going to be probably things like donations, fan funding, that sort of thing. Okay. So if you're going to have things that are on the platform, uh, YouTube premium revenue, even that's one thing, but then you need stuff where you make money outside of the platform. Now, the reason I like, um, Amazon is because it's a big marketplace, just like YouTube's a big marketplace, right? Um, and I like getting the reviews and that helps me and helps credibility, helps me get speaking engagements, helps me get other things, helps me get podcast interviews. So this can be very fruitful. So, uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, how to move people to your platform where realistic, uh, numbers to expect that will flow to your website. So I think you should think of this differently. It's different than just thinking, okay, how many people am I going to get from there? It's about the goal of having long-term 100 to 1000 customers because 100 to 1000 customers, as long as you have a good business model, game changing a thousand true fans is your long-term goal. So you want to get your first 100 customers. Then you want to get your like 1000 ride or die customers. You want to build up that army. And then eventually the goal is to have 10,000 customers on a long-term plan. And that would be kind of like what even my uh, long-term goal would look like. So um, if I make a spreadsheet and let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. So if I make a spreadsheet, I would go something like um, in terms of planning out stuff, I would go um, on platform income and then I would go and I would say off platform income. All right. And let's make these, let's see if we can make these a little pretty. Um, so just uh, that. And then go off platform. We'll make that, we'll make that blue. We'll make that a nice calming blue, let's say. Okay, cool. All right, so on platform you uh, revenue, right? Um, we're gonna go with YouTube ads is on platform. We're gonna go with super chats. We're gonna go channel members. We're gonna go um, premium. Get YouTube Premium, and uh, thanks as well. We're gonna go shorts ads. So, like, basically, this is um, most of that. You got super thanks and super stickers. You got shorts ads. You got channel members. You got premium. So, like, that's the stuff that's like your on-platform revenue. Um, we can even throw sponsors in here because um, without. You know, well, technically, we'll put it in both columns eventually because I'll tell you how to have off platform sponsors. And I got to change this over here to say off platform, off platform. So, off platform, we can actually do a lot of things. We can do merchandise, we can do uh, other print on the, we can do other print on demand products actually. We can do our own membership website. New books, ebooks, new audio. Basically, we can do self publishing. Okay. We can do uh, courses. We can do, we can host our own events and we can also uh, be at other people's events. And, you know, those of you who are singers, you can do concerts, you can do that kind of thing. Um, off platform, we can sell like music off platform. Um, on platform, you get streaming royalties. Some of you do Spotify. 
so you can do streaming royalties. Um, what else can we do? We can do digital downloads. Off platform, you actually can do affiliate links, both on and off platform. The platform has nothing to do with paying you directly. See, the difference that we're doing here is the platform might pay you directly here. Here, we're getting off the platform um, sponsorships. And you can actually monetize your newsletter because you can actually have sponsors and affiliate links in your newsletter. A lot of people don't realize that. So we have the opportunity to like build like 20 different income streams for ourselves that could like make us money. And uh, you may have noticed that this is exactly what I do, by the way. And this is why I make pretty much so much money. Oh yeah. You could do, you could do uh, coaching depending on what you do. Maybe you're a fitness instructor. You can, you can do coaching. Um, so you have all these different ways to make money and there are more ways to make money technically off of the platform and instead of just on the platform. And if you think about it, I do pretty much all of these things. So on top of like YouTube giving me a check for these things, and I get a little bit of money for Spotify from my copyright free music um, and stuff like that. But you have all these other ways, and there's more ways than this, by the way. You have all these other ways to make money once you take traffic from the platform and push it somewhere else. And a lot of people do not realize this. Now, what most content creators do is they just do this. They just do, you know, they just do ads on, you know, they do the main things, ads on Reddit, uh, YouTube, fan funding, channel memberships. They get YouTube premium money, YouTube shorts money. Uh, they do sponsorships that rely entirely on the YouTube channel or Instagram or whatever. And if they're music, if they do music, they get streaming royalties, that kind of thing. So uh, largely this is being platform dependent. This is taking you off of the platform and basically doing your own thing. Now this requires a little bit of work. This might require some upfront money, some investment, some kind, whatever, but this is like a really strong and healthy way to just be diversified in your income streams and not be completely dependent on the platform. This insulates you from things like censorship as well. And, I would just highly recommend that people consider this. You, know, you don't have to do this. Uh, I want to be a YouTuber, but um, I think that this is a smart, this is a smart move overall is just to start thinking in this way of like, okay, I need on platform and off platform revenue. And I need to build a monetization mix. That is a monetization model that is diversified of on platform and off platform, but then also set yourself up to where you need, um, recurring monthly revenue, you need passive income, and you also need cash flow. And so I would have those things, and those things are stronger if they can be off the platform. Oh, yeah, you could have your own app too as well. Yep. Um, six Bo is back says, basically I'm getting content platforms or, or should be traffic sources to your own website. Yes, but you can also monetize them at the same time. See, that's the great thing about being a content creator is that you're getting paid to promote your own personal brand. So you get the double dip. So you get the double dip. Um, I get paid to market myself. If you go to the description of this video, there's links to my book. There's links to, um, I think we have a link for my workshop that's coming up uh, in May. The end of May, I have a brand deals workshop to help you get sponsored content. We'll talk about sponsors here in a moment. And then I'll showcase for you kind of like what's in that workshop as well. I have sponsors. Right now, we have our wonderful, great sponsors. We have uh, both TubeBuddy and StreamYard. Shout out to them. We have TubeBuddy and we have StreamYard sponsoring today's, you know, live stream and getting you all this great information. So we have them. And then I have my own products. Uh, we have my book. So boom, I get to showcase my own book. And I have to change that banner because it's no longer on pre-order. You can literally just buy it. You can just like literally physically buy the book 
and you can buy the ebook now. So the whole goal is self-promotion. When you make content, you make content for your audience, but you get paid to do that. Now you can stop there. That's what a lot of people do because they were, oh, I don't want to look like a sellout or I don't want to look greedy. So they're like, okay, I'll just do ads and sponsored content. And if anyone wants to support me on Patreon, and that's like the normal YouTuber business model. However, that normal YouTuber business model, and it does work for full-time content creators, what it does is it makes you completely dependent and reliant on the platform, in which case it's only the only benefits of that compared to a nine to five job and having an employer. The only difference is you get to decide your sleep schedule. You get to decide when you wake up and how many hours you're going to work. But other than that, if you are working and you have that relationship with a platform, you're basically in the similar relationship to being working for an employer, but you have no protections no benefits and you pay for your own health care and you pay all your own taxes. So if you're going to just sit there and you're going to work and you're going to do sponsors, that's basically like what freelancing is. And then, okay, I only make money when I make content. So you're living off the ad revenue. It is not that different than just being an employee, except you get none of the employee benefits and none of the employee protections legally and for tax purposes. And that's why people call YouTube their job is because they're treating it like a job. The better thing to do would be to treat it like a business and to use it as your marketing funnel and to say, I'm going to initially use this as this opportunity and use this as a paid opportunity that has a lot of the flexibility a job doesn't offer, the lack of guarantee, but with no guarantees, no protection and no support. So it's entrepreneurial in that way, but you should use it as a stepping stone, become a full-blown creative entrepreneur. This is something I talk about quite a bit in my book create something awesome. You can buy it on Amazon. And the reason I talk about it is because you need to get out of the employee mindset to be a full-time content creator. To be a full-time content creator, you have to get out of the employee mindset and you want ownership. And when the platform owns everything, like when the platform, when the platform owns everything and they have all this control and power, it's not that different or better than being a nine to five job employee, except there's no commute. And and also consider that you're getting paid once a month from the platform instead of twice a month. Like, so people need to understand the transition and the benefits. And I'm, I'm going to probably do a recorded shorter video about this, of like the benefits of a nine to five job versus YouTube versus a business. But the thing that I would tell you is that you need things like your own merchandise. Like, again, I'm going to show you an example by just popping mine up here is you should be marketing your own merchandise and sell something, if nothing else. And merchandise is the safe bet for YouTubers because a lot of YouTubers, they don't like looking salesy to their audience. A lot of people are turned off on it and I get it. But also that audience tends to be younger. If you have a younger audience, it's harder to sell. That's why many of you, you're in gaming. You're like, okay, Roberto, this is great, but what do I sell? A lot of you, it's gonna have to be print on demand products and it's gonna have to be merchandise because your audience culturally, culturally is conditioned to accept the idea of buying funny, goofy t-shirts and buying posters is what your audience, if you do TV and movie show reviews, if you do anime, if you do gaming, if you do reaction content, the, the main thing you're going to be able to sell is you're going to be able to sell print on demand products, basically tangible products because your audience is going to think everything's a scam. That's how they are. So they're only going to buy physical things they can hold in their hand. That's how it is. Okay. So those are going to be things you can sell. You might be able to get some sponsors, but your sponsors already know that that audience doesn't like spending money. They don't like being sold to. So you're going to get lower rates. Even if you get 10 times as many views as me, you're going to get sometimes half of the money. And I've seen this because I've worked with content creators on sponsorships. If you're doing TV, anime, video games, movie reviews, that sort of thing, you can get 10 times the views as me and get paid half the money because your audience doesn't like to buy certain things and they are not going to be as susceptible to certain types of advertising, let's say, because they're resistant to it. They'll skip over sponsored reads. They'll sp skip over ads, less likely to click on affiliate links, all of those different things. Um, so they, their consumerism is radically different. And since their consumerism is radically different, then the market value and pricing you get is radically different. And that's also why um, in many cases... If you're doing that sort of thing, your, um, what do they call it? Your CPMs, your ad revenue might be lower than mine. Even if you get two or three times as many views, you might make less money. And that happens 
but you need to understand the niche that you're in and build a business model around the niche that you're in. And you have to build your personal brand and your offerings to your audience around the niche that you're in. So in a situation like that, it's going to be more physical products a lot of the time. And it's going to be things that your audience relates to. A lot of times it's going to be sometimes doing a licensing deal, a licensing deal with a brand that's in the niche that's willing to put your face or your logo or your likeness or your icon on a, a product. And then you're going to get like a licensing royalty in perpetuity where like if the product sells for $50, maybe you're getting $5 for every sale or something or $8 on every sale. Okay. Um, you can look at the partnership with like Peter McKinnon. Peter McKinnon's a great YouTuber. He did a partnership with Polar Pro and Nomadic Backpacks. And so they make the filter, the, the filters, the ND filters for the cameras. So like he's a camera YouTuber. So he licensed with a company that makes the filters for the cameras and the camera bags. Another company does camera bags and they made Peter McKinnon edition versions of that. And he gets a royalty. I can't tell you how much his royalty is. I don't, I'd have to ask him, but he gets a royalty. So every time um, one of those sells, he gets money off of that. I'd imagine it's probably something close to a 10% to 20% royalty in perpetuity. Um, I'd imagine that, but I don't know the negotiation of his deal. So it was either a flat dollar amount or it was a percentage. If I had to guess it's 10 to 20%, because uh, that sounds like a standard contract for that. And so that would be the situation. That's that's what uh, people that are in much more entertainment centric niches do. It's physical products all the way. It's physical products all the way. Uh, very much the same for a lot of lifestyle YouTubers, lifestyle YouTubers and vloggers. It's physical products. It's going to be mugs, print on demand, mugs, merchandise, stationary, stationary. Ali Abdal and Lavender, they did stationary. Now, they are also productivity YouTubers because they're productivity YouTubers. They get to go digital products. They get to do Notion templates online courses, digital download templates, all those things. Same thing with me. I get to do those things as well. Uh, physical books as well. Um, I not only can do a physical book, I could do workbooks and people would buy workbooks and journals. And that would be a thing or a stationary brand. I could launch a stationary brand and that'd probably do well. So the, cause a lot of my people are tangible. They like journaling. They like taking notes. They like physical media a lot. So physical things do very well. And, but the margin on them is less than digital. The margin on them is less than digital, but you have to know your audience. You have to know your audience and you have to be able to sell directly to them because they are buying products from somebody else's website and it's not yours. They're buying something at some point. They're just not buying from you. And largely that's because you're not giving them something to buy. Um, it's, it's that you don't give them something to buy. Uh, license sponsorship is the way it goes. Uh, it comes to gaming. Yeah, it can be license sponsorship. It could be things like also if you did something with like D brand and they made a skin for you, like they did with MKBHD, that kind of thing can, uh, can actually be very powerful. Licensing deals can be anywhere from 2% to 30%, depending on what the thing is. Yes, absolutely. It could be anywhere from 2% to 30%. When I say 10 to 20%, that was kind of in the categories of those, higher ticket digital, not digital, higher ticket physical items I was talking about, but you're absolutely right, the nerdy entrepreneur. It can be anywhere as low as 2% and it can be as high as 30% depending on the product we're talking about. In which case, if it's lower on the 2%, it might be better to just get a flat dollar amount per item if possible. So that becomes important too. So yes. Um, Scrappers Detailing says a few of the bigger ones in my niche have created their own lines of auto detailing products. See, that's absolutely in the auto niche. There's all kinds of opportunities in the auto niche. What's a good merch platform to use? Teespring and T Public um, is okay. So you don't like Teespring and you don't like T Public. Um, I like Spreadshop. Full disclosure, they've been a sponsor before. They'll probably be a sponsor again and on their creator council. So I like uh, Spreadshop and Shopify. Spreadshop and Shopify. One of them's free. One of them you got to pay for. But both of them give you the YouTube merch shelf, which makes it easier to directly sell directly to your audience. And YouTube does not take a percentage on the YouTube merch shelf. On the YouTube merch shelf, YouTube does not take a percentage. So that's the good news. While having direct integration to help you sell. So that... Very powerful. That's very good to have. So for that reason, 
If you want the YouTube merch shelf and you want it $0, then you use Spreadshop. If you're willing to pay to have customization and to be able to uh, build an email list on the back end and to do a lot of couponing and do all these things, coupons, discount codes, and all this other stuff, then you want to do Shopify. And then with Shopify, you can also post into, you can get into Google Shopping with Shopify. You can get into Google Shopping with Shopify. You also, with Spreadshop, get into Google Shopping, uh, but you also can get into the Amazon side through Shopify as well. And so you can uh, get in there through the back end. So that can be very powerful for you. A lot of you also should look into merch by Amazon. Amazon isn't just good for the Kindle Direct publishing. You could also put physical products in terms of merchandise for hats, t-shirts, and hoodies. If you're approved for merch by Amazon, if you're approved for merch by Amazon, then you also can sell physical products through Amazon in terms of print-on-demand products. A lot of people don't realize that. So with Amazon, you have Kindle Direct publishing, you have Audible for audiobooks, and you have Merch by Amazon. And so that's extremely um, useful to be in that ecosystem. So the Amazon ecosystem is stronger than most people realize uh, and can help them as a content creator. You also could be doing, eventually, I might be doing live streams um, through Amazon's live platform, and I will probably be doing product reviews through their creator hub. And so I eventually plan to start making gear reviews again even on this channel i'll do some gear reviews to help with the basics because what i'm going to do is i'm going to review the budget entry level cameras for new content creators and then i'm going to also do the high end for full-time content creators by going over the like what's in my camera bag what's my interview setup how i do my interviews how i do my lighting and some of that there'll be budget options but a lot of that will also be geared toward intermediate to advanced content creators who want like to build out their studio and build out their whole thing. I mean, you see, I have this absurd battle station. Like this is like for the operational battle station. You know, so like what is the firepower of this for the armed and operational YouTube battle station? So yeah, the emperor. Um, but the, the thing is a lot of people don't know the technical details around that. It'll also be good for me on the Amazon affiliate link side, full disclosure uh, might even get me some more sponsorships. So for me, I'm going to be doing that, but I'm also going to be doing Amazon tech reviews because Amazon has their um, creator hub and then I can grow the affiliate revenue directly on Amazon as a platform. So my Amazon monetization strategy is Amazon KDP for my ebook, uh, my hardcover and paperback, plus Audible for the audiobook, plus the Amazon influencer program for affiliate on that plus the Amazon Creator Hub for recorded and live videos to promote um, camera gear. So I actually plan to go very deep into the Amazon ecosystem as another way of diversifying income because I own every Sony camera lens anyway. I own every G Master lens. I already own every G Master lens. So I might as well do product reviews on Amazon um, because if I do product reviews on Amazon, then... Every time someone buys even one G Master lens, it's um, a fifty to ninety dollar commission, depending on the lens. Um, there are non G Master professional lenses that are a thousand dollars. I get a fifty dollar commission on that. I get a fifty dollar commission on one thousand dollar camera lens, and I get a like ninety dollar commission on a two thousand dollar camera lens. And I have like the best, the best camera gear. You said show you the battle station. Um, so I can show you a little bit of the battle station here. You can see this is the um, second really nice crispy camera angle. This is a 49 inch widescreen display. This is the roadcaster that handles the audio. And then I have some other things on the desk that help control everything. Uh, so as you can see, I have, um, I also have another computer here. It's just not on right now. Um, it could be on. Um, I have the A10 Mini, I have a Stream Deck XL, I have a regular Stream Deck here. Um, so I have a fully armed and operational battle station. So, and then if I push these buttons, as you can see, it just does that. So, yeah. Yeah, there's another monitor here, but um, one of the cables is not doing something right. So I would normally use it for screen sharing purposes or to monitor other things, but I actually have a secondary 
monitor here. Um, and so that's not uh, working for whatever reason. So, yeah. Let's see. But yeah, I hope it. I hope that answers um, the question on print on demand, at least even just a little bit. Uh, Random Entertainment Gaming says, "Wow, I didn't know that Amazon can do all of that, um, and that's a new and upcoming investment." Yeah, Amazon's over underrated. It's extremely powerful for content creators. A lot of people just don't know about it. Like, and again, you don't know if nobody tells you. That's why I like doing these live streams. Is these live streams allow me to go much deeper into topics than. A regular youtube video can i mean with a regular youtube video the 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 frustration i have with regular youtube videos is the low attention span culture around a lot of it right now um so for me that is no bueno i don't like the low attention span thing but what i will say is i get it though and you have to cater to that audience but what i like is that if i do these live streams with all of you it's practical. It's a good way to monetize. It's lucrative. It does very good for promoting the sponsors and promoting my own products. But I also get to talk to you and go really deep into uh, a specific um, aspect of content creation, especially the business stuff. The business stuff, everyone's like, oh, boring, but it's really important. They need, the, you all need the business stuff. You guys need to know um, the healthcare insurance. You need to know about the LLC. You need to know about on platform versus off platform revenue. You need to know about like how many different platforms could pay you money and how you could be making like money and how much money you could be making off of these things and, and seeing the back end. I mean, seeing the back end of Amazon, right? And seeing that literally as long as I sell 200 books a month, I will make $1200. If I sell 200 books, just 200 200 books. Uh, what do you think is easier to do? to try to get um, 100,000 views on YouTube or to sell 200 books. I think selling 200 books is easier, uh, far easier. In my experience, it's been easier to sell 200 books than to get 100,000 views. 100,000 views pays me $1,000. I usually get um, 4,000 or so a month on the YouTube channel. If I was to show you, um, I've got to update uh, the description here. I got to drop some more links in the description for you for resources, but if I showed you how much money like um, last month I got for 400,000 views, which I, I can, I, I'll do that in a minute. Um, I just have to load it up here on the screen and it's taking forever. But like, you'd be surprised. I mean, and it's good money for the views. A lot of people don't think you can make any money if you don't make a million views on YouTube, but that's entertainment niches. That's, um, you know, gaming and uh, things of that nature, right? But I haven't uploaded in a month. Uh, as many of you knew, I was traveling. I had some other things I had to take care of, um, working out some uh, more stuff with my uh, passport uh, so that I can do these two trips overseas. But yeah, I'll show you what's up with um, ad revenue on my side. I do not mind showing you. So let's take a look. All right, so on my side, um, quarter million views is $2,500 basically. And if we go to March, if we go to March, boop, 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 waiting, 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 waiting. Okay, yeah. So a um, little under 400,000 views. $4,000 off of that. Um, so again, I do pretty well because I have a really good CPM niche. Um, I do well on YouTube, but I do much better, much, much, much better. And it's not even close for my off platform income outside of YouTube. I make much, much more than that on the affiliate link side. I make much, much more than this on the affiliate link side. Like it's, it's not even close. And the difference is I have to upload to make this number because I have to get more views to get this number. And I don't upload that often. As you can see, 
I literally for that month only uploaded five times in that month, two times before that, five times before that. I was not uploading. I'm not uploading consistently like I used to. If I uploaded consistently and I uploaded um, 12 videos a month, I would make maybe close to $8,000 to $10,000 a month just purely on AdSense. But as all of you are well aware, it's hard sometimes to stay motivated. It's hard to edit videos. They take a long time. They don't always get views. Burnout's a real thing. Mental health's a real thing. Physical health's a real thing. And I've been running around doing a lot of other back-end business stuff. I've been doing multiple coaching calls. One of my clients right now, he just hit a million subscribers. And so we're probably going to ramp up on the coaching. He's going to need a lot more of my attention because he's now a million subscribe channel and grinded really hard to get that finally. Um, he's in the fitness niche and like really crushing it, like absolutely crushing it. And it, you know, those kind of things take a lot more of my attention. If I have like clients that have like 500, thousand subscribers and they're trying to grow or I have somebody that just hit a million subscribers that they end up doing more coaching calls with me. If they do more calls with me, it takes more of my time away from editing content, but it's worth so much more money that it kind of makes more sense to put more attention to where more of the money is. Plus I really like working with creators. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the deal. But the other part of that, the other part of that is actually just that on the back end, of not making videos, there are other income streams off platform that make me twice as much as that. And then sponsored content, I could do three sponsored videos and make three times as much money as I do on the ad revenue. So sponsors worth three times as much money to me. Um, doing my other stuff in coaching is worth twice as much money. And affiliate is almost twice as much money. So the thing is the ad revenue to me at this point, there are other things outside of YouTube that are worth a lot more value. And so then with that full-time level of income, there are more things I can do. Um, you know, you guys know I'm a homeowner now, so I'm trying to pay off the house before anything else. I'm trying to pay off the house. So eliminate the mortgage. Eliminating the mortgage means life is on easy mode. So once you eliminate your mortgage, life's on easy mode. Getting a mortgage as a full-time content creator. Um, I'll talk about LLCs. And like, cause that's actually a good jump off point. And then I'm going to answer some more questions in the chat and also from the community tab and from Twitter. Um, yeah, now that's a widescreen monitor indeed. Yep. So what I would say is let's talk a little bit about the taxes and how to do that. Now, this is not financial advice, and it's literally not financial advice. It's not just a like BS disclaimer. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the situation with taxes, but the advice is really to get help from a tax professional because I got screwed over on taxes for years because of this, so I had to get an accountant and a bookkeeping service. So I got an accountant and I got a bookkeeping service and it's one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Um, so my friend Vanessa Lau recommended a bookkeeping service to me uh, called Bench. And I'm forever grateful to her because it's actually what helped me buy my house because by having a bookkeeping service, I was able to show all of my uh, P&Ls, like profit, net income loss. I was able to do my like, or is it NLPs, net profit loss, NLPs. I was able to do all my NLP statements, my net profit loss, right? So I was able to do that. And I was able to have that three years back dated. I was able to have that. That was necessary for me to be able to get my house. So that's for one thing. So that was very good. The other thing I did was I made sure I had a really good credit score. And uh, by taking out business credit cards uh, for YouTubers, the credit cards that are actually really helpful are to have the Best Buy credit card, uh, the Amazon credit card you get approved for instantly. It's an instant yes or no on the Amazon credit card. Amazon has two credit cards. I got both of those. I got the Best Buy card and I got the Apple credit card. Uh, having these credit cards also helped me get my credit score up because I always made my payments and stuff like that. I also had the B&H photo card when they offered one for B&H photo video. So I was using it for like, I would have the money for camera gear. 
spend it on the credit card, then pay off the balance is how I was doing it. So I ended up using that to hack my credit score. And so I got a really good credit score. And then I was able to show all of my net profit loss, my NPLs, because I have my bookkeeping service. And because I had my accountants, I had all these years of tax filings. They asked me for two to three years of tax filings. I had it. So I had my two to three years for tax filings. They wanted bank account statements. I was able to give them my business bank account statements because what you should be doing and your accountants and tax professionals will tell you this. That's why you need to use them. You need to go to a, uh, you know, financial professionals like CPAs, accountants and financial advisors is I got a business account that separates my business from my personal. So that creates what's called the corporate veil. You can find all the information to this in a nice little book called Start Your Own Business. I think it's on the eighth or ninth edition now. Uh, it's called Start Your Own Business, all right? So really great book. It breaks all this stuff down. And so what I did was I got a business bank account. The way you get a business bank account is you have to either form a DBA, which is a doing business as. And so for those of you who want to be anonymous YouTubers, it's very important for you to have an LLC and probably at a bare minimum set up a doing business as a DBA. It's called the DBA, a doing business as. So what this means is you have, if you have a doing business as before you even set up like an LLC, you can have a doing business as and you can get a tax EIN number. It's an employer identification number. It's an EIN, okay? Employer identification number. These things are going to help you separate you, the individual, from the business. And it means that if you want to be um, a faceless YouTuber and never reveal your identity, you can take checks using your nickname, your online persona, your stage name, okay? Um, Philip DeFranco only legally became Philip DeFranco a few years ago. He was um, Philip Francini. And so he was able to um, use his stage name for legal purposes because he set up a DBA and you could make the check out to DeFranco and he didn't have to reveal his real name, right? But now his legal name is DeFranco. He decided to literally be a self-made man and like um, change his legal name to his stage name. Um, that's a whole different can of worms is like changing your name is a whole different can of worms, right? But you can like set up, yeah, you have to set up a, um, a legal fictitious name, right? So with having a doing business as, that's one level. But the best thing to do for most people is to set up an LLC and then talk to the accountant and then see if LLC is what you want to stick with or get an S corporation. When you set up your YouTube channel, ideally, when you set up your YouTube channel, at some point you would like what I recommend because people sometimes will do copyright claims or copyright strikes. And a lot of you don't want to dox yourself by um, having to counterclaim. The reason that a lot of um, companies get away with copyright claims and copyright strikes is YouTubers don't want to reveal their real name or dox themselves or where they live. You should be signing up for online businesses. Sorry, online. Yeah, online websites. When you sign up for online websites, what you should be doing, in my opinion, is you should pay the extra money and go to a post office that's a little ways away from you or a UPS store that's a little ways away from you. And you should be able to get a PO box, but you can actually also, if you have that PO box, use the physical address for things that don't take PO boxes of that UPS or that post office. And then you can put that address into the address information for all the websites that you sign up for. And then you never have to reveal your real address. You should also get a Google voice number. And then that Google voice number uh, can forward to your phone and then you never have to reveal your real phone number as well. And so what you have, that's our layers of protection. Then the other layer of protection is the LLC. The LLC lets you go ahead and have a business bank account. And so you can get that with any bank. You could also do this directly through Stripe, by the way, you could set up the business bank account and the LLC through stripe.com. It's a payment processor similar to PayPal. And they have a thing called Atlas. And through Stripe and Atlas, they let you set up an online business ent entity. And you can have a business bank account. And you can do all that registration. However, like I said, you might want to get that uh, postal address so that you don't have to use your real address. Because that information can be found publicly. That can be found publicly. So you might want to um, do that. So... When you do that, that separates your physical like address from you. And now you're separating your legal name 
from you a little bit more. So now you're creating these protections, you're both physical security and financial security, you're creating this. And so that helps you quite a bit, right? And like I said, for more references, you can use the book called Start Your Own Business. And it talks more about a lot of these things, but this is kind of the things you want to do. The other thing you want to do is you want to probably set up a professional email address that you use for business that's not your Gmail account. Because if people know your Gmail account and it's tied to your YouTube channel, they can hack your YouTube channel. So for all public information, stop using the Gmail account tied to your YouTube channel. For all public information, do not have your YouTube channel's Gmail account public. Don't let anybody know what that account is. Make a. That's one of the other reasons I tell you to get your own website is with your own website, you can set up multiple email accounts and multiple email addresses for your own website.com website. And then you can use these as layers of cybersecurity protection as well. So you need um, separation for your cybersecurity layer. You need a physical security layer and then you need a financial security layer. And then also you need a legal security layer. So for the legal liability security layer, when you have the LLC, one of the first things you do is you do what I do. You go take out business insurance. So you pick out business and liability insurance for errors and omissions. Some people call this media insurance, but it's just a business liability insurance. Some people call it media insurance, especially if you use sponsors and brand deals or if you do commentary um, or you cover companies because this is going to keep you from being sued. For about $160 a month, I get the following protections. I have um, legal liability protection up to $2 million for errors, emissions, and also for on-site accidents. So I'm also covered uh, if we're doing a shoot and a piece of camera gear falls, hit somebody in the head or whatever coverage is there for um, you know being sued or something like that, right? Um, so this becomes very important. The other thing you get is you get uh, equipment insurance. So I get equipment insurance up to $10,000. I had $10,000 worth of camera gear stolen. I did an entire video about this and why you need insurance. I had $10,000 worth of camera gear stolen. They stole two professional lenses, two full frame camera bodies, Sony a7 IV camera bodies. And I had the really expensive uh, CFast Express cards in them. So it was literally $10,000 uh, between um, $5,000 worth of camera bodies um, $800 worth of memory cards and about almost $4,000 worth of lenses. So like, yeah, about 10 grand. So having the, um, the, the reason I have, I have multiple layers of insurance. Like I said, I have the physical liability insurance. I have the errors and omissions insurance. And then I have the, um, equipment insurance. So combined, all of that combined for the levels that I wanted for my policy. And you can go $20,000 on the gear. I think I upgrade. Actually, I don't think I have 10,000. I have $20,000 worth of gear insurance. I take that back. I have $20,000 worth of gear insurance. So for me, having the 2 million in liability and the 20,000 in gear protection for travel theft, loss, and accidents, that cost me $160,000 uh, a month. So that's actually pretty good. That's actually um, pretty good. Yeah, it's still yeah, it still sucks that that happened. Yep, absolutely, Mr. Camberjerk. It still sucks that that happened. But um, but yeah, so this is like really important. So this is like extremely important information. So you need the insurance, and that helps you long term. It's not a. It's one of the things I get right away because I'm paranoid. But it's long term. So like. Hundred, or sorry, not hundred and sixty grand a month, one hundred and sixty dollars a month. I'm sorry, it's one hundred and sixty dollars a month, and I get the gear insurance for up to twenty thousand for the gear insurance. I, I'm sorry about this. One hundred and sixty, hundred sixty dollars a month gets me the twenty thousand in gear protection, and it gets me the two million in liability and accidents. So, um, so yeah. Um, I don't love Legal Zoom. I've used Legal Zoom before. I don't love Legal Zoom. Um, either use Zen Business or use Stripe and their Atlas uh, program. And those are what I've been using for my LLCs now. I do not use LegalZoom for any of this stuff anymore because LegalZoom is just like, it's eh, it's meh, it's meh. So I, um, I don't like it. So to, it's like, so again, um, 
to set up an LLC, you can use Zen Business and you can use site Stripe, stripe.com, like the payment processor Stripe, and then go into the dashboard and they have something called App Atlas, okay? So um, so they, so that's one of those things, right? Um, in terms of an S corporation, that's an advanced level hack. I mean, you probably are going to do an S corp declaration, talk to your accountant, talk to your CPA, but as far as an S corp, that is an advanced level hack. And that becomes more important when you have full-time W2 employees, or it becomes important for how you want to do certain things. The reason I didn't do it before I bought my house was because, um, instead of paying myself a salary, it was going to be easier to just show my gross income to qualify for the amount of house that I wanted because I wanted um, a more expensive house and that helps with the studio in the basement that I have. So that, uh, you know, so that was um, something that I paid attention to because of wanting to be a homeowner was for me, it was more advantageous to just have the higher gross income to qualify for the house that I wanted than to be an S corp and make myself a W2 employee and do all of that. But it just depends on your situation. This is why you need an accountant and you need financial advisors and you need CPAs and you need bookkeepers is because your situation might be radically different than mine. And so you're going to need their advice. I'm giving you some general guidance here. Um, and so um, that could matter. Um, let's see in terms of the tax stuff. Um, having a bookkeeper for me makes life easier and it makes the tax filing situation easier for my accountant as well. I think between my accountants and my bookkeeping service, I think combined, maybe I'm paying 350 a month for those services combined, maybe. Uh, and the reason that I'm struggling to know how much it is, is because one, I was grandfathered into like probably a lower plan for some reason. And then two, all of my bills are set to auto pay and I just pay them. So sometimes I forget because I don't look at them as hard anymore. I don't look at them as hard. It's a good situation to have, but I'm saying um, it's harder because I have so many things and accounts moving money back and forth now that it's hard to remember or keep up. So I only kind of remember sometimes how much something was when I started paying for it versus what it might be now. Um, so just keep that in mind and keep that with a grain of salt. But, and it's also my choice and preferences of who I use as my service providers um, for that kind of thing. Another thing is if you have employees, you might want to set up something called um, an employee um, HR dashboard. And mine is Gusto. It's a payroll and HR dashboard. So with gusto.com, I think I have it linked in the description now in my business services recommendations. Those are affiliate links. Um, with HR and payroll through Gusto, the thing about that is you can set up the WT employees through that. You can also set up doing 1099 contractors through that, and they'll send the 1099s to your to your freelancers and contractors. They'll send the W-2s to your employees. It can deduct the payroll taxes appropriately. You can make sure you're in full compliance with all of those things, and you can make sure you're paying the appropriate um, taxes to the Department of Revenue and Department of Labor, and that you have all the compliance things. If you have full-time W-2 employees, you can actually do a group health care program set up through that, and it can go ahead and be taken out. So that is, um, you know, so that's what you would want to do. Um, ben, I see you have a question here. Um, you should talk to maybe, um, you know, some kind of financial advisor. I will say for most YouTube content creators, they set up LLCs. C corporations are more for people who are going to do like publicly traded companies or privately held companies. Most content creators, this is not legal or financial advice. Most content creators will tell you that they've set up LLCs. And then just talk to your accountant, financial advisor, and then look at whether an S corporation is a good fit for you. So again, I'm not telling you what to do, but that is some general thoughts around that. Um, I did a video that I collaborated with TurboTax on around what is deductible. The basic guidance that your accountant will probably give will be, is it a necessary and reasonable expense for your business? 
All of my camera gear is reasonable and necessary. Every conference I go to is reasonable and necessary. Collabing with another YouTuber and the travel I do to get there and collab with them, reasonable and necessary. Uh, the props that I buy, the hardware I buy, the sitting, standing desk that I have, the cables that I buy, reasonable and necessary expenses for the business. The high-speed internet that I have, reasonable and necessary for the business. Paying the contractors, what was it, $15,000 to install Ethernet lines in every single room of the house, plus three wireless access points in this house, so that I could have absurd internet speeds, reasonable and necessary expense. So, again, that's the qualification a reasonable and necessary expense. Um, if you have a dedicated room for your business, like this home office is a dedicated room for the business. There's no bed in here. There's no TV in here. This is all business. Same thing for the basement. Guess what? The two rooms in the basement, plus this home office, all of that square footage is something my accountants told me that we can deduct a portion of in terms of my, exp uh, my reasonable expenses versus uh, the price per square foot for the mortgage for this house. Yeah. Um, yeah, the 15K um, to get the hard line. This house was never set up for the internet or for cable television. So this house had, was never set up for the internet. So the renovations, one of the renovations was top to bottom, three, le three floors top to bottom of ethernet cable. The real expense for that was the labor. The expense for that was the labor. That's why it was 15,000. It was labor cost. That's what it was. It was having... Three guys out here from Best Buy, and it was the labor. Most of it was the labor. Most of it was not the thousands of feet worth of like uh, Ethernet cable. Uh, the you know the um, even the hardware appliances in the basement and the rack in the basement, the uninterruptible power supply, um, the switches and routers, all that. Like none of that was like that cost thousands of dollars, but the real expense was the labor. The expense was the labor. That's what it came down to. So, yep. That's it, you know. There's a lot of stuff to... Keep in mind when it comes to the business stuff. Yeah, that's why it takes a long live stream like this. Is It does take a lot to go deep dive in. This is why it's not like there's only so much of this that I could do justice if I did a 15 minute YouTube video and it scratched the surface of a lot of this. Even if I did a bunch of 15 minute videos, it scratched the surface of this because also I have to always keep into account what I can and cannot say or disclose and all of these things. So it's actually very hard to talk about in a scripted video to some degree. A lot of times um, it really is because the information has to get watered down so much um, to keep attention on the platform. This is why I like doing the live streams because with the live streams, I don't have to water anything down. And it's the other reason I'm going to um, really like doing the courses because when I start doing courses, not only will I not be able to wa not water things down, there's certain things that like I'm transparent, but there's some things that you're like, okay, some of this information borders on being sensitive or private or, oh, I don't want every random person being able to know this or that per se exactly in detail. Um, so not for withholding it for any like bad reason, but more of like, okay, that's a little personal or that's like a little bit too much information just have floating on the internet, let's say. So it's more of a privacy concern thing. So paywalling some content makes more sense because one, it means if something's short, it can be short. If something's super detailed, it can be super detailed. And I don't have to worry about an algorithm suppressing it or an algorithm responding to the attention span deficits. I don't have to worry about the goldfish attention span. If someone buys something, I can make the information as detailed or as brief as is appropriate to the information instead of worrying about retention rates. That's the main thing with paywall and content, honestly. The main thing with paywall and content is just another way to say screw algorithms and 
here's what I want to make and you can buy it and have access to it. And it can be basically the director's cut of what the content creator wanted to be out there. And that's what paywall content is. Paywall content is just being able to say, and here's what I would give you if I didn't have to think about an algorithm. So, and it's monetized that way instead of monetized by advertisers because then it's like, oh, and here's what I would say that I don't have to worry about what the advertisers will think or want or care about or sponsors or this, that, the next, and the third. So that's just really what it comes down to. That's what it is. Um, thanks so much, Random Entertainment Gaming. Appreciate you. Uh, really appreciate the live streams because you can flow in really responsive way uh, with what we need to hear. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's super important. So just remember, the um, the reason that you want to use something like Zen Business or Stripe is they're going to make sure that all of your legal entities are set up correctly. Okay. Um, so that's going to help you. The reason that you want to have a virtual address using either a WeWork, U.S. Postal Service, or a UPS store is so that from now on, when you sign up to YouTube or any other platform, you don't have to use your physical address, which means that you're less likely you don't have to worry about being doxxed. If before you ever make your YouTube channel, you can set up a DBA or an LLC, that would be great if you can do it beforehand. If you haven't, it, it is what it is. But because if you can set it up to where you can use the legal business entity's name, it can also shield you from having to have your real name out there if there's a copyright claim or strike against your channel. So keep that in mind as well. So these things are layers of physical security and also financial security with the different business entity legally and then the liability insurance. And then remember that for cybersecurity purposes, the reason you want your own website for cybersecurity purposes is because now you can use an email address not tied to your YouTube account. You can spin up multiple email addresses. And so now you can avoid hacking and cybersecurity issues as well. So those things help. Not only that, but then with your own website, you can sell your own products and services like we talked about. Uh, Speak Spanish now says that they use as a service called iPostal. So yeah, you could look into that as well. Virtual addresses. Yep. Virtual addresses all the way. Nard Villain, thank you for the $10 super chat. Thank you for all these tips and gems about being a content creator. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think um, so far we covered, so we covered, um, we covered most of what I think we can talk about with taxes, about why you need CPAs and bookkeepers because of things like buying a house. And we talked about why you need the uh, DBA or the LLC. Uh, we talked about how S Corp, you get to be a W-2, put yourself on payroll, depends on your situation. That may not be as good an idea if you're like me and you want your bigger gross revenue to qualify for buying a certain level of house. In the long term, you save taxes, though. If you're an S corporation with being a W-2 employee, paying yourself a reasonable salary, you're at a lower income tax bracket, you can take the rest as a distribution. You're splitting up the income basically into two different ways of being paid. So then that lowers how much they are you still get the money in the long run, but now the taxable amount, again, talk to an accountant about this. They'll tell you the whole deal, but basically it's a way of lowering your overall income taxes. In terms of retirement, because you're a content creator and you work for yourself and you're self-employed, you're responsible for your own retirement. So you can have options. There's options you get. You can do traditional or Roth IRAs like everybody else, right? With a business bank account and an IEN number, you can get a solo 401k. You can also get a SEP IRA account for your retirement. I talked about this in my YouTube taxes video that I did with uh, TurboTax. Uh, the main thing is I use my SEP IRA uh, because of its deductions. My financial advisor is going to help me with a schedule when I'm older that will kick in that does a backdoor Roth conversion so that I keep more of my income that's not taxable from the government in my golden years. But in the meantime, I can get the deductions now and then just pay less on taxes in the future. So we use the SEP IRA because I can contribute more to the SEP IRA than the standard amount. Standard amount for retirement right now, if you use a traditional RA or Roth, if I'm not mistaken, it's about $6,000 a year that you can contribute of your um, excess money. And there's, um, if you do it through a traditional IRA, you can take a tax deduction now, 
but if you do it through your Roth, you're taxed now, but you don't pay when you retire. So the way you can think of that is if you do a Roth, you're taxed on this, the tree and sorry, no, you're taxed on the seed and not the tree that grows. Therefore, you're taxed up front on the you know, money you contributed, aka like if it's six grand for the year, okay, you don't get a tax deduction for that now, but you pay no taxes when that 6,000 turns into 600,000 in 50 years or whatever. So like, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, yes, you also definitely want to research the different rules for whatever state you're in. That's why working with entities like Zen Business or Stripe and Atlas that you put in what state you want to uh, you know, incorporate in into the filter. And then um, they will make sure you're in compliance with the rules of the state. They help you with that. Sometimes they offer services long-term, a subscription service or a yearly fee that makes sure you're in state compliance. So you want to you know, look into that. That's why I like using those things. It's cheaper to do everything yourself. I'd rather have a service that I pay for and they can be on the hook for helping me and I don't have to think about it. Um, so yeah. Uh, someone has a question. If you don't mind, please don't forget to answer to this coaching question about what point in the journey should we invest in your coaching? Uh, it depends on what you can afford. You, like, I think if you're making a reasonable amount of money and you look at what I offer and it's something that's not out of your budget and there's not something that's more important immediately, like uh, camera gear, for example, that will immediately improve your situation. If there's not something right this minute that you can physically buy that you know will improve your situation, then when you have the disposable income to work with me or someone like me, that's when I think it's reasonable and affordable when you can't buy hardware or software with the same money to know that you're going to improve your situation. I think the next step is maybe you hire a coach. Um, thanks for, for the tips. You've been a huge resource and questions I've had while growing my own business. Um, Ben, I cannot tell you what state you should register in. You need to talk to uh, a professional to get that advice. Whatever website you might be filing for might have a chat option and they could recommend something to you. What I will say is that most people, most people tend to register their LLC in the state that they are resident in and doing business in. There are exceptions to that though. And I don't know if you'd be an exception. So that's why this is why we can't give legal and financial advice because um, one, we're not being paid for that. So we're, we're like, you technically aren't liable for advice that you're not paid to give in that regard. And then two, um, we can't really give that situation because we don't have the context on it, which is why we're just having a conversation. We're just having a conversation. Uh, Christian Vargas says that when you set up an LLC, you have to be listed as a registered agent of the business, or at least here in Florida, you do that's he's in Florida. Uh, can't you still get docs if someone finds your LLC name since the info is public? Well, you actually, when you use something like Stripe and Atlas, or you use Zen business or legal zoom, even though I don't like legal zoom and I don't recommend them, you can have that entity act as the registered agent of the business on your behalf. And so that gives you that layer of protection. That's another reason to file through one of these organizations instead of just filing directly with the Secretary of State. Because instead of filing directly with the Secretary of State yourself and being the registered agent, if you use Zen wow. Business, not sponsored, or Zen Business or use Stripe, they can be the registered agent for your filings. And so all of a sudden that's off the table. And so now your personal information as far as where you live is not out there. The other thing is, again, if you register the business and you use a business address and you use either iPostal or the US Post Office or USPS or WeWork or a virtual office, it also eliminates that physical uh, problem. And virtual addresses are inexpensive. So... Um, so I hope that answers that particular question. Uh, it depends on what you get and what you where you live. Um, UPS and USPS can be $200 a year. 
Um, four hundred dollars a year for being safe is not that expensive, relatively speaking. It might feel expensive, but out of all things, it's not really that expensive um, for what we're talking about. Yep, we have a um, super chat from Mike Nardi. Thanks for the tips, Roberto. You've been a huge resource for questions I've had while growing my YouTube business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, encrypted DID angels. How's it going? Good to see you again. Um, does this advice extend to Twitch streamers as well? I've moved platforms from YouTube to Twitch. A lot of it or most of it does actually apply to Twitch as well. Uh, this would apply to Twitch, YouTube and rumble and like most of these platforms, Amazon too, actually Amazon as well. Uh, another thing that can help if you're concerned about doxing is to use a website called Delete Me. Um, a website called Delete Me can help you. Uh, another company called Aura can help with that and removing information from the internet. Uh, I'm looking to Aura. I'd like them to become a sponsor. So that um, that can be valuable. Uh, Mike Nari says, any tips or advice on contract creation service for Canadian creators having trouble finding a lawyer super familiar with YouTube? Um, you'll have to, Canada is specific, my friend. First of all, I can't give you um, legal advice, but I guess you're asking for tips on finding people who can. Um, Canada is very specific. I would say you have to talk to another Canadian YouTuber who's doing it. And I know that you guys have a great community up in Canada for YouTube content creators. So I would highly recommend that you reach out to other Canadian creators, maybe full-time Canadian creators, and I would ask them for help. Um, I would ask them for help because they would know. And uh, things are very specific on a state-by-state, country-by-country basis. So you'll definitely want to make sure that you, you know, are talking to the appropriate professionals legally that have jurisdiction over your area. Uh, Gabriel asks, Roberto, should I get my first silver play button before making my second channel? It depends on if that's your goal. I say people should at least go full time before making a second channel. I say they should at least go full time. A silver play button is not a bad goal to have before going full time. Or sorry, before starting a second channel. Second channels are a distraction. If you don't have a silver play button and having one has always meant something to you and you've always wanted a silver play button, I would say accomplish that before starting a second channel. If you say, oh, I've always wanted a gold play button, get that gold play button and before you start a second channel if that's your goal. But I would say you at least should make sure that you get the first channel to full-time income, if nothing else. <clears throat> yep. So... Um, Tommy says, Tommy has some interesting advice here. Tommy says, having the LLC in your state allows for more types of business funding like cash loans, et cetera. If you just want vehicles or stores of credit cards, you don't need to be in state. That's true. But in terms of funding for content creators, um, it's very hard for us to get cash loans for a traditional bank. Even if we have an established LLC, it's a lot harder and they don't understand our business model and they don't account for it very well. However, if your payment processors are PayPal and Stripe, PayPal and Stripe do loans to their users. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll do a flat rate loan, meaning that's not a, a loan that has interest rates and compounding. It's just a flat fee. And then so what they do, this is a business capital thing. Let's say you get to a point to where it's like, OK, you need cash for something you need. 10 grand for whatever reason you want to go all in you want to like get all your equipment get a ticket for vid summit hire a coach you want and you and you need 10 grand if you've been with stripe or paypal for a couple of years they see money coming in you're doing pretty okay 
they will do a loan and this is not a credit card with the compound interest, although um, they offer those as well. So for one thing, if you need a cash infusion, if you're doing well and you're making good money and you have your own business entity and your own business LLC, you can get personal or business credit. You can get personal or business credit. So for a lot of you that have these concerns about cash on hand or capital, you can get lines of business credit or personal credit as long as you have provable like income and you like are doing that. So that's one thing you should know. Another thing is the payment processors in terms of Stripe and PayPal, they'll do one that doesn't work on interest. If you did something like Stripe, let's say they might give you an offer and they'll say, okay, um, we'll loan you like 10 grand, but we're going to give you a fee of $1,700 and to pay back that, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a contract where when any of your Stripe transactions comes in, we're going to take like 15 or 20% right off the top uh, before you get your money. And that will pay back your loan in full plus the $1,700 fee for the 10 grand. So the thing is, that feels like it might suck. But what they're doing is they're giving you immediate cash on hand to do that. And they are giving you no interest rates on this. And you just know that, okay, this is going to take be taken directly out of money that I have coming in. I'm not even going to see it. I'm not going to notice it. And it's going to pay back the loan. And you still have that money. And so if you were smart, you only are taking that 10 grand or whatever in such a way that you're going to increase your income or your revenue dramatically over the next year and beyond. So totally worth it. If you're going to, if, if, oh, if I had $10,000, I can, you know, increase my income by 50% or I can double my business this year, then that's what makes that smart. If it's not to do that, or if it's not just that it's going to save your bacon, then obviously it becomes something not worth it. And so everyone just has to use their best judgment there, talk to a professional. But I'm just making the point that for people who worry about, you know, um, capital infusion into their business, let's say, as a small business owner, online business owner, content creator, the banks aren't usually our best friend and our best option. There are reasons to do it. But a lot of times, there's also faster, easier ways. And like with Stripe and PayPal, this stuff gets approved in like under a week and you have the cash in less than 10 days. So that's just yeah. And I've actually used that service before with um, both of I think I've used it with both of them at one point. Um, I probably did that during my upgrade cycle or something like that when I was moving, when I wanted to do some upgrades, but yeah, I mean, so it's a, so it's a pretty standard deal. I think I've done that a couple of times. I think I've paid down or paid back a business cash infusion like that three different times. And it was no big deal. It was like easy enough to do and just not think about. Um, and again, it was one of those situations where like, I think the only reason I did it is because it would be cheaper than like throwing something on a credit card um, to do that when I calculated interest versus just paying the flat fee on it and not even noticing. And so, you know, it is what it is. So that's just an option that exists for people who are like, oh, well, what if I need to do a loan or do this or do that? So. Yep. And there's some other people with some really good information in the chat. If you guys want to check that in the chat. Yeah. I think that that amount of money like that they get for like a fee on that can feel like a little like, Oh, that's a little sus that level of fee. But the thing is I'd rather pay a flat up straight up payback amount than worry about like interest rates that can compound daily. I don't like uh, daily compounding interest rates. And so in a loan situation, I'd rather pay a flat fee, even if it's a higher fee, than pay an interest rate that uh, can compound. So that's just something to think about. If you can avoid borrowing money, just never borrow money. Well, they say uh, never a lender or a borrower be would be a really good motto. But I mean, realistically, sometimes you're in that situation. So it is what it is. Like I said, we will try to make sure and get in some timely manner. We'll try and get show notes up to 
kind of make a lot of this information more digestible. Um, at some point, we'll be doing clips of this on the Clip Show channel. Um, and I'm doing interviews over on the podcast channel again. We've got a bunch of interviews to roll out. Um, yeah. After all my expenses, would you still say I make enough to live comfortably? Yeah, after all my expenses, at least all of my business deductible expenses, at my after after deductions, after like my after all of my deductions, after all of my deductions, um, you know, like somewhere between 50 and 60% of my gross income is still available to me after all the expenses and deductions, let's say. Um, so then, yeah, I live pretty comfortably. So I would say, yeah, I have enough to live comfortably. I'm living comfortably is not that expensive. If you're realistic about it, if you're realistic about it, it does not take that much money to live comfortably. And I make enough to do that. My biggest expenses are for the coaching business. I have a team. So for the coaching business, I have a full-time remote employee that does you know reasonably well. Um, and I say full-time in quotation marks because technically they're just above part-time. They're just above part-time, but you could call them full-time. Um, so they do very well. Uh, but like working less than 40 hours a week and doing very well. I have uh, my sister works for me part-time as an assistant. And other than that is hire freelancers for other stuff. So like that's it. But it is my biggest expense is the outsourcing of any kind of work is my biggest expense. So other people are my biggest expense. Then my biggest expense after that is taxes. My biggest expense after that is taxes. Um, I pay like something like 40K a year in taxes, I think, right now. But that's because I'm not doing the S Corp W2 thing yet. We're doing that. We're restructuring this year. We're restructuring this year. I opened up a new company to be a holding company. So um, I'm going to have a new holding company. We're going to have that company own the other company. I'm going to be um, a W-2 under my own company, reasonable compensation, then just take um, a distribution as the owner and then do owner's draw for the rest. And that'll be that. And then I will pay probably 8,000 to 12,000 less in taxes, maybe. So I'll go down from paying like 40 something, 40, 45 or more in taxes to paying less than that, much less than that. So instead of paying 40,000 plus in taxes, 40, 45, 50, whatever it is, whatever crazy number it decides to be, I'll pay less than that. And I'll pay less than like, maybe I'll pay as low as 20 something. I'd like it to be lower. I'd like it to be lower if it can be lower. If I move overseas, I'll pay nothing. If I move overseas, I end up paying nothing. Which that might happen. Go overseas, pay nothing in taxes, get married, start a family not deal with, uh, have food that isn't poisoned and makes people fat and have access to a better education system, probably a better healthcare system. Yep. I, I, I have every reason to move. <laughs> so yeah. Love America, land of opportunity, make your money here, but enjoy your money somewhere else. Probably. That's probably how it is now. It ain't what it used to be. 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 So like, so that's like, so yeah, I live, I make enough to live comfortably. Anyone can reasonably uh, make enough to live comfortably if they set themselves up correctly and they realize that they have to have allocation for living expenses, retirement account, emergency savings, taxes, and then um, expenses and operational cost. And if you which is another reason to diversify your income streams. If you diversify your, I also don't really, I don't do consumerism that exists outside of my business. Outside of my business, what do I spend money on? Business is travel. Business covers all my travel. Uh, business is hardware and equipment. And I don't really like doing much. There's only so many things I like doing as far as entertainment. It's like what, go to the movies. Um, like, no, like, I don't, I don't, like once in a while, maybe I'll go to a sporting event. Okay, cool. That's not that expensive. Everybody can do that. That works a full-time job, can afford to do that for the most part. So what do I do? I mean, what, I eat out once in a while. I eat, I go out and I have a steak dinner that's 25 bucks. I live in Georgia. I live in Georgia. I go to a steakhouse. It's 25, 30 bucks after you tip. It's 25, 30 bucks after you tip in Georgia. Um, you know, I go out for sushi. What am I doing? Spending like $30, maybe. Like, that's it. So like living is not like, and I used to live in North Carolina. I used to live in North Carolina. A three bedroom house in North Carolina is $900 or less. 
a month to rent, to rent. Like my biggest thing is I bought my family, like in terms of I take care of my siblings. I retired my mother. I bought a large enough house for everybody. So my biggest expense is my mortgage. Like aside from my, aside from my team for the coaching business, my biggest expense is my uh, mortgage. So you do that. You pay off your vehicles. You, you don't get something unreasonable. I don't own a sports car. I don't know. I don't need a Lamborghini. I don't like, what do I need a Lamborghini for? Like, you know, so I don't drink. I don't smoke. I live healthy. I have a gym membership. I have an anytime fitness right up the street and go there 24 hours. So I have a gym membership. It's like, Ugh. like, what, so, like what, what my Netflix, Hulu, Disney plus like, so expenses wise, it's not like unreasonable. I'm young and I'm healthy. Like my real expenses will theoretically come getting married and having children, but that's largely upfront expenses and everything like that. If you're reasonable and you're not extravagant and you're down to earth people, if you're down to earth people, that doesn't become that expensive either. If you're down to earth people, that looks more expensive. And that's where my plan is to take the money. I take all my extra money and what do I do? I dump it into my mortgage and my retirement accounts. All of my extra money all my extra money goes into my mortgage and my retirement accounts. I have no interest in doing that much more consumerism. What am I going to buy? Like I buy cameras. I own all the Sony lenses I wanted. So like instead of buying a sports car, instead of buying a sports car, I bought every Sony G master lens instead of buying a sports car. So like, I mean, the only thing I do is like, like I'll buy something nice for myself once in a while on my birthday as a treat to myself or something like that. It's like, but like, I don't understand where, like, if you start making good money, if you start making good money, there's no reason to overconsume. There's no reason to, like, buy things that exist outside of your business for the most part. It's just people have this lifestyle inflation if they become influencers. But I guess because I'm not an entertainer and I just, like, do career development, because I do career development and I just buy books and stuff like that. I just buy books. I just buy books. I go to the movies like regular normal people. I take the kind of normal people like travel's not even that expensive, relatively speaking. And if you have credit cards that you can pay down, you can travel. It's not relatively that expensive. Now, if you have a big old family of a bunch of kids, it becomes expensive. But like if you're single or you're a couple, it's not relatively expensive to travel twice a year. It's actually very affordable if you make reasonable money like reasonable money and you save up for it and you budget for it or you put it on credit cards. And then you make a plan to pay them down over time. And then you rinse and repeat the situation. If you're being reasonable and thoughtful, then it's relatively not that complicated. I don't have student loans because I went to community college. So there, so I don't have that. So for me, it's a matter of practicality, frugality, and lifestyle choice and lifestyle creep and lifestyle inflation. I don't have collector's edition Jordans. I don't care about that. If that is your thing, if that's your vice, then you're going to be making opportunity cost decisions between having that and living comfortably and all your stuff. Me, I dumped so much money into building my channel, making that comfortable, making it easy to just have my, you know, my bad station here, let's say. Like, I mean, the money I spent, like, here's how Roberto spends his money. It's because um, I invest it back into the growth of the channel. Um, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hit the autofocus in a way that like maybe makes it easier to, uh, show you guys a little bit of everything. So without as much glare or whatever, but it's like, so how wide can I go? Oh, that's a zoom. Um, okay. So like, how do I spend money? It goes into business deductions. It goes into, it was, um, 1200 for the roadcaster and there's some audio cabling and accessories. So 1500 on that side, um, it's things like the A10 Mini, that's 300. The two um, stream decks, so probably the two stream decks are probably 300, 400 with that. Um, the M1 Mac Mini, that was like two grand, 2.5 grand. Um, this M1 Mac at the time of purchase, I think this was 2.5 grand. Um, there are a bunch of accessories here. And this big monitor, this 49-inch monitor, this was like uh, $1,600. So in terms of um, spending and expenses, it becomes one-time purchases that offer lifetime value for the business. Cameras are expensive for me. Uh, this camera body is $2,500. This lens on it is $1,200. So that's where my money ends up going to. My money goes into... 
um, investments back into the craft and the business and into the team. Uh, recently, we got one of my team members, uh, Andy, we got her one of these Sony ZV-1 Fs. This was $500 to get her live streaming set up in because I just wanted her to have higher quality live streaming. So we got her that. Spent $180 getting her an Elgato ring light stand so she could you know, not struggle with her lighting anymore. Uh, we spent uh, $200 on getting her a good microphone. So like, you know, I invested about $1,000 in hardware into upgrading one of my team members just to get the quality for the uh, coaching streams up higher. Okay, so that was like an investment. Um, you know, the equipment investments into the studio, into the server that backs everything up. It's um, 64 terabytes of storage on RAID raid six so then it's actually 38 terabyte no 48 terabytes it's 48 terabytes it's 64 terabytes in hard drives but it actually has 48 terabytes in storage uh because we set up on a raid six raid six array right so backups so it's it's these things it's like instead of doing certain other things it's an opportunity cost thing it's a how much lifestyle do i want to have what is comfort to you may not be comfort to me um, so I don't need, I don't want to drive. I don't need to drive like not right now. Maybe I'll have a midlife crisis at 50 and then I'll have a sports car or 45. Maybe I'll have a freaking sports car at 45 or 50. I don't need one right now. So right now what I have is I have a Toyota RAV4 and I have a Nissan Sentra. Uh, so, you know, and then I'm giving my sister, my Nissan Versa note. So, you know, that's like, so those are my, cause the note, the v Nissan Versa note is almost is no, that one's completely paid off. It just needs repairs. It's a paid off car. It needs repairs. It's a 2016. It just needs repairs and it has had under the hood repairs. So it's practically brand new in terms of its guts. It just needs some body work. It just needs body work. So like, okay, boom, the Nissan Sentra, it's a 2021, I think. And it's almost paid off. It's almost paid off. The RAV4, it's an SUV, so it's not paid off. <laughs> so, but the, what's the good news with that? That one is really good for hauling things. That one's really good for hauling things because it's an SUV. So I can haul anything. I can load it up with all the gear, fixtures, stuff like that. It's almost as good as having a truck. So a good SUV is good for business. It's good. It's a good business uh, deal to have an SUV, right? So, I mean, so it's like things like that. Um. So I invest back into my business. That's probably like one of the first and foremost things I do. Hardware and software is probably my biggest other category besides investing in uh, my team is my hardware and software purchases. Um, I recycle the money from my hardware purchases because when I buy a new camera, I sell the old equivalent of that camera for 70% of its market rate. And then I recycle the money into the upgrade. So I recycle seven out of $10 on that's how I do my upgrades of equipment purchases is I sell the old thing and maintain my inventory. So if I sell the old thing at 70% of its value and buy the new thing, I recycled seven out of $10. So the other trick to that though, is I'm selling it after using it and taking all of the depreciations on it on the tax side. So I take the tax uh, depreciations on it and then when it's outlived its usefulness, because there's a new model every two to three years of these things, there's a new model. So I've got to take two, three years of depreciations. Then I sell the thing at 70%. Then the new thing is out. And now I have the new thing and I recycled the money. So it's just a practicality measure in terms of it's not frivolous in terms of the hardware cost. It's just a matter of strategic hardware cost. So... And the shelf life of these products, they last a long time. They're really good because I buy the best. I buy the best and I upgrade to the best because then the lifespan and the dollar utilization makes much more sense, much more sense. And I can sell it at a higher value when it's time to get rid of it because it's the best. And so it'll still be in demand and people will like, oh, I'm getting a bargain on it. I'm buying it for much less. And the thing is, I take really good care of my gear. So whoever gets it gets something that's, and I keep the boxes. So they literally get mint condition, very well used up. And because in my case, I have multiple cameras, the cameras don't get abused because the use is spread across multiple cameras. 
So my cameras also are getting well treated. They have less actuations, less shutter usage, less battery rundown because the usage is spread out across multiple cameras. So the workload is spread out. So that's how, um, so that's just another, just um, investing in your hardware type strategy and how you use it. Yep. So, you know, I mean, most people will never tell you this. This is like the real technical stuff that most people just never think about or they won't tell you. Because like it's really granular. Like, again, it's a really elaborate, um, it's an elaborate thing. Yeah, having the, the Ford is really good for hauling gear. Yeah. Um, I wasn't in a Lamborghini with Pat Flynn. We were in a Tesla Model X. We were in a Tesla Model X, actually. Um, we actually covered healthcare. That's actually not the biggest problem here in the U S and that's an exaggerated thing because it's just a matter of what most people's problem is, is they don't have the, um, security and stability measures in place to make that because like, I mean, literally, unless something is going to kill you, healthcare won't, healthcare won't wipe out your savings in the U S as a YouTuber or as an employee, unless it's something that would literally kill you, in which case it doesn't matter. Right. So that's not the issue is that people do not have the structure in place to protect them uh, against healthcare costs. Several reasons for this. Number one, if you actually cover have private health care insurance and you don't cheap out on private health care insurance, if you don't cheap out, if you do not cheap out on private health care insurance, most people in America will be fine if they don't cheap out on their private health care insurance. That's number one. Number two. In terms of wiping out all your earnings and savings, for a lot of people, that dollar amount is $10,000. You should already be working toward having that or more in an emergency savings fund. And it's not as difficult as it sounds. And I will tell you why. To get to $10,000 in savings for an emergency fund is $30 a day. You can do the math. $30 every day gives you a $10,000 a year emergency fund, $30 every day. This is one of the other reasons you should have a product that you sell so that you could take all the money from that extra revenue stream, not upgrade your lifestyle, put it into an emergency savings account, and then you don't have to worry about this because if you have good healthcare insurance in America and you have your private insurance as a full-time content creator, your out-of-pocket deductible cap is usually going to be $7,500 or about $12,500. It depends. What I would recommend somebody do to protect themselves, not financial or legal advice, but just human-to-human -human advice, is build that emergency fund, $30 a day to fund it, $30 extra a day, side hustle, do whatever, $30 extra a day, Fund that emergency fund of $10,000 with your online income. Do not upgrade your lifestyle. You also can have what's called a healthcare savings account. Money spent from a healthcare savings account on healthcare expenses is deductible on taxes. So you should have your emergency fund, but you should also have a healthcare savings account. And you qualify for that healthcare savings account probably because you've structured your LLC and set up your LLC and you have your tax IEN number or you have your DBA and now you can you're, you now you can have your healthcare savings account now you have and that i believe per year i think that it's 5000 or 7500 that's up to that that's deductible in healthcare expenses from that account so on top of that it would be deductible on taxes so now you have several layers of emergency provisioning here if you're a young person for very cheap, you can get what's called catastrophic healthcare coverage. If you're, I think, under 28, I think if you're under 28 or under 30, it is actually 
less than a hundred dollars, I think a month, less than a hundred dollars a month. And you could have catastrophic healthcare coverage. And that basically means if the worst thing possible should happen to you, you're good. And so you can have a, a catastrophic policy. Okay. So you have that option there. Another thing that people don't go get is they do not get, um, they don't get disability insurance protection as a self-employed person. I think that there are several companies that offer this. I think, and again, I'm not affiliated with any of these people, but like I think MetLife, Mutual of Omaha, and Northwestern Mutual, I think, offer policies around this sort of thing. But basically, depending on your policy, 60 to 70% of your income, if you become temporarily disabled, you can't be on camera, you can't do your work, you bust your hand, you can't edit, whatever... 60 to 70% of your monthly income can be covered and you can be paid that while you heal. If you have employees, you could extend this thing, pay a little bit more. And then also your team can be covered under a policy. If the, if you're the sole person that your business revolves around, then your team could be covered and they could still get paid out of um, the coverage from this uh, policy that uh, is, I think it's disability income protection is I think what it's called insurance. I think that's what it's called. So again, you should look into this. And again, you should talk to financial professionals. They can help you with this kind of thing. So if you talk to a financial uh, professional, they can help you figure this stuff out. And then all of a sudden you're like, cause like healthcare is this boogeyman in this country. Healthcare is in this, this boogeyman in this country. And if you don't have a pre-existing condition or you're not born with a disability, healthcare shouldn't be this boogeyman that terrorizes you for the rest of your life. Because if you just literally pay the insurance and you make the money and you're like a lot of this starts with, okay, get my skills up, get my income up, diversify my income, make more money. Then when you make that money, do not filter that money into lifestyle inflation. Don't buy Jordans. Don't buy Lamborghinis. Don't buy expensive cars. Don't get a penthouse. Put protections in place first. Put protections in place first. Then once you have protections in place and you know that that's on auto pay and that's good, and once you have an emergency fund, that's good. Lifestyle inflation or little lifestyle tweaks and stuff like that, that can come after you have protection and you're able to protect what you have, including income protection. So a lot of people aren't doing this. And a lot of people aren't diversifying their income to where there's money that is made, whether they hustle or not. Whether I hustle or not, book sales get made. Whether I hustle or not, Digital downloads get made. In terms of driving traffic to it, I've made so much content that I can automate things and stuff like that. There's content from these streams that can be made into clips and could like drive traffic. There's all kinds of ways to try to protect yourself here. Because like, I mean, I don't know what people think is going to protect them in terms of, I don't know what people imagine in terms of legislation would mean that they can get sick and everything will quite literally be okay. Getting sick sucks. And there's almost nothing you can do where it's like, oh, it'll all be okay. But there's a lot you can do to make it all okay. But there's no, no there's nothing that com covers everything. But most people don't realize that they can very readily put plan B, C, and D into place before they need government intervention, you know. You can have a plan C, uh, sorry, a plan B, plan C, and plan D before you ever would need government intervention. A lot of that starts with having the health care insurance and paying for private health care insurance and making sure you read your policy, making sure you read your policy and you know, and then as far as your deductibles, here's another good tip for everybody in life. Here's a good life hack. Here's an absolutely great life hack. Look at all your insurance that you have and look at all the insurance available to you and look at all of your out-of-pocket deductibles, here's a really good tip. Have that money in cash at all times so that if the worst should happen, if it's 500 on the deductible for your car insurance, have that, okay? If there's if you have a home warranty and there's some out-of-pocket deductible and it's like, oh, and for coming out, there's an $80 service fee. Always have that $80 service fee in sitting around cash on hand have it sitting around okay great so have that all right so have the emergency cash on hand and then for exuberant extravagant cost reasons because you can fix the problem now and you can feel, deal with the finances later a lot of you are reluctant this is not financial advice. This is just personal advice. A lot of you are reluctant to have credit cards. You're so scared of the boogeyman of the credit card and the interest rates. Well, first of all, 
consider getting zero interest six months or zero interest 12 month credit cards, number one. And that means you have six to 12 months to deal with this problem before any interest kicks in. So that's number one. And then number two, if you have credit cards that have a $2,000 limit, a $5,000 limit, a $10,000 limit, do you know what that means? That means when there's an emergency that's $2,000, $5,000, $10,000 more in immediate expense than the cash you have on hand, there's still a way to solve the problem because a physical problem that needs to be dealt with today is much better to get that out of the way and take that off the table, a problem that happens right now, than worrying about paying down a bill over the course of a year. So you have time to figure it out because if you deal with a healthcare problem, you can always make more money. So there are lots of levels of these protections. So you can get, um, build up your emergency fund, have a have health insurance in the first place, have a healthcare savings account, and then you can have emergency credit cards. You can have care credit and you can have emergency credit cards. And then you have a lot of ways to deal with this. And this is, by the way, before you touch your life savings. This is before you even touch your life savings. And then, oh, by the way, you can have income protection insurance so that while you're not able to make more income, there's still money coming in. Like, and this is like the stuff that no one makes a video about and no one talks about and that nobody knows about, but it is there, it is readily there. And one of the easiest ways to find out about a lot of these things, a lot of you could for $0, go ahead and sit down with a financial advisor at your bank for $0. You could make an appointment next week and ask them to talk to you about a lot of these things and to teach you the things you don't know about financial literacy, how to protect yourself, how to set up uh, some of these accounts that are going to give you benefits. And a lot of these things are tax deductible as well. And just no one bothered to talk to you about it. And yeah, we're going to have to have timestamps for all of this. Um, Blessed or messy says that's true, but the average American can't cover a six hundred dollar emergency. The average American, the average American isn't trying to be a full time content creator now, are they? The average American isn't building multiple streams of income on the internet, are they? The average American isn't trying to be a YouTuber. So all of you need to take whatever you read about the average American or the average person. You need to throw it out of the window. You decided to stop being average a long time ago, so stop worrying about it. You decided to stop being average a long time ago, so why are you going to worry about it? Why are you going to worry about what the average person can do? The average person isn't making content. So, and, and that doesn't, that's not facetious and that's not arrogant. It's just, it doesn't matter. By the way, averages, averages are misleading. You should look at medians. You should look at medians, not averages. You know why averages are misleading? Because averages are some number between someone who has $0 and someone who's a billionaire. Averages include the most ridiculous extreme outliers of the least productive and most productive people. So if you take away the bottom 10% of outliers and the top 10% of outliers, those numbers will change so dramatically as to make it feel meaningless. And that's the problem. Averages make for good headlines, my friend. Averages don't tell you the truth. It's better to know the entire classification of categories, and then it's only useful to know what applies to you. It's only useful to know what applies to your own situation. Averages are misleading. I'd rather know what's applying to my own situation. And I'd also just know objective reality. Objective reality is knowing every bracket, knowing the bottom 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60, 80, 90, 100. And what are the makeup classifications and um, statistics around each of those brackets in isolation, then knowing what the median is, and then knowing what the median is, and then knowing what you have going on and where do you fit where do you fit? Because a lot of people don't understand any of the data that they're consuming around money because it, it makes very little sense. Because what if they did, most people would understand something. There are 17 million retail workers in America, and then there are people who work in other sectors outside of retail. However, despite the fact that there's 17 million retail workers, there are 33, 34 million small business owners in America. And there are 22 million millionaires in America. So there are more millionaires in America than their retail workers. Now that on the surface might sound misleading because wait a minute, there's more working class people than there are rich people. But retail is just one sector of the economy. But no one sector of the economy is equal by itself 
to the number of job creators. No one sector itself is equal to the number of aggregate job creators. It takes multiple sectors of the bottom to make up the top in that regard, which makes some sense if you really think about it. And in terms of the number of people in this country that are absolutely destitute, the number of people that are absolutely destitute in this country don't outnumber the number of homeowners or successful people in this country. The bottom 14% of America is at a fluid poverty line, a fluid poverty line, meaning it's not even a fixed uh, amount of money. It's a fluid poverty line. And yet the top 18% of America is at six figures. So like, how do you reconcile that there are more people that are outlier successful than outlier poverty? There's so again, information is sensationalized. And this happened to me too, by the way, in such a way that we don't understand it. Another example would be if I told you that 90% of all YouTube videos that are not YouTube shorts, they're not YouTube shorts in 2020, for all time, for all time, 90% of them accumulated less than a thousand views on YouTube. So what that says is that it's impossible for someone to make it on YouTube, but it's actually not really, because then you have to account for who the majority of creators on YouTube are and what that looks like and who quits and how early, how many young people it is, young people dominate YouTube, how good can they be at content, they're making what they want versus trying to really be successful, blah, 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 blah. That's why 90% of content creators also don't make it into the YouTube partner program and 90% of people don't get 10,000 subscribers. Those numbers make it feel like it's impossible to grow a YouTube channel, but actually it's more that who it's impossible for is inexperienced people to grow very rapidly. And what's more true is that people quit before they do enough to be successful because on average to be successful or rather in aggregate from um, statistical analysis, not just the average, but in general, what has been concluded is that what may be necessary for most people to break through is to make 500 plus videos. And part of the reason we know that is if I give you the example that MKBHD made 100 videos and only got 78 subscribers, PewDiePie made 100 videos and only got 2,500 subscribers, and Mr. Beast himself, the biggest YouTuber, made 100 videos and only got 780 subscribers, you realize that 100 videos, largely even from people who later go on to be outlier successes and get over 10 million subscribers, people who made 100 videos couldn't even crack 10,000 subscribers, but yet the biggest YouTubers that did that couldn't get a, out of 100 subscribers, they couldn't get 10,000 subs, but they went on to get 10 million subscribers. What that is indicative of is the fact that it normally takes five plus years, five to seven years to make it on YouTube. It takes five to seven years on YouTube. There are outliers like James Johnny and Patty Galloway and so on, but... Your first 100 videos, it is fortunate if your first 100 videos got you into the YouTube Partner Program, then you're fortunate. For most people to get any success on YouTube will take them hundreds of videos. It will take them 500 plus videos. It'll take 500 videos for most people to crack 10,000 to 100,000 subscribers. That's what the data indicates. That's what the data indicates. And that's after data aggregate on millions of accounts. That's what that indicates. So when we look at um, full-time YouTube, when we look at finance, when we look at making money, when we talk about these protections, when we talk about all of these like things, you have to actually know how to read and parse the information, which is why I've done four-hour analytic streams. Because if you don't know how to read the data, it can mislead you and you don't know what story the data tells but you have to um, really get granular into it. And then you need multiple data sets to compare to. Um, let's see, I think we have a super chat here. I think we have a $10 super chat from Jack Decker. I need to find it. So just hang on one second, Jack, and I'll read that one. Ah, here we go, Jack Decker. Sorry for joining late. Uh, thoughts on Elon's recent comment about Twitter subscriptions and Twitter not taking a cut. Um, it's interesting and that's pretty cool, but we'll have to see how it plays out. It's too early to tell. Too early to tell on um, Twitter and Elon is an agent of chaos, so it's a little too 
early to tell. Yeah, a lot of it is also you have to separate a lot of these things uh, by age brackets as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, very good to hear, Micah. Uh, Roberto helped me, one of his helped me 10 years ago with my first professional portfolio. The rest is history. So glad to hear that, Micah. <laughs> Tim Simpson, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 29, uh, 2019 consumer expenditure, the average U.S. Uh, consumer spends $579 on alcohol annually. Well, there's your uh, $600 emergency fund. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so again, there's just like, um, yeah, there, yeah, there's just like a lot that goes into a lot of this. Now, some of you, some of you have made more than 500 videos and you still haven't made it on YouTube, but you have to ask yourself, have you made 500 videos that are at the level and standard of quality of even the mid tier creators in your same niche and category of content? And are you making competitive content or are you making something that is only as competitive? How much better is what you're making than the day that you started? Cause like video, if video 500 and video 50 still look the same, that's not indicative of growth in the quality and the value of the content. So the thing is if video 700 looks very similar to video 70 and if you've made hundreds of videos and your thumbnails after hundreds of videos don't look like a big youtuber in your same niche then you have several problems you need to address because you've just been doing the same thing 700 times instead of improving so you just have to really take that into consideration Yeah, um, one of the best ways to grow is to definitely post every week. Is to definitely post every week. And like I said, um, we can talk about, because we've talked a lot about a lot of the money questions too. I think we've covered a lot of the business stuff. There's a couple of questions I want to get to that came from the community tab. And we'll kind of run through some of those. Uh, we'll run through some of the community tab questions here. Um. And I'll try to keep them um, as short. Um, so one comes from Benson Makes Music. And this one says, um, let's see. Roberto, how can one tell if their content model or content category is legitimately sustainable over the long term? Uh, some spaces such as... Tech, photography are inherently stronger in this regard, as there's always fresh material to cover, be it new gear, techniques, or revisiting vintage items. Not all spaces have such a luxury, though I'm interested in how you determine whether or not a content category, uh, not even just a niche, but a broader category as a whole, is viable to build a creator's business around. This is an excellent question. I love the way it's phrased, too. So the way that I would address this question is how do I know that my niche is financially viable? is to start to look at, um, I basically, I would make this um, spreadsheet. I would make this spreadsheet that I was talking about. Um, so if we make this spreadsheet and we looked at um, the different ways to monetize, right? I'd basically try to figure out, I basically would try to figure out how many ways I can monetize that niche or that category. And so let's let's look at this. If you do gaming content, you probably can't do your own membership website. You probably aren't going to be able to do great with an ebook, courses, probably not speaking events or concerts. If you haven't built your like gaming channel in such a way that has like a way to tap into the music industry, probably can't do that. You probably can't do digital downloads. You're using someone else's intellectual property. Um, 
newsletter you might be able to do for the community, but it's going to be hard to monetize. You definitely can't do coaching or courses. So what are you left with at that point? If you're a gaming channel, you're left with merchandise, print on demand products and sponsors and maybe a little bit of money for affiliate links. And that's basically all your off platform. And then you have YouTube ads. If you do live streams, maybe super chats, maybe you can do channel memberships. You get YouTube premium, you get um, shorts ads. If you do shorts, you don't have music. So probably not getting streaming royalties. And yeah, you can do sponsors. So if you do gaming, the problem is you have the minority of access to the other ways to monetize. If you do movie reviews, you have limited access to the other ways to monetize. If you do um, TV shows, you have limited ways to the other ways to monetize. So that you, if you decide to go down that route, you just have to understand that, okay, I'm trapped in terms of my business model because I'm limited to this because I'm probably using someone else's intellectual property. So hmm, the only way to be wildly successful there is going to be to make a lot of content, make some of the highest quality stuff, build a really, really great community. And you're going to rely heavily on ads and sponsors and there's just not really a way out of it unless your merchandise that doesn't use somehow, some way you built a clothing line that doesn't use the other people's intellectual property, but is really dope. And your audience really, really loves it. Then, okay, that's your off platform is your merchandise and print on demand. But other than that, you don't have much options as far as that particular thing goes. What would be smart would be to use all of your knowledge and make a second channel or a second business <coughs> that finally is outside of that entertainment content that you love that finally lets you use more of the business uh, income streams that are available instead of just making a second entertainment channel with the same limitations you know repeating the same thing over and over getting different results so the thing is if you make enough to go full time if you make enough to go to full time, the answer is now to maybe make a faceless YouTube channel, struggle and not make like try to capitalize off your entertainment audience, make a faceless YouTube channel that can actually make money. And then I would go that way. So I would go I would go more in that direction. Um, music is another hard niche to win in, by the way. Music is another niche. That is very hard to monetize. It's not impossible. The, you make more of your money on a music channel through Spotify, usually. Usually, you'll make more of it through Spotify um, and through um, the streaming royalties if the music picks up than, say, just on, um, on the YouTube side. So um, that would be what would be helpful there in terms of, uh, let's say, a music channel. Okay? But... For a lot of you, that's going to be um, what's rough because you have to make your own IP to make any real money um, as an entertainer. As an entertainer, at some point, you have to be able to convince your audience to support your intellectual property and not the intellectual property of just like the fandom of the fandom. But um, but you have to be an extreme. Corey X Kenshin is an exception, not the rule. He's a content creator with 10 million subscribers. There's not a lot of content creators with 10 million subscribers. There is 1,600 content creators with, um, with 10 million subscribers. That's it. That's it. Corey is great. I love Corey X Kenshin. But he's literally, out of 100 million content creators, he's, a group, he's in a group of 1,600 people. He's in a, so he's not really... It'd be like saying, okay, well, Elon Musk exists, you know, and that's, this is no offense to you, by the way, I'm just making a point that, so we can't really look at the success of a 10 million subscriber channel um, as indicative of the theoreticals around how something is going to be and how successful it's going to be. So a lot of times determining how successful or viable the business model of your channel is, is straight up looking at how many options you have how viable they are. And then also trying to find, trying to find like 10 or more good examples of someone making really good money doing what you're doing and how they're making that money. It's the same thing I talk about with sponsorships. We'll talk about sponsorships in a moment. And I'll tell you about my workshop that comes out in uh, May that we're doing the live workshop we're doing in May. But yeah, that is, um, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, Global days. If you, um, 
if a video, if you have 150,000 subs and a video is stalling out with 250 views, you might need to see if it's still getting impressions in analytics and you might need to see if it's been um, restricted mode. You might need to check and see if the video is hit restricted mode. And then you have to see if it's not getting impressions anymore. So, yeah. Um, also, if you're uh, Ace is right. Also, if the content they made has nothing to do with the original reason people subscribed or watched you, um, that could be a reason. Also, it could be topic, title, thumbnail, timing, trend. So, yeah. A jigsaw. I did a video um, about what uh, what the uh, ad policy is for non monetized content that shows ads. You'll definitely want to watch that video. It has the details. Um, a lot of times. Um, the only way that um, a channel gets to 150 subscribers off of like two videos is if someone went crazy viral with like YouTube shorts or something like that, which I would still doubt the legitimacy of. Most of the time, that's just indicative of the idea that somebody probably bought their subscribers in that situation. So yeah, so again, the best way to determine how viable a channel is monetarily, monetarily is often uh, based on how many monetization options is available to the channel in the first place. So that's a good indicator. Um, that's actually usually a really good indicator. So let's see. Um, someone asked, where are the principles of storytelling when it comes to content creation on YouTube? And then how does YouTube define a good hook? And this one's coming from Lee Shalom. Okay, so Lee, um, the first question, what are the principles of storytelling when it comes to content creation on YouTube? Principles of storytelling, um, as far as I'm concerned, might be, and this is a good question. I actually think I can pull up the information I have for the storytelling framework we use in Awesome Creator Academy. So we actually have a storytelling framework. Um let me see. Storytelling. I'm just going to look it up because we have telling. Um, let's see. Oh, we have uh, we have a couple of frameworks here. Well, one we one thing we have is we uh, we have a framework that we call the study framework. Um, do I have the PDF for that here? I might have the PDF for that. If I have the PDF, I might be able to share it on the screen. Hmm. I'm going to look for this PDF, but I can tell you what the study framework is um, even without the PDF. We have the bit framework. I can just tell you what the study framework is. You, you, you know, it'd be nice if I had a visual for it for you, but we don't have a visual for it for you. But the study framework is structure, tone, uniqueness, dialogue, and your audience. So... Um, understand the structure of a video and how it's used to create a nar narrative arc um, with tone, establish the tone of your video and use it to create a specific mood or atmosphere for uniqueness. You make your video unique by infusing it with your own voice and perspective, your personality with dialogue. You have to write natural and believable dialogue in your scripting or have a really good communicative dialogue in a live stream or a communicative dialogue with your guest or the other people you're interacting with. And then as far as your audience, everything has to be tailored and crafted to your audience. So um, that is um, how you can address storytelling. Um, do we have a framework for hooks? Uh, 
think we might have a framework for hooks. Um, we have a framework for titles. I don't think we have a framework for hooks, but in terms of what YouTube considers or defines a good hook, it's uh, something in the very beginning of your video that helps with retention where you don't lose the audience. And I say you should focus on the first 15 seconds of making it as engaging, direct to the point, giving value in 15 seconds or less, then make sure that that first 30 seconds is really strong as well. And obviously, I think the first 90 seconds in total is probably the most important part of your video. This is what you're going to where you're going to lose people. You can think of this as the killing ground. This is where the video is going to survive or die based on how many people leave at the beginning of the video. So that is another one. Um, do not market your channel with YouTube ads. Um, YouTube ads exist to sell products. Uh, do not try to use it to grow your channel. Don't try to use YouTube ads to grow your channel. So there you go. Um, let's see. Best way to sell an ebook is going to be, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to be PayPal. It's going to be PayPal. Uh, why would you start a YouTube channel today? YouTube is oversaturated and competition is so heavy these days. I disagree with that one. Um, starting a YouTube channel today makes really good sense in general. Starting at any time makes good sense. YouTube's not oversaturated. YouTube is oversaturated with mediocre content. YouTube is saturated with content anybody could make. Um, so the, the thing is, people worried about YouTube being saturated. YouTube's only saturated with really one thing. Low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit, meaning that you're only worried about YouTube being saturated if you're making content that anyone can pick up a smartphone and make. Then YouTube's oversaturated with low hanging fruit and YouTube's oversaturated with videos that don't get a thousand views. YouTube's oversaturated with videos that don't get a thousand views. What YouTube is not saturated with is high quality content, high value content, and consistent content. YouTube is not saturated with that at all. YouTube is not saturated in almost any niche with a ton of creator options where someone shows up every day, let alone multiple times a week, and delivers high-quality, high-value content consistently firing all three cylinders. There's almost no embarrassment of riches when it comes to that meaning. And what I mean by that is this. None of y'all can pick a niche in YouTube that is down to a sub-niche. I'm not just talking gaming. I'm talking, if you want to say gaming, I'm talking first person shooter gaming. I'm talking specific down to the game of your that you're choosing or whatever. And you cannot pick you can't pick a single game in YouTube and find 100 channels. You can't pick one game in YouTube and find 100 channels for that game that upload 3 times a week and upload high quality content that is entertaining and engaging and and wait for it and wait for it that is difficult to make and is difficult to make. You cannot pick a single game in YouTube where there are 100 content creators uploading more than three times a week that make videos that are difficult to make. They make them three times a week. They're high quality and they're genuinely engaging and entertaining. You cannot find 100 channels for that. So what saturation? What is saturation? You can't find that. You can't go into... Um, and that's just gaming. And just a, and that's just gaming. So, and that's the most saturated right thing in YouTube. So that eliminates most channels. Just like Jay Query is saying, that eliminates most channels. So if I look at high quality content that's challenging and difficult to make, high value content that is unique and interesting and entertaining, and then content that's also consistent where the creator is not taking massive, massive breaks. Most content in any category, in any niche of any type does not qualify. You can't find 100 DIY channels that are DIY crafting channels that upload multiple times a week, make highly produced, high quality, high production content, that is high value and interesting and unique, and that they're, they're consistent and they don't take these long breaks. 
So the DIY niche isn't saturated because you can't name a hundred channels that meet those three qualifications. So YouTube is not saturated with content that is difficult to make in terms of high quality content that's differently difficult to make, high value content that is unique and engaging, and, and it's not consistent. It's not consistent. So that is what eliminates this idea that YouTube is saturated because it's saturated with garbage, which is why 90% of it doesn't get 1,000 views. And I'm not saying channels or videos that don't get 1,000 views are garbage. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that most content does not have an audience for it because most content doesn't meet the qualifications of what audiences want. And audiences want well-made content that has good lighting, good sound, good audio, is worth watching, tolerable to watch because they want to know that they have options where they're going to get a good quality video. They want a video on a topic that they actually care about that is interesting, engaging, and is unique and where it's not them seeing the thing they've already seen, hearing that they want something unique. And that's also going to mean that it's going to have a level of difficulty involved where they couldn't just do this themselves a lot of times. So there's that reason. And then consistency. Consistency beats everything else. So YouTube, the reason that there's 100 million channels and there's not even a million play buttons, there's only about 350,000 silver play buttons in the entire world. There's 50,000 in the US. India has the most. And that there's only 30,000 gold play buttons. And there's only 1,600 creators with diamond play buttons. The reason for that, and there's only eight channels, I think, with 100 million subscribers. The reason for that is you're talking about content that is high quality, made excellently, high value, that is unique, entertaining, engaging, and educates people in a unique way, whatever, and is also consistent. And where those careers are consistent on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis to some degree. And that's why also that is the competitiveness of higher tier content creators because they have teams that can put in the work. Just one big difference, one big difference, and why people get bigger when they go full-time is because when they go full-time, they go from being able to put 10 or 20 hours of spare energy, the scraps of their energy into YouTube, to being able to put 40, 60 hours a week of all of their focus into YouTube. That is a force multiplier. It's a force multiplier. So full-time YouTubers look very different than part-time YouTubers. Full-time YouTubers look different than part-time YouTubers because when you say, okay, it takes a lot to make those videos, to make it takes five hours to make a five-minute video or something like that, the difference is, a part-time YouTuber, a part-time YouTuber is doing that after working a 40 to 50 hour work week, still being an adult and doing all their adult responsibilities. And they're taking the scraps of energy with 10 hours, 15, 20 hours a week left of spare energy with all the distractions in the world of things they can do that are more interesting to them. And they're making YouTube content. A full-time content creator is taking 40 or 60 hours of all of their energy and making YouTube their first priority. That is the big separator between people who get a lot of views, make a lot of money, and not is literally just being a full-time YouTuber in the first place. And what happens for a lot of young people is a lot of young people will skip college to try to do YouTube, or they'll just take a lighter course load because then they have an advantage over a working class person. So the thing is, it's actually hard. It's very hard to transition from being a working class YouTuber to being a full-time content creator when you're older and you're like over 30 people under 25 have a massive advantage a lot of times. Not all the time, but a lot of the time, which is why the biggest content creators tend to be younger and nobody talks about this. And this is what actually is a big deal. Now, a different angle on that is sometimes people over 40 have an advantage because they have higher income, they've accumulated money, experience, and knowledge, and they might have the money for fancier toys and things that make making content faster. They might be able to more affordably say, I've got disposable income. I can hire a YouTube coach to help me. I've got disposable income. I can hire a full-time video editor. And then they have a full-time video editor. And then it's like being a full-time YouTuber without being a full-time YouTuber because they have a video editor full-time and they can just do the content. And so they have an advantage. Money is an advantage sometimes over youth. Sometimes youth is an advantage over money. Sometimes experience is. Sometimes networking is. There's a lot of ways to play it. And so there are people who have advantages, but the majority of YouTubers 
the only, most of the YouTubers operate from disadvantages and don't have advantages. They don't have experience. They don't have money. They don't have expertise. Um, they may or may not have time. So you may not have any of those advantages. You could still make it. It'll just be harder for you. It'll just be harder for you. This is why it takes some people five to seven years. It takes some people one to three years. The difference is what did they come with? What stats did they come with at the entry point? What stats someone starts the game with matter to that degree? Young people might have been dabbling and doing video editing and doing this since they were teenagers. So they technically might actually have expertise or experience. They might. Not professionally, but they put in the time. They're not learning from scratch. Then they turn 18, 19. They've been video editing for five years. And they turn 18, 19. They're a little savvy. They know a little bit about business. They're money hungry. And now they're taking a gap year from college. They can crush it. So that's what happens sometimes. Or they drop out of college. And then their parents give them some time to make it work. And then they, and they get a part-time job because they can survive on a part-time job. And they crush it because they decide... They're a kid. They can eat ramen. They can sleep on a friend's couch. They can get five of them as roommates and live in a three-bedroom uh, house. And they can do. And that's what a lot of the small YouTubers that make it that are young do. And they can do that. It's different if you have a family. It's different if you're over 30. It's different if you're 40s. And then you haven't made money by the time you're in your 30s and 40s and you're working class. It's much harder. It's much harder. The best, ad the best advantages in YouTube is being young and broke with an abundance of time and hunger and knowing the culture of YouTube and going being a go-getter, that's probably the best advantage. The next best advantage would be being in your middle years and having money because then you can buy time and someone else's time who's better at it than you instead of stumbling through learning stuff. And then, you know, and then you still have stability and you can have full-time YouTuber results while being a part-time YouTuber and keeping your job and making money at the same time. If you're in your like, you know, and that's what some people do. Um, now, if someone has technical ability, like my friend Technically T, he's a tech YouTuber. He has a successful job. He makes, I think he makes six figures at his regular job, I think he said in his videos or his live streams. He, like, he makes like six figures at the regular job. And, um, you know, he has um, a wife and kid. And yet he is almost a 100K YouTuber and he makes good, good money. But he does both because he has the stability because he also made his video. He, put, he poured money into a setup for his videos that makes making videos easy for him. And there's still some of the best videos at for what he does in his niche category. So he found the standard for his category. He's almost at 100K subscribers, but it's taken him years to get there. I think it's taken him like four or five, like four years now. I think it's four years. I think it's like four years or something like that. So like four or five years or it's coming up on five years. But he's about to hit 100,000 subscribers after these five years. And he could be full-time YouTube, but he'd rather have the stability of his high-income job and be able to funnel uh, the money from YouTube into growing the channel directly at no out-of-pocket cost. And with his uh, with the money, he was able to buy the best gear to make it fast to make tech content and to stay on top of tech content. So that was smart. So like, again, there are different advantages. And again, that's someone with a kid and a relationship and coming into it. But what was the advantage? Disposable levels of income was the advantage, not time. So some young people have time. Older people might have disposable income. If you have neither, that's what's really hard. Um, so like just kind of understand those things and like understand that that increases just the level of difficulty. It doesn't make it impossible. It doesn't, it doesn't make it impossible, but it means like, okay, this is going to have more challenges for person A versus person B versus person C. Um, so these are just kind of different creator avatars about like what your starting point, you know, might look like. And then in terms of level of difficulty, the level of difficulty in making your type of video the level of difficulty might vary depending on the niche, but the level of difficulty might be able to offset by money or skill or expertise. Oh, and here's T right now. He's just talking about him and he's, he's in here lurking. It's like, boom, well, there's T. Been on YouTube five years, slow progress, but it's always been up. Yeah, T's crushing it. T's crushing it. But like, it's about playing it smart. And so, yeah, and then there's also a lot of creators that blew up during the pandemic because during the pandemic, they got time to finally make videos. They got time to finally make videos. They didn't have that before. 
And then that's what made the difference. And that's why some people have been struggling on YouTube blew up during the pandemic because now they could put 40 hours a week into content. And so Leon L, that's what he's saying. Being a college student and a content career, COVID helped him save time on commuting, transitioning to classes, going to lunch, and so much more in lost time. And so he was able to reallocate that time. And because he was able to reallocate that time, not having money wasn't as big a deal. And it meant he could put any money that came could be invested directly back into uh, the channel. Also, too many of you worry about... Um, the views per upload, the views per upload obsession, too many of you worry about it. Cause again, I will show you, I'll show you analytics to make this point. Y'all worry too much about views per upload. I would worry a lot more about monthly channel views because I'll tell you the reason I would worry more about monthly channel views. I only worry about monthly channel views cause YouTube only pays me for monthly channel views. Now that sounds really cynical. I know that sounds really cynical, but I want you to hear me out on this. I only worry about monthly channel views because YouTube only pays me for monthly channel views. <laughs> That's it. I mean, and again, I know how cynical that sounds. I get it. Trust me. I understand. But I want to show you some numbers and why I say that. Here's 2 million views on my YouTube channel for 2022. Because I got super depressed and barely uploaded during the pandemic. You can see where I took entire months off during just even the last part of the pandemic. Just in the last leg of the pandemic, there are months that I took off. I took off like basically all of November and December and didn't upload. I took off all of February and didn't upload. There was these whole swaths of like I didn't upload in June. There's entire months like... Basically, there's five months of 2022 that have no uploads from me. Think about it. There's five months where I didn't work on my YouTube channel. And in ads alone, ads alone, without working for five months on my channel, almost half a year, almost half a year of not working on my channel, and I still made 30K on ads alone. Now, on the back end of the business in 2022, on the back end of the business on 2022, I made uh, $300,000 total. I made $300,000 total in 2022, but for five months, I didn't work on the YouTube channel because I took off November and December, didn't upload. I took off all of February, I didn't upload. Took off all of June, and there's a bunch of stuff in between where I didn't upload, like at all. There's entire months where I didn't upload. Entire months. So I basically took off half the year, half the year. If I had worked twice as hard though, I'd probably have gotten 60,000 subscribers in that year, four or five million views and more money. And that's just on ad revenue. And I still made 300,000 on the back end of the channel. So what I will tell you is the reason I don't worry about views per upload, views per upload, I don't worry about it because, because I get paid on monthly views in terms of ad revenue. I get paid a fixed fee, a flat rate fee on my sponsor rates. My sponsors are reputation and relationship based instead of reach based. I bulk sell things like my newsletter to my sponsorship, which I will talk about sponsors here in a minute. And I also built a great affiliate funnel and a great product marketing funnel on the back end of my channel to completely offset these things. Also, part of the reason I took time off last year is I wrote a book. I wrote a book, which is very difficult to do. I wrote a book. So, and I pub I self-published a book on top of all of that. And I had to learn self-publishing from scratch in a year. So that's also uh, a lot of it. And the book writing helped me get over my depression, by the way. The book writing helped me get over my pandemic depression. So between like lockdowns, pandemic, getting depressed, not traveling anymore not going to speaking events not seeing my friends not seeing family just and my dog's dying i got depressed for three years and it affected uh my content growth good news it didn't affect my income as much as it would have because in those three years i made over three hundred thousand dollars every year for those three years and the good news about that which very helpful to me and my family and to you know buying a house is and to paying my team 
the good news is, and they're paying all those taxes to the government, um, is because the good news on all of that is it wasn't entirely dependent on my views. I found a threshold of the amount of views that I needed to be financially viable, and it's not a million views a month. Trust me, if I was getting a million views a month, uh, the mortgage is paid off. But the uh, you can see it in the numbers. You can see it in numbers. So the the point is, I found a level of work life balance that says, here's how much I have to hustle. Here's how much I have to grind to build a foundation. And then once I build that foundation, I don't have to grind myself into the ground. And if something happens with my physical or mental health, I can deal with it. I can deal with it. So, um, and there's also a point, by the way, there was a point in here where I actually did get sick. Um, I'm trying to find where it is. It's somewhere in here, but at some point I did get sick and I literally couldn't make content because I had to recover uh, from COVID. So, um, I had to recover from COVID at some point in here. I forget which, um, where that is in here, but, um, you know, you have to do that. You have to recover, uh, from that, that, you know, so you can't make content while that's going on. So if these things happen, how do you financially secure yourself? And that's where with being a full-time content creator, diversifying the income streams actually matters. And since diversifying the income streams matter, um, the big one that most people, in our space actually benefit the most from is brand deals. So I actually kind of want to move into something that I'm offering. So on May 27th, I'm doing another one of my live brand deals workshops. We do these and we have 30 seats. We have 30 seats for the brand deals workshop. This one's on May 27th. So you have over a month to sign up for this. It is a price. And so if you go to awesomecreatoracademy.com slash brand hyphen deals live, you'll find the information around this. I'm going to link to it in the description. I'm going to actually post it as a comment here in the chat for you. Um, brand deals workshop, brand deals workshop for May, for May. And I'm going to post the link to that. And so you should be able to see it there. And the reason that we do this is because live workshops actually have been um, something that I found has actually benefited people the most. People do get the replay of the workshop, but joining the live workshop, people get to answer, get ask questions directly about brand deals. We do a 90 minute training, plus we do a Q&A at the end. And so that is what really helps people. So brand deals workshop, May 27th. There are also events where I'm going to actually start doing this one in person and people are going to be doing live role play with me on pitching to brands in person um, once we start doing those in person. But in-person events are coming back. This one is virtual. This one is uh, virtual via Zoom. But it's in about 40 days, so you've got time to sign up for it. There's a private Q&A and you get access to the replay. And the reason that me and my team came up with this, it'll be hosted by me and Andy Rivera. She's on my team. The reason we came up with this is because we can help you with figuring out how to actually approach brands. And I'm going to show you the software that brands use to audit content creators behind the scenes. It's a tool called Hype Auditor. Most of you have never seen how do brands evaluate us? How do they look up whether we have fake followers? How do we look up our, engage our engagement ratios? How do they figure out how much they're going to pay us? What are they looking for from us? How much does consistency play a role? So you've probably never seen that software. That's something you're not going to find in free content on the internet. Free content has everything. No, it doesn't. You're not going to see behind the scenes of that software. And the reason you're not going to see behind the scenes of that software is because that software cost me $399 a month to have access to as an agency. So that's agency software. Um, I'm going to teach you what attracts brands. I'm going to teach you how to reach out to them. And we're going to talk about pitching, but you're also going to get a digital media kit that you can edit. I've done the work for you. That would be worth the money by itself. So you're going to get an editable digital media kit to pitch your brands. You're going to get access to 12 email templates to reach out to brands. We're going to give you a system for reaching out to brands. And we're going to do a live role play to where you're going to see how brand negotiations happen and understanding contracts. We're going to explain the terms of the contracts in the brand deal negotiation to you. And we're going to walk through a sample contract so that you understand what's going on. And we're going to help you identify red flags in working with brands so that these brands don't screw you over 
so that you get paid. So you get paid on time. We're going to teach you how to negotiate the payment terms and getting that money, making sure you capture it right. And we're going to make sure you're doing your invoicing right. So that's why we put together this workshop because it is a training. Um, this is something that I always enjoy doing whenever we do it. There's 30 seats available for it. So the link to sign up is in the description of this video. And also, um, I'm going to link it again in the comments here now that I've told you about. It. Join the brand deals workshop on May 27th. So you guys have till basically the end of May to sign up for that. Workshop is uh, $299. And like I said, there's only 30 seats. It's $299. And you're going to get the replay, but you also get the media kit template and you get the 12 email outreach swipe files. You get the 12 email templates and you get the media kit temp template for pitching to brands and you get access to the replay. And there's also a Q&A session at the end. And there's also where me and Andy will do a role play so you can see how pitching to brands works. You'll get a physical example of that. So this is something that I'm really looking forward to. We did uh, one earlier in February. We did one in February and that went really well. We had about 26 people attend that one. So it went really well. And I think that for some of you, for some of you, this is not for everybody. I know it's expensive, but for some of you, it makes perfect sense because this is where you're going to get brand deals and you're going to be able to get like $500 a deal, $1,000 a deal, $1,500 a deal. So being able to get paid for these brand deals that you're doing and understanding how to work with the brands, that's what's going to probably help you the most. And it's something where you know how to make the money back is going to be the brand deal itself is what's going to make the money back. So there you go. And the price is uh, two ninety nine. It's three hundred bucks. So it's three hundred bucks, and that's what you get for that. Uh, the information is linked in the description, and I just dropped it in the chat for you. So that's it on the brand deals workshop stuff. So going back to some of these questions, going back to some of these questions. Yeah, I would agree that subs become more important if you're under a thousand subscribers if you're under a thousand subscribers subs can become important unless you're monetizing in other ways the amazon influencer program like i said is a good way to monetize it's obviously going to be better if you're a tech youtuber beauty youtuber lifestyle vlogger to do the amazon influencer program but you can make a couple hundred to a thousand dollars with the amazon influencer program even as a smaller channel um I did, it wasn't getting a ton of views, but I was getting the right views and it was for the right product categories. The product categories for Amazon actually are what matter uh, when it comes to making money. When it comes to making money, the product categories for Amazon are what matter. Um, like I said, the camera, the camera category, oh, so much good money. So much good money in affiliate links from the camera category. Um, it's better than most things, not even close. Uh, Charlotte Ann Moore says, I'm reading your book now, well worth the investment. Yep. Having a book, having a book, like I said, it's $6 a sale. If you did one book sale, it's worth more than most of you make for a thousand views on ad revenue. Most of you make less than $6 in take home pay on ad revenue, right? If you, for per thousand views, per thousand views. But one book sale, if you had a book, is worth more than a thousand views. Think about it. If you're selling t shirts and hoodies, usually the margin on t shirt and hoodies is about eight dollars. So one t shirt or hoodie sale is worth more than a thousand views on YouTube. So again, a lot of you are obsessed with the views per upload because your monetization strategy, your monetization strategy doesn't um, make the most of what you have. Uh, yes, yeah, starting an LLC in with Stripe Atlas is about 500 bucks. It's about a little less than that if you use Zen Business, um, but it's about roughly the same. But you'll know that it's legally done and incorporated. A lot of people cheap out on this, and then uh, they end up paying more for it later because it's not set up properly. Um, so again, for legal and tax purposes, it's important to use professionals. And yes, you pay money when you use professionals, whether it's you're setting up your LLC whether it's your accounting services, whether it's your bookkeeping services, whether it's filing your taxes with CPA or whatever, you will pay money for these things, but you will save money in the long run and save headaches because most of you, when you try to do it yourself, you screw it up and you end up paying anyway. 
and it ends up being worse. So um, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. So just kind of like, you know, understand going in that for the financial and legal protections that setting up the business side properly uh, allow for, that you benefit more. You benefit more from that. Now, one of the other things I'll say about brand deals is a lot of you underprice your brand deals and it's the worst part of it. That's why I'm also doing the workshop is the pricing portion. Most of you don't know how to pitch and outreach to brands. Most of you haven't gotten brands to come to you. Then even if they did, most of you don't know how to negotiate with the brands. You don't know how to price yourself. You don't know how to navigate the contract. You don't know how to negotiate fair payment terms and payment schedules. You don't know how to set up the invoicing. You're paying too much on fees sometimes for that. And then you don't know how to get the brands to commit to commit to, commit to repeat business and repeat uh, monthly income contracts. I do six and 12 month contracts with my brand deals most of the time. And that's why I make over $100,000 a year in brand deals alone, partnerships of some kind, because I set up recurring monthly revenue contracts. I set up six to 12 month contracts. More of you should be doing that. I also set up packages and pricing to where I don't just pitch them my YouTube channel. Sometimes I'll go to events and work for them at the event. And I'll also incorporate them into my newsletter in some kind, use community tab posts with sponsorships, do all those things. There's ways to package these things to where they actually make you more money and to where you can get better rates. A lot of you have no idea how to work with talent managers. I talk about that in the workshop. A lot of you have no idea how to work with PR agencies. I talk about that in the workshop. Um, so this is why the Brand Deals Workshop is actually a good investment is this is the information that is not usually for free on YouTube. And when it is, it's not in depth. It's not in depth. So I think a, a two-hour like workshop is a better substantive thing than a lot of what's out there for free. There's some good information for free. I've put out a lot of good information for free. The information I put out for free gets less views than it should if people were taking it seriously. If people were taking it seriously. So just um, putting out there that most YouTubers that are full-time, most of the full-time YouTubers, they make their money from brand deals and not ad revenue. And that's the ones that don't have another business where they're selling something. Uh, Mr. Beast at this point probably makes more from his Feastables um, brand because it's a direct-to-consumer product. Mr. Beast probably makes more because he has a direct-to-consumer product than he does from ad revenue right now. And he's not taking as many sponsorships either. So I would argue Mr. Beast's own business makes him more money than ad revenue and probably more money than sponsorships, if we're being real. Um, so I would pay attention to, to that. I wonder if we have more questions in the chat about the business or the full-time or making money aspect of this stuff. I'm going to answer some more questions from the community tab, but like, it looks like all of y'all are just arguing about the algorithm right now in the chat. It looks like the chat's just arguing about the algorithm. If you missed the live, uh, Commando Jones, if you missed the live workshop, um, the replay is available for the people who signed up for it. Uh, I have not, I've not signed, I've not made like a separate thing where you can buy the replays. Um, we might do something like that. I am working on a course for the brand deal stuff. Uh, but that's like later in the year, there'll be a brand deals course, but the workshop, the workshop that you can attend live, you get the replay and the workshop is at 2 PM on May 27th. Um, so some of you are asking questions about the workshop. Um, so let me bring it up on screen again. So for those of you asking about the workshop, it is on May 27th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's $299. There is a Q&A. It will be 90 minutes to two hours, and then there's a Q&A. There's only 30 seats available. There's only 30 seats available. And you can sign up for it at awesomecreatoracademy.com. And the link is in the description. <clears throat> yep. 
Yep. So that um, that's something that if you want, this is an option for those who want it, by the way. This is for someone who wants it. Nobody is obligated. But this is for the people who want it. Uh, so important. I did this, the workshop and it was really helpful. Definitely worth it. And you get not only released. Um, well, no, those people who did the first round, they got the court. They get the course when it comes out. The people who did the first round, the people who did the second round there, uh, they don't get that. They have to, they'll get a discount code, but they will not get the, uh, the course when it comes out, they'll get a discount code for like a percentage off. But yeah, it's Saturday on May 27th, um, 2 PM Eastern standard time. And the people who did it in February, the people who did it in February, they got a bonus where I was like, and when my, my course is out, they'll get it for free. Uh, the people who do it this time, they will, for the round two, the basically the second cohort, they're going to get a massive discount when the course comes out and they're going to get early access when the course comes out before um, other people. So they'll get that. So the people who did the first workshop in February uh, got the best out of it because they also are going to get access to whenever my course releases. So good for them. Uh, but yeah. But yeah, the workshop is $2.99. It's May 27th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 30 seats available and for the people who want it, for the people who want it. Um, yeah, quote from Mr. Beast, replace the word algorithm with the word audience every time you want to complain about it. Yeah. I would I would agree with that. Yep, and Josh, we answered what time the workshop is. Um Um, I don't delete videos. I I don't delete videos, but your problem is you want to delete it and upload it. You want to screenshot your amazing reviews and comments before you delete a video and re-upload it. I don't know why. I like that. That seems like a vanity thing or like a emotional thing, and I don't get it. Um, but like I unlist or private videos, and then like that's that because I keep the data. I keep all the data. Um, you have to check the Amazon website. I don't want to say because they changed it sometimes or whatever. If you want to know how many followers you need to be in the Amazon influencer program, I'm sure their website tells you because the reality is that they may have changed that number. So I might misquote what the number used to be back in the day or something like that. So you'll just want to go to their website. They'll tell you. Uh, did we already talk about how to keep yourself private and reduce the chances of being doxxed? Yep, we definitely talked about that. Geekdom 101, what's up? Yep, Geekdom would know about that too. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, Jack, we did it earlier. Um, there'll be a timestamp at some point. There'll be a timestamp at some point, but we did talk about it. We definitely talked about it. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see. Sorry, I'm looking for a question that I saw here in the comment section. I mean, the uh, community tab comment section. Um, let's see. Someone asked a question about how many hours should we be dedicating to our page? So um, that's an interesting one. I'll also answer this question about how to know if you're shadow banned. Um, shadow banning 
is a technical term that changes based on what company and what technology you're talking about. The main thing you want to look at for YouTube is to look at individual videos, impressions, and see when the impressions went away and then see if there's anything that changes that. You also might want to look at um, restricted mode. Turn on restricted mode, go to your channel and see if any videos disappear um, if you put it into restricted mode. So um, you'd want to put up two windows side by side and then have one where you have the normal view and have your videos tab and then have one where you go into restricted mode, put them side by side, and then you can go, if videos disappeared, then you know something's up and then you want to look into those individual videos and you have to appeal those and there's a form to appeal them. Um, tell them, Geek Them says, Tell them how important it is to have strong mental health to deal with the BS. Oh my God, yes. Uh, full-time content creator, like any full-time career and profession, you're going to have ups and downs. And the difference is that um, you're doing this now with an influx of public feedback. Whereas if you did a traditional job, if you did a traditional job, there's not this influx of uh, public feedback and attention and criticism on a constant basis. So... Uh, full-time YouTube as a career, full-time content creation as a career is much more likely to wear down your mental health than a regular job. A lot of people think that this will be the exit from a toxic workplace and it may not be. Uh, how long ago did I start? Like 10 years ago. Started doing it seriously in 2023, summer of 2023. Oh, sorry, 20... Summer of 2013, sorry, summer of 2020 through, uh, summer of 2013 through 2023. So it's about 10 years now. Uh, if you ask questions, they do come through. Yes, no matter how successful you become at this, you will have enemies. That is correct. Um, this is actually something I talk a bit, quite a bit about in my book. In my book, there's 20 chapters. Five of them are just about mental health. Five of them are about mental health. Like one of them is about burnout. One of them is about criticism and imposter syndrome is another one. Um, this stuff is um, real, not being supported by your friends and family when you do this. Like all that stuff is real. I talk about it extensively. I definitely talk about it in the book. Like I said, there's like four or five chapters. There were exclusively mental health chapters of dealing with being a content creator and choosing this career path. It is a career path. If you take it seriously, some people it's a paid hobby. There's a difference between being a hobby pit creator and a full-time creator. Oh yeah. I wanted to answer the question about how many hours should we spend on our page? I think you should figure out how many hours an individual task takes, then try to get really efficient to reduce the number of hours for that task. Then you can increase the quality of everything. And if you're treating it like a full-time job, I think somewhere between 20 and 60 hours a week is normal for most content creators. Somewhere between 20 and 60 hours a week of individual time, personally, is what most content creators do in their career. However, that varies from creator to creator, niche to niche, and with the type of content you make, level of difficulty. Some people make a full-time income on YouTube and they spend 15, 20 hours a week on it. Other people spend 40 or 60 hours a week on it. So it really depends on the type of content you do and what you're making and how you go about it. So that plays a massive factor, a massive role in it. Um, what I would say is a smart allocation of time is that you should allocate time to just doing research. So maybe there should be like entire day, like an entire day that's dedicated to research and admin work. So maybe it's one or two days that are research and admin work. Then other days might be filming days. So you might do most of your recording on a certain day for multiple videos, even for multiple videos. I do that film, like put on the, the, the uniform, put on black shirt, black hat for me or whatever I want to wear and put on whatever hat I want to wear. Like I just put on whatever my uniform is for this week, film the videos. And then there's a day that is set aside. That's just a purely editing day. So there might be one or two editing days on the schedule, 90 minute editing sessions, 90 minutes of editing, take a break, do something else for 30 minutes, do another type of work, 
then come back another 90 minute editing session in the afternoon. Then maybe there's a 90 minutes editing session in the evening. Like, and that's how I don't burn out on long edits. I don't burn out on line long edits because it'll be 90 minutes in the morning, 90 minutes in the afternoon, 90 minutes in the evening. And then I can get through a massive editing session and the work is done. Um, and then there's stuff that happens in between those, whether it's taking meal breaks doing other types of work or just relaxing for a little bit. And then that means that, okay, great. And so I still managed to spend four and a half, five hours editing, but I broke it up and then it was more productive by breaking it up it is better to do that than to sit there and grind at it for five or eight hours. And it come out worse than to just spend three sessions of 90 minutes a piece working on the edits. So that's like, that's how I do it. So that's what, for me, I found that's what makes sense. And I think for a lot more of you, um, that makes sense. So Geekdom says, uh, content creation can be a uh, exit from a toxic corporate America, but then you have to become a public figure, which automatically breathes envy. Yeah, I agree with that. I largely, I largely agree with that. Uh, Jacked and Stack says YouTube Studio app wrecked my mental health. I had to uninstall it. Any tips for not letting state get to you in the early days? I don't have as much advice for that because in the early days, I was more excited by making videos and like I didn't care about my growth. And I'm not just saying that because I'm like at the time, I didn't know to care about my growth because like I told you, I was a full time freelancer. So since I was a full time freelancer, I was excited that I quit my nine to five job and I had my own clients and I was in control of everything. And I was doing YouTube and I was trying to grow that. But I was I was trying to grow that. But it wasn't the intention that, oh, and I'm going to become this big YouTuber or nothing like that. Um, so I was really just excited about making the content. And I grew from zero to 100,000 in three years. And I was really just excited about making the content. And. I did daily content, so I did 800 videos, and that's what got me to 100,000. So it's hard for me to speak to the mental state in the early days of YouTube because in the early days of YouTube, I was excited about it. I was excited about making the content, and I wasn't excited about growing or discouraged. About, like, growing didn't discourage me. It largely still doesn't. Because then it moved from being excited about like just making things to where I'm excited about the community that I get to show up for. I'm also excited about just seeing and experimenting with how much I can grow the business. Growing the business for me now is bigger deal than growing the channel, for example. Um, but I think for a lot of you that might be younger than me, because uh, I'm 38, a lot of you that are younger than me, I think a lot of you grew up with social media. I didn't grow up with social media. So the other problem is if you're younger than me, you might have grew up with social media. So your relationship with it is different than mine. So it's hard for me to talk to you about what you're feeling because I didn't live through that because I didn't grow up with this. I was already an adult when social media came out. I was already 20. I was 20 or 23. I was something like that, right? So when most of these platforms started you know, getting the beginnings of traction, they didn't even become popular until much later. So I was definitely an adult at that point. Right. Like none of this stuff became popular until I was about 27. So no one considered it a career until I was about 30 or more. So like for me, the issue with like the getting depressed in the early days, I can't relate to it as much. I, I understand it. I can empathize to some degree or can sympathize to some degree. But I wasn't in that situation because I was happy for any of it. And I was actually scared when I re when like when 11 months went by and I realized, holy crap, I have 10,000 subscribers in 11 months, uh, 11 months of taking it seriously, 11 months of taking it seriously. I was like, where I, you know, by uploading every week, by uploading every week, I was like, oh, my God, um, my videos kind of suck. And I have an audience now that cares. Uh, OK, I can't have crappy audio anymore. I got to go. Oh, man. Oh, this thing's an autofocus. People are actually going to see it now. And it's an auto and it's uh, out of focus and people are actually going to see it. Oh man, people are going to hear the sound of my voice and I don't even like it. Uh, like, so like, then I just said, oh, I guess I got to become a better editor. And so I just became a better editor. Then when I grew and I was like, oh wow, I have like, you know, 50,000 subscribers and I might get a hundred next year. I was like, oh, I got to really step this up. So 
when I hit a hundred thousand subscribers, I bought a better camera. I bought a camera uh, with a flip out screen at that point. And I, so I bought um, at that time it was a Panasonic later. I got my Sony stuff and then I was like, Oh, I, I really can't have bad audio, bad, this bad, that bad lighting, autofocus issues, nothing like that. So then I invested heavily into just upping the quality of my content and I stayed daily and I tried to keep to that schedule. And then I did that for another year, got another hundred thousand, did it another year, got another hundred thousand, slowed down a little bit, got to 400 K. Um, then the pandemic, then I moved, then the pandemic happened. Then I slowed down. So like, um, I got discouraged mentally during the pandemic and a lot of things compounded on that. Some of it, I could say, uh, it sucked to see some of the momentum or growth of my channel go down, but I was still growing. So it's like, eh, and then my money was going up. So it was like, eh, so I just redeployed my mental energy and said, well, if I don't worry about like getting a million subscribers and I worry more about like the fact that like the business is growing, people are buying from me, people are happy with me, my reputation is going up. I found other things to focus on in the early days. The best thing you could do is be in love with the content that you're making in your early days because growth is not something that's reliable. So you have to be in love with the process of making videos. If you're not in love with the process of making videos, you will struggle. You will struggle if you're not in love with the process of making videos. So you should be in process. Uh, you should be in love with the process of making videos and you should probably to some degree really love the niche that you're in. It doesn't have to be the thing you're most passionate about because I think it should be what you're passionate about, that you're good at, that actually makes money, that there's an actual audience for, which I think is hard for a lot of people to grasp. But um, so I focused on, so I just focused on enjoying the process of making content. And that made a big difference in how I felt um, about everything I was doing. And so for your situation, I would say that you may not be in love with what you're making. Um, is Social Blade a reliable source for seeing how much uh, channels make? Nope, because it doesn't tell you, one, it, it's not even accurate on their ad revenue because Social Blade is not accurate on my ad revenue. That's for damn sure. Um, so it's not it's not accurate on how much channels make, not at all. Like, I mean, the only people who believe that it is are new creators or that aren't monetized most of the time. Because, I mean, mine, Social Blade, Social Blade isn't accurate about my ad revenue at all. Social Blade isn't accurate about my ad revenue at all. And Social Blade isn't accurate about my CPMs at all. Like, Social Blade never gets it right when it comes to what my channel is capable of earning, like realistically. Uh, my CPM, what advertisers pay, my CPM is $27. Social Blade has no idea. Social Blade has no clue about my channel. So it's not even accurate. It's an estimate. It's an estimate. So sorry, like when it comes to revenue, it's guessing between 25 cents and four dollars on cpm uh my cpm is not 25 cents nor is it four dollars so guess again social blade and then it doesn't account for brand deals it doesn't account for affiliate links it doesn't account for merchandise sales it doesn't account for any product sales it doesn't account for any of that so like social blade is not a good indicator I mean, it's like, I hate to say it, but it's like, it's for people in the community to some degree that don't know better. It's one of the worst things for your mental health to look at it. And I say this as someone who collects data and reports from Social Blade, and I pay for Social Blade. I, I'm in the paid tier because what I do is I run reports to know averages across things in YouTube. So I, I pay to run reports. So not only do I pay them a monthly fee, I pay for individual report data, report data. But that's but I do that because right, but right now I'm using ChatGPT and the YouTube API to build my own app to build my own data on the back end. Um, and it can only be but so accurate, but I'm building my own app for my internal use for my team to use um, for using the API protocols. And uh, we're doing that to collect our own data. But no, I don't 
like social blades bad for mental health for creators looking too much at their, their views, doing comparison games, keeping up with the Joneses. Social Blade is YouTube's equivalent of keeping up with the Joneses. And then on ad revenue, it is not the least bit accurate to know what a channel makes. And it, it's largely none of your business when another channel makes. I show you as a teachable moment and a lesson, but it's not really, it's not that healthy for you to know what other people make in terms of money sometimes. Most of you wouldn't be depressed if you didn't know how good millionaires and billionaires have it in the first place. If you were never able to see on a regular basis, people richer than the richest person in your town, you would be happier. You'd be happier if you never knew what billionaires had or you never knew that they exist. If you never knew that billionaires exist and you never knew that there's a such thing as a yacht, you'd be happier. If you, if the, if the only idea you had of rich was the richest person in your town or that your boss existed, you would be happier. So like, Social Blade is like one of the worst things in the community because it can be an interesting place to collect some data and understand some things about channels, but it's not good. It's not a reliable source for how much money a channel makes at all. The only people who love it are commentary channels and small YouTubers. They're the only ones who love that. And, you know, the more, and it doesn't tell you the whole story because again, look at me, YouTube ad revenue is 10% of my income. So like it's an irrelevant stat and the views that I get still make more than people who get more views than me. If you were a YouTube shorts creator, you could get 10 times as many views as me and not make as much money. You'd make less than you can get 10 times the views as me and make less than half the money if you're a YouTube shorts creator. So it's a really bad indicator. Um, it's a really bad indicator. Uh, is if is there anything that you would tell your past self about how to approach content creation if you started today? Yes, I would say for me, only if only my past self, this is not advice to any of y'all, but to to 2013 Roberto, actually, shout out to 2010 Roberto, like 2000, all right, actually, 2009 Roberto, don't screw off four years without uploading videos and wait to 2013 to take it seriously. So number one, first advice, start sooner and do it weekly, young Roberto. Like 2009 Roberto, upload a video every week, never miss a week of uploads and try to stick to one audience or figure out what you like, upload every week, figure out what you like. And then when something works and you like it, hopefully it's like freelancer stuff and then content creation later, stick with it. When it starts working, Go daily, young Roberto, and then go daily. And then um, maybe don't turn off daily entirely after those three years. After three years daily, that's a lot. You're exhausted. Then just still keep uploading two to three times a week, Roberto, and upload two to three times a week and never miss a week, younger Roberto. So yeah, I would just go back in time and tell myself to just be consistent and never miss a week of uploads is the advice to me. I would tell myself to start sooner. And then I would tell myself to exploit the pandemic and upload every damn day. And if I can't manage that, upload every week, two to three times a week. If I can't manage that, never miss a week of live streaming and still upload once a week. And so I still get a hundred videos a year minimum during the pandemic and get the traffic increase that happens during the pandemic. And then, yeah, so I would just basically tell myself, to be more consistent, do all those things. I would tell myself also probably ruthlessly, I would tell myself to not dabble in entertainment content like I did when I was in my early, because I did entertainment content on and off a little bit when my early days, when I was doing variety content, I was doing business Monday through Friday and then entertainment content on the weekends. And I would go back in time and tell myself to not mix and match, to not mix and match. And that if I want to do entertainment stuff, to do a different channel for the entertainment stuff. And I, I would have mixed and matched on that. And uh, so I would do that differently and not diluted uh, the content. Um, so if I go back in time, there's like five or 10 mistakes. There's like five to 10 mistakes. If I Maybe that's a video. If I go back in time, there's five to 10 mistakes that I could, would correct. And the five to 10 mistakes would be, I would have started sooner and just never stopped. Number one, I would have started sooner and never stopped because like, there was a whole period where I didn't really upload from 2009 to 2013. So I don't call, count that period because I didn't upload anything. Then in 2013, I took it seriously. And I would say uh, from then, take it seriously. And I would say 
Don't dilute the audience. Don't mix entertainment and education content on the same channel. So I would do that. Do more of what works. If something's working, double down on it and 10X it. 10X whatever's working. I would do that because that's not what I did. I would um, probably build my newsletter sooner. I would start selling something of my own sooner. And then I would also stay consistent and never, ever, ever miss a week of uploads. Then I would have taken advantage of the pandemic to double down on content. No doom scrolling, no consuming social media. Just make content. Don't look at the news. Turn it off. Put my head in the sand and just grind it out. Uh, what else? Those are the main seven things I think I would have done differently. Um, early on, I would have focused on thumbnails even more. No lazy thumbnails ever. No lazy thumbnails ever. So that was another one. No lazy thumbnails ever. That's another one. Probably. Probably I would have at some point at least tried to make something that might go viral. I've never really put an effort to try to go viral. So maybe take a couple more swings at that. Take a swing at that once a year. I'd probably say my advice back to myself is like, hey, take a swing at a viral video once a year. Let's take a swing once a year even. Yeah. You know, so like, you know, maybe one to three times a year, take a swing at a viral video. Um, and I'm trying to look for a 10th thing that I would have done differently. 10th thing that I would have done differently. Hire other people sooner. Hire other people sooner. Yep. Definitely hire other people sooner. I should have gotten an editor a long time ago. Uh, jQuery asks, what's the best way of coming up with high quality filler content, meaning content you can post while larger videos are still in the works? The current videos I'm working on are taking months and I'd really like to just post something this week. I would say it depends on what you're doing, but I would say like um, a top list video. A top list video is my favorite filler content that's high quality. So top 15 this, uh, worst 15 that. Like though, So top list are good. Uh, ranking videos are good. Like videos where you're doing um, rankings, top, like so doing ranking videos. So top list uh, ranking videos, A through F or S through F, like sorry, where, yeah, where you're like ranking something like, worst of or something like that best versus worst versus videos are good those are good filler pieces of content that still get views and they're evergreen and they're evergreen so they stack views they stack views and those are good money like those videos are good money those videos print money so that's what i would say Uh, G2G official says, would you recommend paying for an editor when starting a gaming channel? Not when starting, not when starting. And then if you're doing a gaming channel, I would get very clear on figuring out what my business model is for that gaming channel. And like, like I said, I would figure out what my business model is, what my monetization is going to look like. Um, you know, like I said, I, I make the chart and I go, what are the opportunities to make money? Um, both on the platform and off of the platform, gaming has the least opportunities to make money. Um, and so your videos have to do well in gaming. Your videos have to do well in gaming. My videos don't have to do well because I have 20 monetization options. I have up to 20 different monetization options and most of them don't even require the platform, just traffic the platform can give me, right? Gaming, almost all of your... Almost all of your value, if you do YouTube gaming, is on platform. And then after that, it's merchandise and it's print on demand products. And that's like almost all. And then sp and sponsors, you maybe dabble a little bit of affiliate links. If you do the hardware side of gaming or some of the lifestyle side of gaming, you can build a gamer's paradise. That maybe is like a thing. But there's like, so all of a sudden, you have one third of the options that let's say an education channel, something like, I mean, if you're a gaming channel, you have a third of the options than a English to Spanish teaching language channel. Language teaching channel has um, 
a travel channel. You have half the options of a travel channel. You have the ha- you have a third of the options of a language teaching channel. Gaming is fine. I'm not saying I'm not saying anything about against gaming. I'm saying it's one of the most competitive is one of the most competitive things that exist with the least monetization options. And it's very hard to be um, successful. But I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just laying out the reality to you from a business standpoint. And it's like, but if you're a dude in your 20s, gaming content is what people want to do. So I get it. Uh, Chad has a really good question. So Chad asks, uh, YouTube has changed a lot in 2023. How should a new channel approach the community podcast and future courses features? Okay. So if you're doing an education channel, if you're an education channel of some kind, let's say you're doing uh, photography. Let's say you're doing um, something else. Like let, let's say you're doing video editing or do your tutorial channel, whatever. Okay. A couple of things. So YouTube is going to have its own paid courses thing. So it's going to try to compete with Skillshare. YouTube is going to try to compete with Skillshare on a paid courses model. The difference is you're going to pay for the courses or they can be free. You're going to pay for the courses up front. The difference in the problem is the difference in the problem I have between that and selling your own course off of platform from YouTube, which I will do a video about this. When YouTube unleashes this, I will probably get into the early beta. I'll probably be an early beta tester for this for YouTube. So with the courses thing, if you sell your own course on Kajabi, right? I have it linked in the description down below. It's what I'm using. Not only do you keep the money instead of splitting it with YouTube, which is really important. YouTube will take a cut just like they do with Super Chats. So not only will you not want to split the money with YouTube, YouTube won't give you the email list, I don't think. I don't think YouTube gives you the email list when you do it on their platform. So that's like, that bothers me. I want the email list. I want access to the customer. I want control. I don't want them to be able to shut down my account and then I don't have access to my people. That's where I'm very frustrated. And I'm like, I'm all about that website. I'm all about that newsletter because I'm like, I want access to my people. I don't want someone else controlling it. I'm like, give me that option. I should be able to export that. Like let people opt in, opt out, but I should get it. So that's my problem. But I think some people should do it because some money is better than no money. And there will be people who will say, oh, I'll pay $50 for this or $100 for that or $20 for this little course or that to support my favorite creator. And then you're getting some money instead of no money. And then you can still sell your own course on your own platform. So that's the courses thing. The podcast thing I think is great for live streamers. I think the podcast thing. But what I'm waiting for is the RSS feeds for podcasts that are coming. So that's going to be like really interesting is the RSS feeds we get for podcasts because depending on how YouTube does it, they might eliminate the cost of hosting your podcast on another platform and still let you distribute it to other platforms besides YouTube Music or Google Podcast. Now, I don't know for sure that it's going to work out that way. I can't guarantee that the RSS feeds for YouTube is going to work out that way. I can't guarantee that they won't put some other limitation on it. However, here's the one downside. You're centralizing to YouTube again, and you have to trust them completely and go all in on them. Now, if you have some experience or some things that make you have a bad taste in your mouth about that, maybe if you're on the censorship side of the house or something like that, you might feel some kind of way. So, and I can understand and respect you feeling some kind of way. So it's in YouTube's interest for you to centralize your content, podcast, courses, shorts, videos, live streams. YouTube offers it all, all inclusive, all in one platform. That's centralization. Centralization is power. And guess what? It's not your power. (laughs) So it's convenient. It's convenient. But what I would do, even though it's more effort, is I would duplicate my content elsewhere and I would try to decentralize. I would take advantage of what YouTube offers, but I would decentralize my content 
and I would put it in other platforms. It doesn't matter if they do as well or not. And I wouldn't worry about cannibalizing or, oh, I'm robbing myself of YouTube views or this or that. I would stop worrying about that. I would kill my ego dead. I would sit there and I'd snap my ego's neck and call it a day because your ego is just going to get you into problems. Because if you keep worrying about centralizing your views, centralizing your subscribers, you're making yourself vulnerable and you're giving up all of your power and all of your leverage to do it. I'm not saying not to monetize on YouTube or not to focus on YouTube or prioritize YouTuber, but I'm saying that you should have an off-platform monetization strategy. You should have an off-platform content strategy, and you should be looking at diversifying, decentralizing, and distributing your content. You should be on every platform that can and will monetize you and offer you money. Then you should still have your own platform on top of that. And then you should also have multiple payment processors. And this is wildly inconvenient a lot to track, a lot to keep up with, and it is still your best option in the world to not put all your eggs in one basket, no matter how attractive they make the basket. And so that, I mean, I don't know what else to say to y'all about like about that. You know, I know I know that one's rough, and I know especially as a small YouTuber, that might sound too much effort or intimidating. And maybe when you're just starting out, it doesn't matter. Once you cross 10,000 subscribers, you should really be thinking like that. You should really be thinking a lot more about um, if you want to be a full-time content creator or you become a full-time content creator, oh man, do you need to diversify your revenue streams? And oh man, do you need to be thinking about what I said about off-platform revenue, platform that YouTube or Twitch or TikTok doesn't control or gatekeep or that you don't rely on them entirely for? And they're just a damn traffic source for you. And you should have as many traffic sources as you can muster. And at some point, you want to control your own traffic one way or another. And so that's why you want to have off-platform income and on-platform income. And you want to have strategies for, um, you know, essentially, you want to have multiple traffic sources that you can ultimately control and you want to have a platform that you have more control of and that you own at some point in terms of website and you want income where you can sell things. And I know for a lot of you, you're like, oh, I just want to be a YouTuber and everything like that. But like, it's just in a sense, getting employer like, like giving up power to something that's almost like an employer in that situation with none of the upsides or protections. And the trade-off is some theoretical work-life balance because you don't have to clock in somewhere and you don't have to commute. And I'm telling you, um, it can become a problem if you don't think this through. And if at some point you don't build out a different strategy. Um, so I just want you to be very thoughtful about this long term, long term. Uh, what's my take on true crime channels? Uh I like them, but I think that they're often very vulnerable to demonetization. I think you can be very clever with true time, true, true crime channels. But I think true crime channels are vulnerable sometimes to demonetization, and they can be vulnerable to copyright claims. So just be careful. Yeah, thank you, Roberto. This is very helpful. I didn't think about putting all my eggs in one basket. Um, yeah, it would be a good idea. Yeah, I'm saying use the features that YouTube gives you. Use all of it. But then for every feature that YouTube gives you, say, I need an alternative to this feature in terms of another platform that I can mirror the same content to. And then I need to think about how I can use this same feature but have a version of it that I'm in complete 100% control of, even if I have to pay for it. And... That's why I have things like, again, for courses, I use Kajabi. I have my own email list with ConvertKit. Um, I decided to publish my own book. I have my own digital products. I have my own website. I own my own domain names. Um, I have things that I can control. I have my own newsletter. I have things that I can control outside of YouTube. I have relationships with sponsors, not just for my YouTube content. But again, I told I go and I will work their events. I will work their booth. So I partner with brands to work their booth and I partner with brands to make content on their channel and not just on my channel. That's another thing I teach you in the Brand Deals Workshop. In the Brand Deals Workshop, I'm gonna teach you about making content on their channel instead of on your channel and getting the same money or more or more. And then when you make content on their channel, it's not tied to how many views you can get. 
So like, that's another thing. So there's another way to make money that's not using the platform per se um, as anything more than a portfolio and a traffic source and using it more for marketing purposes and monetizing along the way. And you monetize along the way and then you just, you know, move these things over and you take them out of YouTube's basket and put them in your own basket, you know, and you can spread yourself around to the other platforms too. So like, yeah. Uh, Roberto, how did you get so wise? I agree with you hundred uh, percent. Trial and error, trial and error. And I've made 1,600 videos on this channel, 2,000 videos on YouTube, 2,000 live streams across all platforms. Been doing this for 10 years. And then before that, I had a background in web hosting, marketing, worked at an ad agency, did graphic and web design, did coding, uh, did search engine optimization, video production, photography. So I've been in the industry. I was in the industry for 10 years. And then I did this for 10 years. And I'm 38, turning 39. So age Age and experience grants wisdom, I guess. Age and age and experience grants wisdom. Yep, wisdom comes from experience, but also time, the passage of time, and the value of experience. What website building do you suggest for building online courses and selling products? Need to work on a website. So, Candy Apple TV, linked in the description below. I have a affiliate link to Kajabi. That's what I use. And that's what Awesome Creator Academy is built on. And that's uh, what we use. And we've been using that since 2017. The end of 2017, I should say. Josh Fluke, massive content creator. Love you. Um, so Josh asked, uh, Josh makes some really good content. You guys should definitely watch him. Um, big fan. Um, so tips on getting sponsored from brands that don't directly relate to your brand. For example, if I want to reach out to Sony or Canon, thanks. Okay. So Josh, I don't know about Sony or Canon for you for the type of content you make specifically, but I do think that you could work with brands that are direct to consumer brands that are for the everyday person, or you could work with brands that help people in their career development. So I think you'd be able to get brands like that because I don't think your um, average viewer is necessarily a, a Sony or Canon person, unless it was like Sony headphones, maybe. Let's say, for example, um, Sony headphones. But if you were going to work with Sony or Canon on camera stuff, the way you'd have to pitch them is you'd have to pitch them on a vision for a video. And it'd have to be a video that I think affects um, remote workers because remote workers need um, a setup for live streaming. Primary example is this camera, Josh. This camera actually right here from Sony is like a $600 camera. This camera angle, this is my um, second angle, $600 camera, right? So if you were to work with Sony around like one of these vlogging cameras that focuses on a, as a webcam, let's say, right? That would be how you would pitch them. You'd have to do something that focuses around remote workers and about being set up to work from home or something like that. And then have to be around like this particular product. So I would say you have to focus on the solution that a product provides and tie it to a person maybe in your niche that is adjacent. Because I think if you bring on, um, you know, like you, you've talked with recruiters sometimes, you do some really great content uh, for people around career development in a way. A lot of your stuff is, um, you know, dunking on the bad practices of companies, but you also do a lot of great work as far as HR and things like that. So for you, your content, it would be that you pitch them on the vision of a specific video or a specific series, and then you have to have this tie-in. And I think for you, what makes sense is the remote work conversation because Sony's uh, ZV-1F is like the perfect camera for the highest quality um, content for like virtual meetings and things like that. Uh, cause again, look at, I mean, look at this quality. This is like superb quality, right? So 500, there are 500 and 600 and something dollars Sony cameras that might be ideal for people that are a little bit on the higher end of their career that do remote work that want really good camera quality. Um, Sony also sells microphones so that, you know, it'd be a pitch probably on a, uh, workstation, probably be a pitch on like, um, you know, building out your remote workstation, that kind of thing. Um, 
So Chad, in the brand deals workshop, we go a little bit, we go more into how to price in general across the thing. I can answer specific questions about people's niches in the Q and A part of it. So that's something that I offer. And that's part of why we do the Q and A. <clears throat> Josh, consider starting um, a second channel around camera gear, I think. Yeah, the second channel thing, I think that that would work for you better. Yep. Yeah, so I think like, um, sounds like, so honestly my passion is camera and film, but I make no content about it. What if I worked on my second channel where it talks about that stuff, uh, Potato Jet, Gerald and Dove style. Perfect, that's perfect. Build out that second channel, and I think that that would – and here's the other good news. On the second channel, you'll also have different ad rates, different ads, different audience, everything and everything like that. So it's a better fit. It's just a better fit. And you already have the knowledge to build a successful YouTube channel. So building the second channel won't even be very hard for you to scale as long as it's consistent enough. And that lets you have a really good outlet for your passion, and it still makes money. Would there be any advantage in pitching them before my smaller channel is monetized? All right, so I wouldn't pitch them before your channel is monetized. What I would do is I would start to incorporate them and shout them out and tag them. And I would try not to pitch them, but I would build the relationship before the second channel grows. I would I would use your status as a bigger YouTuber just to build a relationship and just to be you know, very tuned in and dialed into them, let's say. And so then I would think that that uh, makes sense. So yeah, great question. Um, and Josh, if you're on Twitter, Josh, if you're on Twitter, you can always DM me and you can ask me some stuff. Yeah. So yeah, if you're on Twitter, my handle is at Roberto Blake over on Twitter. Uh, what about cooking channels? Have you worked with any? Actually, I have. Um, I have, but I worked. I've worked with more fitness channels than cooking channels. The overlap on that sometimes is actually pretty interesting in terms of who watches those. But I've actually worked with a couple of cooking channels. Um, I have a friend who did a cooking channel that focused on sweets. Her biggest um, deal, though, was um, she ended up making content for another brand. Um, and they hired her for her cinematography and her personality, but also her editing style. And she made content for that other brand, not as like... I wouldn't call it a sponsorship, but you could call it a brand deal or sponsorship. But she did a partnership with a brand where she made content on their channel for them. And they were attracted by her channel, even though she wasn't the biggest channel or getting the most views. And then she made viral videos for them. But it was viral, I think, because they already had a big audience. But she made it for another brand's channel. And they paid her a six-figure salary. So she got to maintain her channel. I think she has a silver play by now. But she got to maintain her channel and make a six figure salary working for a brand because she made content for them. The path to sometimes to a six figure brand relationship is largely to make content for um, their channel instead of just making content about them on yours. So if you make content on the brand's channel, that might be worth something to them. And for some people they can get six figure um, contracts. They get six figure contracts to work for the brand on content that they can use across multiple platforms. So it gives them a high level of deliverables. So the deliverables on that get to be higher and build instead of just on your channel. Because like your channel, there's only so much you can do before you alienate the viewers, right? So there's a limited number of videos that you can make shouting out the brand. But on their own channel, that number is, and across their platforms, that number is not as limited. It's just your capacity to contribute. So when they hire people to do that, the number gets really astronomical in terms of what you can earn. I won't name the company, but I got a $40,000 brand deal. I got a $40,000 brand deal to make a six video series for a company. So a company wanted some shout outs on social media, six videos for their main YouTube channel, and then some content for their other platforms. And so for like, for those amount of deliverables, I think it ended up being less than 20 deliverables, but it was six like main YouTube videos. It was like six main YouTube videos for their channel. 
I did something for them on my channel, but not even that many deliverables. And then some social media deliverables and then some things that they could use plus licensing to my likeness and face for six months. And for those six videos and the licensing, it was like 40 something thousand. It was 40 something thousand, right? This is in this is a couple of years ago. So again, I won't name the brand. This is a couple of years ago. Um, now I want you to imagine a scenario where what if I had done like 12 videos, 20 videos for them that year, plus like a bunch of like short form and licensed them my likeness for a year, like for a year. That's the beginning of structuring like a six figure brand deal. But I had the status, mind you, and the relationship and the reputation to accomplish that. Now, my friend, she that got a six figure salary working at another company, YouTube channel, making some content for them. She was making um, batch recording and making content for them to be able to post like once or twice a week with her content because they were making that company was putting out across multiple platforms. They were putting out like 50 videos a week. She was only making two videos a week for them, but she was making six figures doing that. She was making six figures doing that. So it just depends on the company, depends on the niche. And again, she didn't need the reputation I had to do that deal. She had 50,000 subscribers. She had 50,000 subscribers and did that deal. Um, and wasn't even getting a ton, a ton of views. and wasn't the biggest channel in her niche either. And that was a cooking niche, by the way. That was a cooking niche, by the way. Uh, she was doing desserts though. She was doing desserts. So um, with a situation like that, uh, a lot of people do not realize what is out there for them because they're looking at a very narrow lane of how they've seen YouTubers talk about doing things. This is why I do these deep live streams. Um, so there's, so there's just different opportunities depending on what you do. So Josh says, um, thanks Roberta, for the decade answers. By the way, this is mega value add. I will reach out. And he says, my girl and I need to figure out how to do this for the DIY niche paid by brands to do stuff. All she wants to do is get paid to build stuff with cool tools. There is so much that can be done with the DIY niche. It's actually pretty crazy. There's a lot that can be done with that. Um, and I've worked with a couple of DIY and crafting channels. I've worked with some DIY uh, craft channels. I've worked with some DIY sewing channels. Uh, there's a lot that can be done in that niche um, when done strategically in alignment with <clears throat> specific brands. So a big part of it is targeting brands, by the way. Big part of it is a lot of you, you need to make a spreadsheet of the brands you want to work with. If you make a spreadsheet, this is one of the things I teach in my workshop is to make a spreadsheet of the brands you want to work with. Then in that spreadsheet, start filling out social media handles for those brands. You want to follow them with notifications on and stuff like that. You want to have, we, we give you a system for how to outreach to them and how to find people. So you want to do those kind of things. And then you want to build the relationship before you even ask for anything. And you want to be on their radar and you want them watching you. And this is a big deal. And like a lot of people don't realize this is how these deals happen is this the relationship building and it's the outreach and it's seeding the relationship and warming people up. It's like there's an entire elaborate way that people approach this that works versus just shooting in the dark. And when you build the relationships much more organically, you can build an organic, sincere relationship, but still be strategic from day one. It's about being thoughtful. It's about being thoughtful. And that's like the big deal that a lot of people do not recognize because they're not considering that it is a marketing manager like I used to be. I used to be a marketing manager. So I used to work at a company. This is before influencer marketing though. But I used to have to deal with this stuff as a marketing manager. And now imagine that someone who used to work my job now got all this influencer marketing dumped on their plate and they didn't get a pay raise for it, by the way. They didn't get a pay raise at all for it. So now they have all of this going on and- they have all this stuff to figure out. They have to learn it from scratch. Do you know what's one of the best things in the world and what's helped me with brand relationships? It's when I go out of my way to make that person's job easier for them. When I do everything and check every box to make that person's job easier, I'm going to get that six month or 12 month contract. I'm their guy forever. And then when they leave and they go to another company, I've had people that I built relationships with that have went and worked at three companies and brought me brand deals from every company they worked at bought me relationships at every company they worked at because I made their life easy. I made their life easier. And so undoubtedly that is like one of the most important things you could start to think of is how to empathize with that person's situation and then figure out what a little bit more about what their job is and how they work with creators. And then 
when you know that, you start to know what would appeal to these people, what would get their attention, what would make their life easier, and what makes you an attractive creator to them. Um, she fires actually worked with uh, she fires on something. Roberto, you saved me from committing to a sponsorship deal without a contract and without getting paid. I pushed back and I dodged a bullet. Uh, that is so good to hear a lot. Oh, yeah. Big thing I can tell all of you free game right here. Do not do a brand deal without a contract. Don't do it. Sounds like common sense. You would be shocked how many creators do a brand deal with no contract in place and no way to guarantee that they get paid. It is a it is a really bad situation. It's hard enough sometimes to get paid when you do have a contract. And so you have to actually make sure these contracts is in place and that the contracts are good. And so and just having one in general. The other thing is do not confuse affiliate relationships with brand deals. That screws over a lot of creators too. So it's really important. <clears throat> So Josh says, how should I know what to charge for a 30 to 60 second sponsorship? I really wonder if I don't charge enough. I've only done two recently. From what I hear, similar creators get paid way more somehow. Okay, don't charge for views. Number one, don't charge for views. You get good, you get great views. Do not charge for views. So that's number one. Number two, do not be the first one to offer a number unless, unless what you've done is you built out a media kit and you've already decided on a package and an amount that is the minimum amount to work with you, right? So when you do deals and you have a media kit and you have a price range or you have a, price, a rating card, what you do is every time you have a dollar amount, it should say starting at, starting at, because that number is going to change depending on the negotiables in the contract. Some of those negotiables are exclusivity. How long? Do I have to go without working with your competitors and how many competitors and who are they specifically? Usually it's 30 days of exclusivity. If they want 60 or 90 days, the amount has to go up. And so you can start moving a scale and increasing the price based on exclusivity alone of not working with who they identify as competitors. So that becomes number one. Number two, licensing. You own the content, but you can grant a license for them to use the content and a license to use your likeness and any testimonials and some of your footage. Now, how long that license lasts for changes the dollar amount and changes the budget now. So that moves it up. So it's very important for those things to be the starting at prices too. And then the other thing is payment terms. You can take less money if they pay you half up front. You can take less money if they pay you on net 15, meaning 15 days after publish, you can take less money. Um, you want more money if it's net 30, if they're taking longer, but that's less money than, or sorry, that's, you would get paid more than net 15, but less money than net 60, right? If their contract is, oh, we pay 60 days later, you should charge more if they're going to pay you later. If they're going to take longer to pay you, the dollar amount goes up. The less time they take to pay you, the less money they have to pay. But the more time they take to pay you, the more money they should pay if they're taking longer because you don't have cash flow while that's happening and while you're waiting on the money that you're owed. And it's a security risk to you. It's a security risk to you. So if they pay faster, they get a discount. The sooner they pay you, the less they pay you. Okay. If they pay you more, if they pay you up front, you can give them a discount for paying all up front. You can give them a discount for paying 50% up front. And you can give them a discount for paying a third up front. Because what it does is it guarantees you your money and it reduces your risk. So these are other things that affect like not charging enough also comes down to not structuring the deals based on the variables that can change in the contract. So the variables that have to be negotiated in the contract take prices up and down depending on what is allowed. And then there's things like the deliverables. Then there's also things that if they decide to go recurring, like long-term commitment, hey, commit to me and pay me monthly on a schedule for these deliverables spread out throughout the year. That's worth giving people a discount for guaranteed income for three months, six months, 12 months. So then that's um, another thing that changes the structure of the deals. Um, and then there's also the negotiating style. The person who puts out a number first often is the person who gets the worst part of the deal. So it's about also the framing and getting them to tell you the budget sometimes. So 
there's ways to navigate this. This is something that I work with creators around because once you know this, you just start making more money uh, indefinitely once someone can help you figure this out because it's also unique often to the niche, the creator, and to the brands that are in their buckets of brands. So in the brands that you want to work with, and this is why I do it. I work with creators one-on-one -on, -one on this. I do workshops on this. It's something that when they go take me to speaking engagements, I talk to creators on stage about this because it gets very specific and complicated depending on what your situation is, what level you are in your creator career, but also what level the brands are playing at, who their customer is, what their product cost, their business model, whether it's a one-time sale, whether it's a subscription SaaS product, whether it's um, targeting a specific demographic, younger people, oh, that's rough. People who are in their middle years, let's say the 30 plus crowd, oh, that's a really good sweet spot for brands and that the money goes up. Under 30, money goes down. Over 30, money goes up. Um, so that makes a difference. And so in terms of like, it's it's one of those things instead of knowing what you should charge, you have to decide on what you charge, why you charge that, and how you capture it. So instead of decide, instead of like knowing what to charge, it's more important to know, to decide that this is what I charge, how I charge, and why I charge, and then build your brand and the case for your brand and build your media kit and your rate card and your negotiating structure around, this is what I want. This is why I merited that. And this is how that's going to be delivered. And so that becomes a much more important thing to do. And in terms of, well, how much should that be or what's appropriate, that also comes down to analyzing your internal business, how much time you're putting in to making every video. Are you building a team? What are your risks? What's the liability? What's the turnaround? What's the commitment? What's your reputation worth? What's the risk to you in terms of reputational damage if the brand deal goes sideways? What's the kill fee structure uh, for just wasting your time. Like there's, so there's a lot that, oh, what's the cost um, of n having not worked with this person before and not having the relationship and the trust yet? What's the, what's the risk to my audience? What's the value to my audience? So like this is um, incredibly, incredibly complicated for most creators to figure out on their own, even if they talk to their friends about it because it's the, it's the fact that you have to almost take an agency and ad agency style point of view to working with these brands because that's also their alternative, by the way. The alternative to a brand of working with a creator is working with an ad agency. So um, that's kind of like um, the perspective. Let's see. Uh, we got a super chat here. Um, how to vids. Is it worth it to do a how to channel? Is it not niche enough? I also had to delete all the videos on channel. Been two weeks, no videos. Can the channel be revived? Uh, so one of the members of Awesome Creator Academy um, had to stop doing his channel for a year because of a government regulation in Canada. So there was a government regulation in Canada that stopped a content creator I know that um, is a member of Awesome Creator Academy from uploading to YouTube for a year. And after six months of not uploading and using the community tab, YouTube uh, demonetizes your channel. He started up again earlier this year, full steam ahead. He has a different business, so he's out of that. So there's no regulatory issues or overlight or concern. Um, and he's crushing it. And he started up again. He reapplied for monetization once he started again, got it within a week, back up and running, started getting views again at a same or higher level, started getting subscribers again or a same or higher level after taking one year off from his channel. And so that's one guy. I know another guy, he started a gaming channel with his son five years ago and let the channel go away and die. Um, he made the different content on that gaming channel. Um, and instead of his son, his son got bored with it. He does it solo now. He does uh, the Marvel Snap game. And it was a dead channel. It had like no subs. In six months, he grew it to about 8,000 8, subscribers, 8,000 subscribers, and he makes between six and $800 a month on that channel with uh, with those subscribers. And he just uploads and he crushes it. And so uh, he's just really excited about the channel. It's also a second channel for him. He's done this before. 
uh, in a different niche. So you can revive a channel. I've seen a channel that's been dead for five years, come back from the dead, do a different video game and win. So I saw that. And I saw a channel that went away for a year recently um, during the pandemic, go away for a year, come back the beginning of this year after the pandemic and start growing again at the same rate as taking off a year. So I think that the channel can be revived. As for a how-to channel, it'll grow slowly because it revolves largely around search. It depends on the topics you cover. Right now, if I was doing a how-to channel, DaVinci Resolve would be one of my go-tos and ChatGPT would be one of my go-tos because the search volume for DaVinci Resolve or anything AI-related, DaVinci Resolve has all these new AI tools and it's a video editor and content creations on the rise. So like video editing how-to channels are all going to the moon right now. So that's going to be a big deal. Camera channels, camera gear, camera channels going to the moon right now because of content creation. So there is a how-to niche. It just depends on what you're covering. The big thing with a how-to niche is the niche that you're going to is not the topic. That's the thing that people get wrong. The niche that you're going to isn't even the topic. It's who the group of people that care about this are. It's the community. So then you should substitute the word niche from what is my niche to who is my community. If you go from what is my niche to who is my community, it'll remove all the cobwebs, all the barriers, all the blockage. It'll make it easier to be consistent. A niche is not a prison. A niche is not a prison. I should make a video about that. And maybe actually that's a good book title. A niche is not a prison. It's going to be, it'd be a very narrow book, but a niche is not a prison. But the reason people think a niche is a prison because they think that they're locked into one topic instead of realizing that they get to serve one community. Instead of saying, oh, I only get to cover this one topic. If you said, I get to, I am a, I get to serve this one community that I really care about, then you realize a niche is not a prison. And you won't feel trapped. You'll feel embraced because you'll be like, I really care about this community. It's not a problem to exclusively serve the community that I care about the most. So a niche is not a prison. So um, the, like, so in terms of how to, you should think about what's my community and how do these how to videos better the lives of the people in my community? And then that will inform your decisions about your content and your strategy. Brody says, um, definitely have your media kits ready. Yep. Yep. It, it's a big deal. Big deal. Um, let's see. Josh says, I have a manager, I guess, and they do a deal and they take their percentage. Usually it's about 20% and that's about it. Right now, it's every 45 days. Seems pretty long. I will ask for more if it's this long. Yep. That's a big deal. Ask for more if it's long. Usually, I've rarely seen 45. Net 30 Net 60, net 15 is usually industry standard. Industry standard is net 15, net 30 is the most common, and then net 60 in some cases, especially for bigger companies, it's net 60 sometimes. But a lot of times, if you have had any clients do net 15, when you tell another client that, well, my previous client did net 15, a lot of them will budge on that and they can help you out. Um, and if they get less, if they and if it's less money, if they say, hey, I'll give, I give a discount to all my clients who do net 15 payments or, hey, I give a discount to all of my clients who do a percentage up front, that usually is a conversation that gets the ball going. Josh says, hearing you speak makes me feel much more like a student. Thank you for the humbling advice. No, dude, everybody's still a student. I'm a forever student. I'm learning new things every day. And the um, generative content is going to change everything about these platforms. Podcasting, I'm going to have to learn everything about USS, um, about YouTube's RSS feeds. I'm going to have to learn all of it. I spend hours upon hours just studying all day um, content. I put in my AirPods. And I study, I also have this cool tool called Speechify. I have this thing called Speechify and it turns all the written content into audio content and I can listen to it. And so all day I have Speechify read me white papers all day, read me long form content all day. I listen to audiobooks all day and then I listen to podcasts from people much smarter than me all day. And I do that. Then I spend a lot of time on advisory boards and I just listen to people who are infinitely smarter and are a lot wealthier and experienced than me, usually 10 years older than me. So what I do is I listen to people 10 years older than me constantly. 
um, in these situations. And I go to conferences and even, and what I do at conferences is because I'm usually a speaker, so I get to go for free, but I also get the replays of all the content. So then I download all the replays. I listen to the audio later. So while I'm at the conference, all I do is find people usually five to 10 years older than me and I get them to talk to me one-on-one -on -one or in a group, or I will get a brand to buy me lunch and then take a couple other people to lunch and a brand at the conference will take me to lunch or someone from a company or an app will take me to lunch and I'll let them pitch me a little bit, but then we'll talk about other things. And then I just get to listen to people older than me over lunch for free, break everything down and tell me a lot of different things that I wouldn't even know. And then I'm getting this additional free education and I'm maximizing myself at the conferences by spending a little bit of time in the sessions, but mostly spending time one-on-one -on -one with people to get information that's much more specific to me or what I care about than what everyone else is getting in general. Cause everyone else that gets the presentation, I'm going to get the replay. I'm going to be able to listen to it on the flight back. So I get to listen to the replay of, of stuff. Like if it, if it comes out that quickly, cause sometimes it comes out that quickly. It doesn't always come out that quickly. If I don't listen to it on the flight back, when I get back, it's available by the time I'm at another conference, I can listen to it on that flight. So I can go listen to the previous conference on the next conference's flight. Um, a month later, and I can just absorb everything then. In the meantime, while I'm face to face with people, I can listen to people or I can sit in on groups or I can sit in on lunches and I can just get these people there 10, 15 years older than me to, to reveal all kinds of detailed, elaborate things that aren't for public consumption that I get to absorb. And um, so when I do that at events, plus then I spend all day listening to stuff, it makes it easier for me to aggregate more information than is reasonable for everybody else um, to probably do in any reasonable amount of time. And then what I do is I brain dump all of it. And now I can use chat GPT when I brain dump stuff, I can brain dump everything into my notes. Then I can take my notes. I take that into chat GPT. Then I tell it to organize the notes for me and then to highlight key takeaways and then spit it back to me. And so um, I've been doing a lot of that. Um, let's see. Trinidad Verde 93 says asking what their budget is, is a fantastic way to go about it. I learned that in the job market and you can usually get pay closer to what you're looking for or more explaining your brand is powerful. Yep. hundred percent. Um, I'm going to have to go here in a minute, uh, or at least get some water. Um, let's see. Hi, Roberta. I've been on YouTube for three years. I have almost 40 K subs. Congratulations. That's actually pretty good. Publishing almost three times per week. Do you consider that a good pace or, um, or should I double down? I think three times a week is really good. I think what you should do is you should look at your most successful videos of all time. I think you should look at your most successful videos of all time. Then I should think you should figure out how to make a five video series. It doesn't have to be in order. It doesn't have to be in order for each of the videos for each of the I think that for each of the top 10 videos that are the most successful in your channel of all time you should make five pieces of content based around the topic that was the most successful out of like the 10 most successful topics you've ever done. That's 50 videos out of the 150 videos a year you're going to make that are based on the, what your audience responded to the most. That has the most potential of doubling your growth rate, if not tripling your growth rate. And so I think if you did that, and then that became over the next, let's say two years, I think if you did that over the next two years, that you're at 100,000 subscribers two years from now if you do that. So I think, I think that that's what would probably be the most successful for you. Um, could I explain the retention graph in YouTube a bit and how to improve on it? I can do that. And we can also look at the retention graph. Um, and what I will do is I will find a video for you. I will find a video for you where it makes sense to... <clears throat> To, um, to bring up the retention graph. In fact, um, here's what I'm going to do. Guys, I'm going to play um, the trailer for my book. I'm going to play the trailer for my book while I take a quick break so that I can um, get something to drink here before my voice dies. So we're going to watch the trailer for my book, and then I'll be back to answer that question.
I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October 2022. Oh my God, it's so great to be able to have this book done put it up on the bookshelf and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator, and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like, uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create something awesome today. Take care. All right, hopefully that wasn't too long. That shouldn't have been too long there, Ugh, but that's a lot better. But yeah, can I explain retention? Let's find a video for me to, actually I have a good one here, I think, because um, this one is from this year and it has 70,000 views. So that's a strong video. Let's take a look at that. Let me bring it up here on screen, share this tab. Uh, it should be coming up here. <clears throat> okay, so here's a video that we can look at the data from. Um, we'll only go for another like 10, 15 minutes here. Um, so let's look at the data from this video. Um, Okay, so this video is from January. This did 70,000 views, ton of watch time. This got me uh, 1,400 subscribers on one video and about 800 bucks. So um, the thing is, if I was able to do, um, in addition to all the other content, if I could replicate a video like this um, on average 10 to 12 times a year, by itself, it would be like very good for the overall channel's health. And then if I could find another topic um, to do something and I did like 10 videos like that. So basically, if I could do 100 videos a year, let's say, if I do 50 to 100 videos a year that do this well, then that's all I would need to do basically, right? But that's very hard to do even when you analyze the data. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, sometimes people just don't respond to certain things and it's very hard sometimes to know what they will respond to. If we look at engagement, <clears throat> The average view duration on this was six minutes. The overall percentage viewed of it was 32 minutes. Okay. Um, and so if we look at the overall um, graph in retention, you know, you could argue it's like, oh, that's not great. It gets kind of flat there. It ramps down. But it's not great. Generally, the problem is that you, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, a lot of times you will lose people very early on. Now, this video is highly polished, highly edited, green screen and all the trimmings. And it's still like um, two minutes in law, like, you know, I'm down to 50% of the audience two minutes in. But this is like literally a video with massive green screen and everything. So you can edit all you want. It doesn't always work. The main thing is like the hook of the video. Like it doesn't always work. Um, 
but it's also a 19 minute video. So grain of salt, grain of salt here. It's a 19 minute video. Um, <clears throat> so that's a whole thing. Now, if we click on see more, we get into a deeper part of the overall retention graph. And so um, we get to look at um, a stat here called, and I have to hide your question to um, show this. So we can look at the general overall audience retention. And the thing is, when I look at this on the longer graph, it's actually more flat than we think, which is actually a good thing. It's actually more flat than we think. And 30% on a near 20 minute video is actually really relatively good. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and we're going to go to this chart that says compare to other videos. So the thing is, what it does is this compares specifically to videos that are the same or of a similar length, all videos of a similar length. And it tells you how your, your video measures up to videos of a similar length with the retention, which is very different. Now, notice all of a sudden how this graph changes to where I'm actually a videos of my length, even though I lost people in the first 30 seconds, you'd think I was doing so horrible. But when you look at compared to other videos of a similar length, I actually am above average in the beginning. Then I go to average and then I start to pick back up again and I do about as well as anything else. And then I'm above average in terms of where the end of the video is 18 minutes in, I have a larger audience than mo at the end of the video than most other videos of a comparable length of the video. So it's important to look at this data and not just the overall data, but then to know compared to other videos of your length, how are you doing? Because it's misleading and you might think you're doing something horribly wrong. And so then here in detailed activity, in detailed activity, audience retention shows how different moments of your video held viewers' attention. It's a percentage total. Detailed activity shows you, detailed activity shows you the moment by more organic traffic in your video, how many times it was, it was seen and when the viewers stop or start watching. So it's very hard to know in theory. I think I understand what these numbers represent. So what I believe these numbers represent is out of the 70,000 views, out of the 70,000 views this video even has, it tells me when people started or stopped watching. And so that means by the end of this video, on average, like there was, um, there's like, 14,000 people who watched this video to the very end out of all the people who watched this video. This is how many people watched it to the very end. This is how many people were still watching it 10 minutes in. And so those numbers are actually very helpful, um, you know, for me to be able to think about. Um, and again, here's where people start watching. Here's difference, the difference in the number of people who stopped watching. The start watching thing might have to do with people who click through to timestamps, by the way. So keep that in mind as well. So when you analyze this data and you analyze it this granularly, it gives you a much better perception. And the thing is, if people stop, if, if hundreds of people start watching at a certain point, I can start to think about, well, what in the video at that point would have turned them off, let's say, or what was on screen or not on screen. So when I look at these, this is very telling. Now, in a 19-minute video, that's a lot to take in, to analyze, and to think about. It'll be probably um, – it helps me with perspective. It might help more of you psychologically or in content decisions on videos that are less than 10 minutes. So um, in terms of actionable steps, because Gabe has a great question, what are the actionable steps um, – you might personally take from analyzing the retention and the relative retention. Well, first of all, when I look at the overall retention at a glance, at a glance, knowing the overall audience retention, I can immediately start to analyze the quality of my hooks in the beginning of the video and the editing at the very beginning of my video and start to think about how to reduce these drop-off rates and what's most important to people. So I can do that. Um, and then if I compare it to other videos, this is perspective to say, hey, I'm actually doing better than I think I am if I look at it compared to other videos. And so maybe I'm not doing something wrong and maybe I don't need to second guess myself as aggressively before so that I can use that. 
And then seeing the raw numbers in the detailed view and knowing how many people dropped off and where they started and stopped watching. Um, this is a way to put into perspective, okay, literally this is how many people are still watching at this point in the video. I still have them at this point in the video. That is incredibly powerful on perspective, but also saying, okay, that's real human beings that are still acting in this way. They're still acting in this way. So having that data, that can be game changing because it can completely just shift your mentality on how you're perceiving the response to your video or the rejection or whatever. You can start to just kind of perceive it differently when you have the raw number of humans and you're saying, because then saying, oh, wow, I still am in five digits of people who watched my video to the very, very end, to the last second of my video. I still had five digits worth of people watching. That's actually very helpful in terms of just having some real perspective. And in my case, when I see that number, I'm like, okay, right up until the end of my video, like almost 20% of the entire potential of the audience watched until the very end. And hey, if I like lost 50% of the audience, like a couple minutes into the video, then this is what the real audience is for this topic. This is the real audience for this topic. Like after the first like 90 seconds, this is like the real audience for this topic. So that means that even out of the real audience, I still had almost half of the real audience watching the video, like 16, 18 minutes into a 20 minute video. That is like really helpful to like think about. That's really helpful. So that's just different. And it hits different when you start to have that perspective. And so now you're not going to overthink and you're not going to overcorrect. Because what happens is even me, even me, without detailed information, it is possible to overcorrect based on that first like 30 seconds number bothering the hell out of you. So you can overcorrect easily. Let's see, time to put up this. Let's see, uh-huh. McKissiano, I think I said that right. I want to thank you, Roberto. You are literally the reason I'm making a living from my creativity, filmmaking, editing. You shifted my entire mindset. Um, you shifted my entire mindset from working hours based to project work based to working project based. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, that's a very important. Thank you for that. Appreciate you. Let's see. Oh yeah. I have a strategy for listening at scale. And um, like I said, it's, it's a, it's like being able to put yourself in a room with people much smarter than you is priceless. Being able to shut up and listen to them is an acquired skill, even for me. And then also being able to take advantage of all the contents in there, but put it in a practical way where you can either work while you're doing it, work out, get on the treadmill, go for a walk, listen to it in the car. Like I reduce the wasted hours uh, in my day by using audio. I use audio to eliminate the wasted hours in my day. Now, do I ever consume any pure entertainment? Absolutely, when I'm going to bed. When I'm going to bed is when I like I consume entertainment is like when I'm going to bed um, and I'll consume entertainment if I'm like a passenger in a vehicle. Or like, you know, <clears throat> like for my brother's birthday, we're going to like all go to a movie. So like that's again, I'll consume entertainment during that time. So. Um, I actually interviewed uh, a YouTube employee about the um, auto dubbing, the localization, the podcast features and all that stuff. I'm hoping that I will be dropping that interview later this week. Um, I do have to add a sponsored plug to the video. That's the only thing I have to really um, add in there. Um, so I have to add a, spon a sponsored plug to the first one third of the video. And then that video can drop, but that'll be out hopefully later this week, probably like 
probably out Thursday or Friday. Um, so um, look forward to that. But we talk a lot about that, and we talk about some of YouTube's new AI tools. Uh, I have plenty of videos on starting a YouTube channel. You should definitely watch them. Uh, they'll probably be more helpful than what I can give you just on the stream. Um, music production and animation illustration. I would, I would pick one of those things. I would pick one of those things. And if you want to incorporate animation and illustration into the music stuff, I would do it visually, but I wouldn't try to teach all three of those things on a channel. <clears throat> Yeah, finding the real audience for a particular topic. Yeah, I agree. That's like, so that's what I look for is I try to use that retention information to say, what was the real audience for that topic versus the casual window shopper for that topic? <clears throat> Uh, the found boat says had to step away, but your advice on charging more when a client pays net 60, net 90, net 20 is great advice. I, uh, when I had my construction company, I learned that the hard way. Yeah, this is a business practice that exists outside of YouTube, by the way. Um, I learned this working at an agency. So I worked at an ad agency and I learned all of this. And so this business practice um, and a lot of other business practices exist outside of YouTube content creation, but YouTube content creators don't have a lot of experience with these traditional business models outside of general employment and, you know, W2 employment work. So then they don't uh, know about these things. So, yeah. Uh, exactly. This is season of growth. Too many people got cut up in escapism. Yeah. Escapism and consumerism are actually two of the, the things harming people the most is their escapism is harming them because they're not doing enough to improve themselves and improve their life. And then their consumerism is hurting them because they could be spending money in the areas of their life that build a better foundation for their life. So there's things that are worth spending money on that improve your quality of life. I'm not saying you have to be a miser. See, a lot of people think when I talk about frugality, I'm talking about being a miser. I'm the guy who goes out and buys cameras. So I'm not talking about being a miser, but why do I buy cameras? One, they're a tax write-off for me. And then two, I use them to make money. And they still are fun for me to play with. And I use them for photography as a hobby too. So for me, I'm like, okay, I align things in my life. Can buying this thing be something I enjoy, but then is it also offer any utility? And does it also help me improve any skill that I have as a person? And so when I buy a purchase, if I buy a book, a book is enjoyable to read because now I can relax and I can rest my body and still exercise my mind by reading a book. The book might also improve my life for many reasons in reading itself will improve um, my overall cognitive ability, vocabulary, keep me sharp, keep me calm, force me to increase my attention span. So there's all kinds of mental health benefits, just sitting down and reading a book. It's cheap. And so it improves my life because it automatically improves my mental health and my cognitive function. Then whatever content the book has might improve me, even if it's like fiction. So there's value in that. So like, okay, that's a great purchase because um, I'm enjoying it. So there's passion, there's enjoyment, there's emotional investment there. And that's actually improving me and offers some utility. And it's relatively affordable because a book's not that expensive to buy. And it also gives me something to talk about with other people. So then it also has some social value. So now I'm like, okay, it has social value. It has utility. It betters me and I enjoy it. Those like four things are in balance. All of a sudden those four things are in balance and it makes sense at that point. Okay. Um, and learning that thing, even if that doesn't make me money, improving my cognitive function, my reading comprehension, my attention span, that makes me money. So I benefit. Gym membership. Gym membership offers some social ability to be around other humans. Potentially if you're uh, uh, you know, able to approach people than it does. It um, offers some social utility because you get to talk about it. It offers social utility because it improves your body and your physical appearance. So that improves your social status. So that's valuable. Then 
it's usually not that expensive to have a gym membership. It improves your body physically. So you're stronger, you're healthier, you're more resilient. You have more energy, more stamina, more focus. So it benefits you so many ways. So it has absolute utility. And then um, the passion will come from you'll enjoy. If you don't enjoy the experience of the gym, you'll enjoy the results and you'll be happy about that. So then there's, so you know what I'm saying? There's like all these ways where escapism and consumerism is hurting people when what they could do instead is they could look at balancing how they are spending time, money, energy, and focus, and they could be using it to work on self-improvement. But self-improvement doesn't mean, oh, I'm not having fun. And doing things that monetize yourself doesn't necessarily mean you're not having fun. But a lot of people are being monetized by their escapism, monetized by their consumerism and they're extracting minimum value from it compared to the value that they're putting in they're extracting minimal value in return and people don't think of it this way and so then they're they're struggling more i'm not saying you'll never struggle if you do with the things i'm talking about i struggle sometimes but like um you have to find this balance the other thing is spending time with other humans is free spending time with other humans is free and you can lower a lot of the pain threshold depression emotional all this by spending time around other humans um even if you're not in a relationship, having a very strong friend group, having people you see literally every week, that helps. A lot of people who work from home, best thing you can do if you work from home is you better have a good friend group. If, you don't, if you're not hanging out with your family, have a good friend group. Um, so do that. Have people you go to, go to events, go to business mixers, make yourself be sociable. Again, go to the gym membership, get a gym buddy, do whatever, right? So there's all these things that you could be doing. Um, to better yourself that are not escapism or consumerism. Escapism and consumerism are actually what's hurting people and you could be bettering yourself. Um, and for a lot of people, even in content creation, that's still true. Uh, how to compete in the cooking niche with all these incredible creators. Um, you have to find a lane to be in. If I were competing... And I was starting a cooking channel. If I was starting a cooking channel, one of the first things I do is I start upping my photography game if I and my videography game. If I want to compete in the cooking niche, I'm going to have better food photography and food videography than people, other people in the cooking niche. So what does that mean? I'm going to learn how to make cinematic videos um, for like intros to my stuff. And then if I'm doing a cooking show or something like that, I'm going to know how to stage my stuff. And for me, I'm just telling you what I would do. If I wanted to have a channel that was a cooking channel, let's say I want to have a 100,000 subscriber cooking channel. I know one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the photography. I'm going to go out, I'm going to buy a macro lens. I'm going to get a good camera and I'm going to master the art of cooking photos. I'm going to be posting and having an Instagram where I'm posting all these really great food shots. And I'm going to be growing that Instagram with these food shots. Then I'm going to learn how to make short form cinematics then I'm going to make a bunch of reels and YouTube shorts, and I'm going to learn how to make really good, very short, very cinematic videos around food. And I'm going to entice people with that. And then I'm going to learn how to make long form content where I have a really good intro that's cinematic. And then the cooking show, if I'm teaching people how to cook or I'm doing something else, that doesn't have to be purely cinematic. But what I will do at that point is then me, this is just me, I'm going to do multi-camera angles just like a cooking show on TV. I'm going to have three cameras, maybe four. I'm going to have maybe three to four cameras because what I'm going to do is I'm going to have close-up of the food, a wide shot of me, a close-up shot of me, and then a top-down sh shot of the food and my hands. And so I'm going to learn how to do four camera angles. That's a big investment. But you said, oh, I want to compete with the biggest cooking channels on YouTube. This is in my mind. My, com my, comp my way of competing is I make cinematic shorts. I make gorgeous food photos, cinematic shorts, and then I have great production and live streaming, whether it's live streaming or whether it's not live streaming, it's edited. And for the editing, I'm doing the multi-cam edit, four camera sources, close up on the food, wide angle of me with the food for the process, top down video of the food for the process, and a close up of me. Four cam I'm doing four camera angles, all on good cameras, all the same camera brand, all the same camera lenses, everything dialed in, perfect color and lighting. And I'm going to have um, lights that hit the background, lights that hit the food. I'm going to reduce shadows. I'm going to have an overhead light and I'm going to have a, a key light. So I'm probably going to have to have a 
um, cross lighting, six light setup, five to six light setup probably is probably what I'm going to have to have. And I'm going to have to run four cameras. So I'm probably going to have to have a videographer to help me. And I'm going to have to have one or two editors. And like, and again, I might have to build up to this. This may not be my day one strategy, but this is reverse engineering. Why would my channel have a million subscribers? My channel would have a million subscribers because if I have four camera angles, five to six lights, and I'm doing gorgeous food photography, and I'm doing cinematic short form, in my mind, it means that no beginner can compete with me. No beginner can compete with me. My content cannot be duplicated by a beginner. So now that eliminates 90% of the market of all other competitors. Now I only compete with 10% of competitors. Now that I only compete with 10% of competitors, now all I have to do is be different. Now all I have to do is be different. And different is style, structure, and storytelling. So now they don't have my story and my origin and my quirkiness and my personality. So I don't have that. Then I create a visual aesthetic. A visual aesthetic can be copied, but if I make it good enough, everyone will know that they're copying me and they'll call them out. So I have that. Then in terms of the structure, my format can be unique enough. And then if anyone copies that, everyone knows that it's mine and that that's my way of doing it. So now I have a, 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 now I have a cooking channel and a cooking show where people come to me for that. And my business model, I have so many things I can do with a business model. I could partner with a knife company. I can make all kinds of uh, pans and pots and kitchen utensils, um, cutting boards, bibs, all kinds of things. So I, a great business model. Cookbooks, obviously. Cookbooks, obviously. So I have all these things. So again, there's an investment to doing that. There is an investment to doing that. As the guy who literally owns like nine full-frame cameras or something like that. No, I think it's seven full-frame cameras. I think it's seven full-frame cameras and 10 Sony cameras. Some absurd amount of cameras. As the guy who owns some absurd amount of cameras. I know that it's expensive. I'm not suggesting it's not. That expense is also what eliminates 90% of all competitors. Because when you see a cooking channel, and it's like, that cooking channel has four camera angles. They get a close-up of the food. They have a top-down view of the food for the process. I can, oh, this looks really good. And it's all done. And it's all blah, blah, blah. And they've got, oh, and everything looks gorgeous. Everything looks gorgeous. I can practically smell it through the screen. It, why am you? Why am I gonna watch a different cooking channel? Why? Why would I watch a different cooking channel? I, oh, that's great. Oh, and the host is funny and charismatic, and okay. Oh, yeah, and the food looks gorgeous and everything like that. So now you've eliminated on the difficulty of what you made. You've eliminated ninety percent of your competition on difficulty of made. Now, if you, what you make is now a specific thing. All right, I've eliminated ninety percent of my competition on quality. Now what? Okay, of all the channels at that level of quality, how many of them are consistent? I could probably eliminate more of that 10% of what's left of competition now by being consistent. And then how specific is it? General cooking? Or am I cooking a specific type of food? Am I, is it meat? Is it desserts? Is it food from a specific culture? Now, I don't have any competition. Do you see what I'm getting at? The first thing, one of the first things you can do is by eliminate making the level of difficulty and the level of quality to a degree that eliminates 90% of the competition, that solves most of the problem. Then you can eliminate another portion of the competition, let's say maybe another 5%, by being more consistent than them. There you go, because a lot of high quality people, they ain't consistent. Okay. Now you're down to like 5% and now you just have to be different. And now you're in a lane basically by yourself because now you offer something that is unique enough that before we even get into the specifics of what you do, just by picking a lane to be in at the highest quality and consistency, we've now reduced the lanes of traffic of who's even with us down to a very small amount. And now we don't have competition. We don't have competition. Now, there's ways to do this on a budget. In theory, you could just rig four smartphones and do it, right? On th in theory, you could rig four smartphones. I'm not telling you it has to be expensive. I am telling you that expensive to some degree gives some people an advantage in the sense that 
now there's no competitors because the level of difficulty to compete and the quality of the results and the speed of the results, how fast it is to do so on and so forth. Because remember, I'm also talking about an advanced video editing situation. An advanced video editing situation where you can be quality and quantity means you hired one or two editors. Now, again, this is why I'm saying if I want to be a 1 million subscriber channel, if I want to be a 1 million subscriber channel, my content is so hard to produce because it requires me to only be a host and the business model and you know the business mastermind. And I have two editors and I have a producer. So my editor might also be a producer. And then I have another editor, right? So I might have two people who double dip. They help with the cameras and they edit the content. If I have that, then I can crank out videos. I can crank out 100 high quality videos a year that no one in my niche can crank out. I can crank out 100 high quality videos a year that nobody else can. And I can do shorts on top of it. So now I can be a million subscribe channel. That is using technical ability, money, and leveraging having um, 120 hours a week of effort because three people working full time instead of one person using the scraps of 10 to 20 hours a week. So now if someone only has, let's say someone has 12 hours a week to work on content, I've got three people, I have 120 hours a week to work on content or more. I can literally 10x the level of time, effort, and quality put into content beyond what they can. And so now they can't compete with me because the multiplier is too high. It's too high. The gap between 12 hours and 120 hours is too high. It's just too high. So that's, that's, so that's one thing. Then if they're shooting on their phone, there's an upper limit to their quality. They have one phone. If I have multiple cameras, my upper limit of quality, the gap between our quality, when you look at their content and my content, their content can be still very good. It could be very good, but it can never be what my content is. It'll be immediately visually, auditorily, and experience-wise different because I will have more camera angles, which means on the food thing, they're seeing the top-down angle, they're seeing the close-up with my hands get into the food, and they're seeing the wide angle, and then they're seeing another uh, tighter angle that maybe is at – um you know, so for me to talk directly. And then I have quality audio because I have multiple audio sources so that the audio will never be bad. I can be labbed up and we can use the boom manks and we can use audio correction software at the end. So then all of a sudden I have this elaborate production and I've brought TV quality to a YouTube and then 90% of the market can't do that. So now my thing becomes a better viewing experience that is hard to duplicate that they cannot get somewhere else, right? So now I'm doing that. That's a reason to have a million subscribe channel because it is a destination channel. You can make videos on your smartphone, but can you make a destination channel on your smartphone? Only if you are the most creative person in the world. Remember, what I'm talking about is before we even get creative, I'm eliminating on a quality level the 90% of the competition. Then I'm re reducing the remainder of the competition by using editors to say, and now I have quantity. And now it's hard to compete with me on quality and quantity slash consistency now. Now what else? Now all I have to do is win on style, story, and structure uh, and storytelling. Style, structure, and storytelling, which is now my uniqueness, which is now the delivery. And now it's complete destination thing because now I am not replaceable. I'm not duplicatable. You cannot get anything like this anywhere. It does not exist now does not exist now. And it's because I've made the ability to duplicate me absurdly hard. So now it doesn't matter how saturated a market is because I'm in my own lane. I'm in my own class. I'm in my own class. So that's what you do. You have to be in a class of your own. You have to be in a league of your own. And I just gave you the model for becoming a league of your own in that one. Like that's like, but that's an extreme, right? <clears throat> um, I'd say that some of the channels that do expensive products, but they shoot on iPhone, the thing that makes their content hard to duplicate is their access to product. Access to product can make you in a league of your own because you have exclusives and other people can't afford to compete with you on the products in the videos. So that's, so like if you were in the luxury brand space, that's like, again, that that's harder to duplicate being in the luxury brand space, harder to duplicate. 
Um, I'll answer this one and then like um, any super chats and then like we will uh, probably go. We'll probably wrap it up because we're like at five hours. I don't usually go this long. Um, yeah, the um, the multicam. Yeah, the multicam works, y'all. I'm tell I'm living proof. The multicam works, and people love my interviews. that are multicam as well. The like the quality is just like it's just there. Um, let's see. Started your book last month, implementing everything, steady growth, slow and steady growth, 72 new subscribers last month and 55 new in new, uh, 59 new in two weeks. Oh, that's actually pretty good for like not having subscribers. That's actually like pretty good turnaround that like you managed to get that many more that quickly. So that's actually pretty good. So what about a gaming channel? I'll answer this one for the gamers and then we'll go. We'll call it a day. Um, we'll get you all to dinner because it's like been a long day. And I need to, I still need to do a workout today or at least go for a walk. Um, but all right. If I had a gaming channel, what would I do? If I had a gaming channel, I know that gaming is very competitive and there are already rock stars in the gaming niche. There are already rock stars in the gaming niche. So I know that that's, our, I know that it's already hard before I start. So what I would probably do is I would make a channel for the culture. And so, I know that if I make a channel for gamers, I have a better chance. If I make a channel for gamers, I have a better chance of winning than if I make a gaming channel. So what do I mean like that? I have to think like a gaming company because a gaming company wins more than a game does. A gaming company beats an individual video game and a gaming company beats a gaming franchise. So instead of trying to build a gaming channel on a video game or trying to build a gaming channel on a gaming franchise or trying to build a channel on video games, I need to buy, build a channel for video game players. I need to build a channel for the culture of gamers because that makes me everlasting, evergreen, and it makes my videos something that gamers can watch even if they don't care about a particular game. So <clears throat> that's how I would start to think about it, and I would start to approach my channel is I would start thinking like a game company. Okay? So I would sit there in my head, and I would start thinking about what, what does that mean? What does that mean, bro? That sounds like a great idea. What does that mean? I would start to break down the culture of video gaming. There's PC gaming, there's arcade gaming, and there's consoles. So that's the physical layer. The physical layer of gaming starts with hardware. The physical, the physical layer of gaming starts with hardware. Now, I'm going to give you the idea that to some degree – is inaccessible because it starts with the idea of having unlimited money. And the thing is, I start with this because then I can work my way down, just like I did with the cooking channel. The cooking channel is largely predicated on I've got unlimited money. But because like creativity, I need to start as big as possible. And then I need to find a way to execute that stuff without robbing a bank, without robbing a bank. Because then I just have to work my way down to the beginning of something reasonable or say, okay, that really expensive idea that I have, is there a way to do it with money that is attainable to me? And so I'll, so let me start with the big ideas. The big idea, a, a big idea for a video, if I want a viral video is I turned my entire house into an arcade. Tell me that a gamer, tell me that a gamer doesn't watch a video where I turn my entire house into an arcade. Okay, that's probably too big. I turned my entire garage into an arcade. Hmm, that gets interesting. I turned my basement into an arcade. I turned my garage into an arcade. That becomes really interesting because now you get the spectacle video of, well, what'd you buy and what'd you do? And this is a real arcade or did you like get this? Like, what machines did you get? It's like, so I got these 
arcade machine. I get to tell the st storytelling. So storytelling. Oh, I got these arcade machines. You get to see a story of how I got this pinball machine. How did I get this pinball machine? How did I get an old, like, how did I get these arcade one-up machines? What I do, blah, blah, blah. So now all of a sudden, okay, so the big idea, the big idea, my big spectacle video, my big spectacle video is I turn my garage or basement into an arcade. Okay. There are several videos that can lead up to that. This could be a journey to my spectacle video. So now it's a journey. So now I have this journey and I could start with, it's like, collecting like so now i have a different video before that a video that's a layer below i turned my entire garage or my basement into an arcade might be that i collected all of the arcade one-up machines so that video's title is i bought every arcade one-up machine so now i bought every arcade one-up machine all right that might take some time i have to price how much is that how much is that okay so i have to come up with that money okay so that's really difficult Here's another video that like, but I can do it, but I can start to work my way to that video and then I can build up this arcade. Okay, well, what else is interesting? Well, what's interesting is um, there are entire group of people, if I want to do an arcade thing, Dance Dance Revolution is still interesting. People still play it. What if I build a Dance Dance Revolution machine from scratch? I built my own DDR arcade machine. Like that's a good video and that could get evergreen views and that could be like a good spectacle-ish video. It may not go viral, but that'll pull some views. So I then have to figure out the instructions. That might be reasonable. Maybe that cost me $500 to $1,000 to make that video, but that's a good video to make. Okay, cool. That one is on the back burner too. What else can I do? Well, that's the arcade idea series and I can do a lot of things like that. I can try and see if I can find old pinball machines. It's like, you know, and that could be a good video. It's like, oh, I rescued a pinball machine or I rebuilt a pinball machine from scratch or it's like, or I, I like rebuilt this pinball machine from a junkyard. That's a good video. So now a gamer could watch that video and be interested. Also a casual regular YouTube user can watch that video. What else can I do for gamers? Now let's go into the console side of gaming. Let's go into the console side of gaming. Okay. <clears throat> There's a lot of controversy around, um, God, what is it? Uh, DK oldies like DK oldies has a lot of controversy. I can make an entire playlist of videos around DK oldies. It's like, um, I wasted a thousand dollars buying stuff from DK oldies. Is DK oldies a scam? I spent a thousand dollars to find out. Um, buying every Nintendo console from DK oldies part one part two, part five. And then they're seeing me collect every Nintendo console and I'm buying it through DK Oldies. Then later I get to make a spectacle video of like, I bought every Nintendo console ever. So now there's a conclusion to the series. It's also a good spectacle video for that. Now that might cost money, but I can also do it in chunks because I'm making a series where I'm on a mission to collect every one of these from DK Oldies and we're going to open them up. We're going to see if it's a scam. We're going to see how good they can do because I need to finish my Nintendo collection of all the Nintendo consoles to fulfill my childhood dream. So we're going to get these and we're going to make sure they work and we're going to see if they're right. I was like, oh, great. I And then we get to see there's a payoff to every video if I do that as a gaming channel. So as, as, as a channel for gamers, because now gamers care about this because gamers might want to collect their collection, their old console or whatever. It's like, so, okay, Roberto, this all seems like it's just the hardware layer of gaming. It's like, I want to get into the games. I'm a gamer. I'm like, I was like, I'm like, like, no one really wants to watch you play video games. No one really wants to watch you play video games. And yeah, I know the arcade cabinet machines can be very expensive and it can be very difficult, but that's why someone will watch. Someone will watch because it's not something they themselves can do. A lot of you need to realize that people that are casual watchers of YouTube, they don't want to watch content where they can just have made that video themselves, where they could make that video themselves. They want to watch content that is a once in a lifetime experience that they can never have. They want to experience that thing with you because they will never experience that thing in real life. They want, so you need to create once in a lifetime experiences for your viewers and let them watch those things play out because then it's a time capsule and it's a moment in time and it's an experience. Going to a concert is not the same thing as listening to an album. 
So like you need to create spectacle, you need to create an event. So yes, an arcade cabinet machine is very expensive and very hard to come by, very difficult. That's why someone will watch it. Just like someone will watch you restore a classic car. It is like a unique thing to watch and it is something that is very difficult. Someone will watch you build a log cabin because not everyone can do it. That's the point. That's why the videos on YouTube that seem to get the most views might be able to be called rich people doing rich people things. The most viewed videos on YouTube seem to be rich people doing rich people things. The most viewed videos on YouTube are not regular people doing regular people things. Think about that. Think about it. what video has 10 million views that is a regular person doing regular person things. It happens, but it's much more rare than a video that seems to be above average people doing above average people things. So I'm just saying. So the thing is, it can be money or it can be level of difficulty. It could be money or it could be level of difficulty. Because with gaming, with gaming, I have another way to create spectacle. I have another way to create spectacle from something. If you were talented at a video game, then you can do a challenge within that video game. And then that could be interesting. Now, the way I would do mine, would I would do gaming. If I were going to play video games, I'm going to play video games, but I'm going to play video games with my friends and I'm going to have challenges and I'm going to have stakes. I'd have challenges and I'd have stakes. So it would be, okay, me and the boys are here with another video game challenge and the loser gets another punishment from the wheel of torture. And so, yes, I would go out, spend $200, buy a spinny wheel, and we have the wheel of torture. And I would make the community suggest punishments for the wheel of torture. So now the community gets in on and I create spectacle from something accessible because now me and the boys, me and the boys will do challenges in the video game. So there'll be some vlog-like elements. Then me and the boys spin the wheel of torture to see what the loser of the challenge is going to have to do. And then that creates this spectacle. And now that's the other different thing in my content. The content now becomes me and the boys. And so now it's me and the boys. It's me and the crew. And now it's me and the crew doing this, doing that. And when we're not doing me and the crew doing these gaming challenges, I'm building my console collection. When it's not me and the crew doing my console collection, it's um, like when it's not me and the crew playing games and doing challenges, that's the software layer. It's like me and the boys for reactions might react to new game trailers. We might react to viral gaming videos together. So now then that's the me and the boys component. So now it's just like you and your crew, you and your friends. Now it's like, oh, that feels comfortable. That's, oh, that's like me and my friends. That's relatable. So now that's the relatability part that's not rich people doing rich people things. Now the, the spectacle becomes the stakes for the wheel of torture thing. And then the reaction videos are just easy to make and they're comfortable and you're watching for personalities. So then... So then what, um, you know, and so that becomes uh, the deal. So me and the boys doing gaming challenges, there's stakes and there's the wheel of torture now. And then there's also the prizes that the winners get. And so um, that's just fun to watch and it's good content and that's easy enough to do. And then when we're not doing that, it's me doing my own thing where I'm collecting pieces to build my ultimate arcade in my garage or basement. And then aside from that, it's me then doing um, to some degree exposed videos on places like DK oldies that sell uh, what um, use consoles refurbished or whatever. And then it's also maybe I'm doing like, Oh, buying this stuff from GameStop part one and seeing that. And then it's the GameStop stuff. Then there's my, they, I could do garage sale videos to try to finish completing my collection. I could decide something like I'm going to collect every like Pokemon game ever. And it's an ongoing series of me collecting every Pokemon game ever. And you come with me to pawn shops and garage sales and stuff like that, seeing if I actually managed to pull it off. And so then that would be my other thing. Then there'd also then be the gamer's paradise thing. So it's like, you know, uh, building gamer's paradise, my ultimate man cave. And that would be a series of me just buying tech and RGB lights and things and making the ultimate gamer's paradise for me and the boys to enjoy and play games together. So then you get to see the evolution of Gamer's Paradise in these. Um, and now I have tech content that's kind of like vlogs. I have this um, DIY type content of me building my um, arcade series. And then I have this house tour 
thing going on like MTV Cribs. So again, what would I do? If I want a million subscribe gaming channel, I'm building an experience. I'm building a destination channel and I'm not building it for video for for gamers i'm i'm I was, or rather i'm not building it i'm not building a gaming channel i'm building a channel for gamers now now i'm building a channel that will inspire every dude every chick that's a gamer everybody that's a gamer will want to build my gamers paradise everybody that's a gamer will wish they had my garage or basement that they i got to turn into an arcade Everybody will wish that they completed their Nintendo collection of Nintendo consoles from the 90s. And then everyone will celebrate me when I get every single Pokemon game that's ever existed. That's how I would do a gaming channel. Because now I have storytelling, I have stakes, I have spectacle, I have relatability, I have a recurring cast of characters. And the business model that I have now is I can have affiliate links for a lot of stuff, okay? I can build some custom things that I might be able to sell on the Gamers Paradise side, as well as the Gamers Paradise stuff being affiliate links because you can buy all of it on Amazon, okay? Um, there are people who are going to buy the specs or things for some of the stuff I do for the arcade, all right? So I have that. I can get sponsorships for, like, everything else. And then there are people who are going to donate for exclusives uh, to watch either channel members or Patreon of me and the boys doing different gaming challenges. So people will pay for that. And then with me and the boys doing live streams and having the wheel of torture, people will super chat. So I would have like the, and then if I do solo content, I can still torture myself if I fail the challenge. So I can spin the wheel of torture for myself. So like I would have all of these different elements of it and then I'm unique to every other channel. Markiplier's not doing it. PewDiePie's not doing it. Mr. Beast Gaming's not doing it. I would have my own thing and I can build the template around me and the boys. And that becomes this really comfortable like thing of people wanting a friend group like mine. Because that's the, that's the other thing is with the aspirational part. You'll want your own gaming garage like me. You'll want a gamer's garage like me. You'll want a living room like mine. You'll want gamer's paradise. You'll want the man cave. You'll want to complete some collection from your childhood like I did on consoles, and you'll want to complete some collection of your favorite franchise of video games just like I did. And I can start this cycle over and over and have a new storyline whenever I want. All right? You'll want to go exploring and going to the flea markets and the pawn shops and the swap meets like me. You'll want to do that because now it's also content that's out there in the real world interacting with people and not just me and the boys all the time at home. Okay? But when it is, it's still comfort. Okay? Great. Then... You have the live streams. You can enjoy it with us and you can feel like you're part of the crew, part of the family, right? And so there's that aspect of it. We can also, for spectacle, for celebrations on the channel, every 100K subscribers, me and the boys, could rent out like an arcade and invite um, some of our subscribers if they buy tickets or do some other celebratory thing and we'll vlog it and – they will buy out an arcade and invite some of our fans to party and play games with us at an arcade or at a, a, a putt putt or something like that. Boom. That would be how I would do this. I'm saying if I were doing a gaming channel, I would have these wild ideas and I would work my way up to it from the ground up. And it could start from the very mundane with me and the boys playing games, doing challenges, wheel of torture into all the things that I can then spend money on to then make spectacle content. And it's, the, it's one of the most creative and collaborative ideas. Because the thing is, I have built-in collaborations because I have the challenge videos and it's me and the boys. Later, I could get other YouTubers to challenge me and the boys and play the Wheel of Torture. And then that's collaboration with other YouTubers. I have it built in. Other YouTubers can help me with my video game collection. Boom, built in. Okay? Tech creators can help me. Tech YouTubers can help me build the Man Cave, build the, uh, build the Gamer's Paradise. So now I have a tie into tech creators. Boom. Like the, I can invite other YouTubers to come and, in, and play something in my arcade, or I can add like their favorite old game to my arcade and surprise them or something like that. Or I could surprise big YouTubers with their, um, their favorite childhood, uh, you know, game or something like that. Or something like, so like with the, the collection that they always wanted, like surprising big YouTubers with blah, 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 and some spectacle around gaming. So that means I can surprise a gaming YouTuber with their favorite game or something like that, or their favorite thing from a game. So there's all kinds of ways that I could do that once I was a big enough channel. So like, boom, 
like the community can also help with the gaming collection um, exactly. So there's all kinds of ways to like think about this content differently. Most of you are thinking about content, looking at what already exists instead of, gee, I wish I could watch this. It doesn't exist. I'm thinking of what would appeal to me the most because I don't watch most video game channels because most video game channels, they don't appeal to me. But I like watching stuff like what Wolfie did, where Wolfie built a Pokemon gym in real life and became a gym leader in real life and gave out badges to people who defeated him in a gym battle and gave out badges for people to participate. So like Wolfie is a world Pokemon champion. And Wolfie, he's also, he's coached with me before. Wolfie's a, a world Pokemon champion and he became a gym leader in real life. That was a great spectacle video with great storytelling and it was absolutely genius. I like watching stuff like that. I like watching stuff and no one can duplicate it because, oh, you just copy and Wolfie. It's perfect. So he got to become a gym leader in real life and the storytelling was immaculate. So that's like, that's what I want to see is I want to see great storytelling. I want to see collaboration and not just collaboration with big YouTubers. I want to see like stuff um, where people are thoughtful, creative, they use what they have. And they make the most of it. And it's not always about throwing money at at the start. Because I told you, the flea market thing and the DK oldies thing is not needing a lot of money. It's money that you can make as a working class person because they're already customers. So like doing the DK oldies series, you can just save up extra money and you can start collecting Nintendo consoles by buying them from DK oldies. Start that collection up and it's got the exposed theme on it uh, because it's like, well, let's see what if this is legit. Let's open it up. Let's like, uh, and let's do it. And hey. We're not stopping here. We're not going to stop until we collect every one of these consoles and we're going to see how every one of them came out in every video and, wh and whether this is, because then it's a consistent series around, okay, is this just a mileage may vary or is every console going to come back dirty or is, or is this stuff going to work? What's going to happen? And so there's stakes, there's spectacle, there's investment, there's drama. It's all built in, okay? So that's how I would do it. And that's that series. That one's not as expensive to do. Me and the boys playing video games most people oh here's a, like some losers playing video games but no the twist being that and whoever loses has to spin the wheel of torture submit your suggestions for the wheel of torture in the comment section that is engagement farming so like me buying a 180 dollars spinny wheel for the wheel of torture that's cheap and so now all of a sudden this gaming content is not like the rest on YouTube. It has stakes. Someone is going to have to spin the wheel of torture and you're going to have to see that, see them uh, be punished. So like, boom. So like that makes my gaming content with the boys different. Cause now it's me and the boys. And then there's a wheel of torture, new angle, boom. So that would be my gaming content. And then, so now I've got, we play games I collect games. I'm building a gamer's paradise. I'm building the ultimate, oh, the ultimate gaming PC. I can build a ultimate gaming PC and that would be like a whole thing. That'd be a whole thing that I would have, right? Um, and then it's not just my gaming PC. Now it's like building um, my entire gaming desk and maybe my desk has a theme to it. And so now this is tech YouTube. This is affiliate links with Amazon. This is sponsors. This is all these different things. Okay. And then it's also collaboration maybe with other YouTubers who might make custom things for my gaming or people in my community who might make custom artwork and then send me things that could be stickers and stuff like that. Um, so then there's all kinds of things that could be done with that. But again, most people's biggest problem when it comes to YouTube is they're not that creative when it comes up to ideas of content. I hate to say it, but the overwhelming majority of the gaming community is just not that creative. The overwhelming majority of the gaming community is just not that creative because this is on the table. This is on the table. Someone can build a 1 million, 2 million channel if they had ever thought of it. If they've never thought of it, they could have done it. I'm not as passionate about gaming as the rest of you, but I'm a gaming consumer and I would have watched the hell out of this channel that I just described and it doesn't exist. And this channel doesn't exist. What you have is saturation of low-hanging fruit and copycat content. By the way, this isn't the only idea that I have that would be a successful gaming channel. I could come up with like five more ideas for a successful gaming channel. But I'm not necessarily going to give that stuff away 100% because some of it is going to have to stay in the tank for my clients. But there's all kinds of opportunities to be competitive 
in the gaming genre by making stuff for people who play video games. I'll give you another one that's actually it's not as hard as it's 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 hard from a effort standpoint, not a money standpoint. Somebody could do a gaming channel around all the the cinematics in a franchise of a video game and could just make it into an abridged or animated series using the cinematics and they and their friends could just voice cast and voice dub over all the cinematics. This eliminates the copyright issue because the copyright issues are all audio issues. So now you get to just put different music to it. You get to use the most viral moments in video games. And now you can make the most viral moments in video games into funny or inappropriate jokes using the characters and doing the voice acting, making it abridged. And now, because everyone likes to watch the cinematic outtakes from video games. And the thing is just being able to, like, think about it. You could take all the the God of War cinematics and you could turn it into a series and have Kratos in the hood and just have Kratos doing hood humor and doing a voiceover and everything like that. And Kratos is like, what's good? Like, it's just like, it's like, you know, like, it's just whatever. You could just have Kratos being hood as hell and using hood humor, dark comedy, and you could use all the clips from God of War and you just take out all the gaming music and now you can put copyright free music that sets the mood and the tone and you can just use this to make viral content. There's an idea. Kratos in the hood is probably something that can get millions of views, tens of millions of views. Because you have a known franchise, you have a known character, and now you have a twist and it's comedy and it's comedy gold and it has infinite replay value, infinite shareability. It's right there for the taking. Nobody thinks of this. Because, again, one of the big issues with, with content creation is that people think they're more creative than they actually are. People think they're more creative than they actually are. There is plenty of entertaining content that does not exist, that does not exist. There's so much content that exists. And think about it, this idea that I just came up with. Think about all the video game franchises that this applies to that this could work with. So there's still an infinite amount of content. By the way, you could even take it further. And there are so many AI voices that you can use. You can use AI voices and use the voice of like the presidents or celebrities as the voice of these characters, edit it together like it's a show and make them say whatever you want in whatever tone you want. And then all of a sudden you could have, you could have hood Kratos as voiced by Barack Obama. <laughs> like, like it, it, it'd be, it'd be amazing. Like you could, I mean, so there's all this stuff that actually just takes like marginal creativity that doesn't even exist because the marginal creativity doesn't exist. Like the community has a deficit of actual creativity when it comes to making content in genres they think are saturated. They just won't make something cool that anyone would love to watch and everyone would love to laugh at. And that's really like, I mean, again, this is why I say it. it's like, see, but I don't have the desire to be an entertainer. It doesn't mean I don't know how. And I just don't think I necessarily have the chops to execute the creativity uh, of the comedy side of things. I don't have the chops to be a comedian. Oh, but I got jokes. I can write the lines. I don't know that I can deliver them. I can write them. See, it's like the idea generation creativity is there. Execution is like where some people would drop off, but ideas are also important, you know? And a lot of people, like a lot of people just don't have it. <laughs> You'd watch Kratos as you'd, you'd watch Barack as Kratos. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah, that would be that'd be so hilarious, you know. There's somebody who does a version of this with Super Friends. Okay, yeah, bet I would love to see that. That's hilarious. I'll look that up. But see, yeah, the, what you could do with the video game stuff, because of like, d by the way, there's so much you could do with Grand Theft Auto and mods. There's so much you could do with Grand Theft Auto and mods and putting known celebrities into Grand Theft Auto and automate uh, animating that and then 
and but through the gameplay in Grand Theft Auto with mods, and then using AI voice of known people, and then all of a sudden you'd have all of a sudden you'd have this crazy, unique, interesting content that's not nearly as vulnerable to copyright. All is a faceless channel, by the way. All is a faceless channel. So again, like that's the kind of thing. A lot of people, again, it's a creativity deficit. It's just a creativity deficit. How to vids. Thank you for being a channel member. Uh, as a channel member, you can actually watch. I haven't released a bunch of my interviews yet. A lot of them are still, uh, but I have the unedited versions of these interviews with good audio, unedited, but with good audio of uh, interviews out. I have my interview with Tim Schmoyer. I have my YouTube employee interview. I have my I Justine interview. Um, those are all members only right now because they will go on the podcast later this uh, month. They just haven't been released yet. I have um, about 100 members only videos. So members only get you early access to a lot of my interviews. It gets you some exclusive content. There's like 100 members only videos. So if you become a channel member, you get access to those. So thank you to How To Vids uh, for becoming a channel member. I think that's going to be um, it. Yes, there's a time and creativity deficit. That's uh, definitely. I already did um, a whole um, rant about uh, a cooking channel. So uh, definitely watch that, um, Asia guy. And also you'll want to watch the podcast channel. I interviewed a food content creator that currently has like 4 million subscribers, Max the Meat Guy. The clips have been releasing on the podcast channel. The interview will be dropping, uh, if not this week, it'll be dropping next week. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, but that's going to be it, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate all of you. We're going to end the stream uh, with a couple of um, just like announcements and stuff like that. So first of all, a reminder. First of all, reminder uh, that May... 27th may 27th 2 p.m eastern standard time is the brand deals live workshop this workshop is a paid workshop we only have 30 seats available uh you can sign up it is 299 but you will learn how to make money from sponsored content and brand deals how to get monthly recurring brand deals so this is spending hundreds of dollars to potentially make a lot more than that long term and to know how to not get screwed in your brand deals, contracts, pitch, price, package, profit. And I list all the information. So that is linked in the description of the video. I'm also going to drop it into the comments just for easy access. Um, join the Brand Deals Live Workshop May 27th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there's the link. So there's the link. It's also in the description down below. You'll also get the recording of the workshop. You'll get uh, email swipe templates so you can reach out to brands. You also get a media pitch, uh, sorry, a media kit that you can use the pitch that's fully customizable. This will be a 90 minute to two hour workshop. So you'll definitely want to clear the time for it. If you can't clear the time, you'll be able, if you buy it to watch the replay, we only have 30 seats available and that's May 27th. So plenty of time to sign up. Um, we'd love to see you there. We did it, one of these in February. It went very well. So that is on the table for you to check out. There are also other things over at Awesome Creator Academy for any of you who want to check out the products and things that I sell. They are in the description. Uh, we have a great product right now called the Creator Prompts, which is actually something I made to help you. It has 100 chat GPT um, prompts that I customized and wrote with plenty more. We're also going to be adding mid journey prompts to that. That is also linked in the description down below. So we have AI creator prompts. These are, um, chat GPT templates that you can use and they will help you. There's over a hundred of them. It is only $10. It is nine 99. So it's a steal for nine 99. It's a great way to support the channel. And you do get a hundred plus of these creator prompts for chat GPT that can streamline your creative process and they're not generic prompts. There's actually really good stuff in there. We're adding more. The goal is actually to also be adding 100 mid journey prompts to help you 
generate uh, visual assets that are not generic either. And we'll be adding more stuff. My ultimate goal would be I'd like to see this become a thousand AI prompts um, over time. But we started with a hundred, but it'll ideally become a thousand and you'll get lifetime access and updates to the new prompts. So uh, $9.99, easy way to support the channel and to also get something that will save you time. So again, you can check out everything at awesomecreatoracademy.com and links to all of these are in the description down below. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Stay awesome. We're going to close out with the trailer for my book. So we're going to close out with the book trailer until um, like may later this year, somebody made a theme song for me. Actually, uh, one of the um, community members made a theme song. It's actually really good. He made a rap theme song. At some point we might have a music video. So if we ever have a music video, that'll probably be the thing we close the stream with in the future. But in the meantime, Enjoy the book trailer. Stay awesome. Thank you for showing up. And I will catch you on the next one. Later. I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle, where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October 2022. Oh my God. It's so great to be able to have this book done put it up on the bookshelf and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like. Uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create.